Welcome to SAP Success Factor Employee Central Performance Management and Goal Management Training by Zarendek In today's dynamic business landscape organizations needs a robust solution to drive employee engagement and achieve strategic goals seamlessly That's where SAP Success Factors excels Zarendek is your gateway to mastering this powerful SAP Success Factor module. Our expert-led training ensures that you harness the full potential of employee central performance management and goal management. Stay ahead in the HR game and prepare your organization to new heights. But before we begin, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon to receive regular updates from us. Now let's take a look at the agenda. Introduction to SAP Success Factors Software as a Service Advantages of Software as a Service BizX Business Execution Suite Success Factors System Architecture Implementation Methodology Important SAP SF Websites Logo and Themes Basic User Imports Role-Based Permissions email templates ec structure data models let's dive into the video now so as most of you already know myself i am shiva and let me introduce myself initially where i am a real time professional i'm just not into trainings i even have a professional experience parallelly where i have close to 15 years of experience on the sap domain covering variable um, various roles starting as an abap hr programmer followed by into sap hcm consulting and from past close to 7 years in success factors consulting and regarding my experience on the training front i have been delivering success factors training since 5 years and trained over 1000 participants from different parts of the globe and prior to that i even handled sap hcm trainings for a couple of years and trained over 100 plus participants so I hold almost seven plus years of uh, running experience as well. So this is about me. And uh, moreover, when it comes to my credentials, I do have my certifications on all the top significant modules of success factors like employee central, performance management, recruiting management, succession and career development planning. And even I'm a professional certified consultant where professional certification is something that would be generally given only to the real-time professionals based on the customer feedback. And I hold that credential of professional certification where very few people in the market hold it. So this is about me initially at a high level. And to start with the discussion on the success factors primarily, so being the day one. So being the day one, I understand that few of you are already aware about success factors and few of you are completely layman towards it. So for the benefit of everyone, so let's have the understandings from the fundamentals in detail about what is success factors. So in that context, so <coughs> success factors is a cloud-based HR solution. HR solution is clear to everyone, but what is cloud-based is the main point that you have in your mind. So. The answer for what is cloud-based, we'll discuss in the next couple of slides. So it's firstly a cloud uh, a HR solution is the main point. And it comes up with a package of around 11 different modules, guys. Success Factors has a package of 11 different modules where a solution for employees recruiting process, a solution for performance management, learning management, like that. It's a portfolio of 11 different modules. In that having all these modules under one single roof success factor has its very much advantage over the other products in the market so a client going for success factors consulting need not look out for any other products in the market so when they implement a hr solution so we have uh, all the solutions under one single login gentleman okay so that way we have a, a, a business to have operate uh, to have to operate only one single system with without uh, having multiple logins multiple user id passwords and tomorrow 
uh, having a difficulty to integrate between the softwares and all. So it makes it very easy for the clients to use the system with one single login with all the data transfer between the modules happening seamlessly. So from one module to the other, wherever the data transfer between the modules should happen. So it happens seamlessly so that you want some data from employee, employee central where the employee data is all posted. From there, if you want that to be put into the performance module, from performance, from there, if it has to move into the recruitment, I mean, uh, the compensation module, like that, wherever the data transfer happens seamlessly. Okay, that's one. And the last point is about implementation. So it can be implemented either as a standalone product or as a hybrid product by integrating with any other softwares in the market. So if a client says that I already have a HR software since last 15 years, I also want to use that software for a few functionalities. And I come to success factors for a few functionalities. We want both the systems to be integrated and running parallelly. We can, we can say yes to that as well. Success factors is compatible to integrate with any other software in the market. So these are the three key points where it is a cloud-based HR solution and it is a combination of 11 different modules and all under one single login and it can be implemented either as a standalone product or it can be integrated with any other softwares and that can be implemented as a hybrid model as well. So this is the first understanding of success factors and the way how it is advantageous in the market. Okay. And then also to know a little bit background about the history of success factors. So this is something where SF has started so almost around 21 years back with one single module called performance and goal management in 2002 in US, in the US market they have started. So since then, they have been adding new solutions into their portfolio. And after 10 years, after a period of 10 years, after coming getting the status of the market leader in the cloud-based HR solutions, SAP acquired it. Okay, so SAP acquired success factors at uh, almost uh, the huge cost where they have invested later of the acquisition as well. Okay. So it's not just an acquisition, post acquisition also, SAP has invested a lot into this product. So even after acquiring it at a cost of 3.5, 3.4 billion dollars, they have still invested on it and uh, brought up some additional modules, additional features and functionalities into the product. And today success factor is called an SAP company with its solutions offered in 168 countries across the globe. And it is supported in almost 43 languages, close to 43 languages across the globe. So that's the history of SF, where it is initially it is an independent product. In 2011, SAP acquired it, and today we call it as an SAP product. So that is a little history about success factors, where it has started and what it is today. So being supported in 168 countries is a huge, huge market, guys. So we have a huge market for success factors in uh, North America. We have it in Africa. We have it in Middle East, in the Indian market, in the Southeast Asian market, Australia, New Zealand. Across the globe, we have a very good market for success factors applications. Okay, so that shows us the global consulting opportunities that we have with this product. And moving on to get an understanding of cloud quickly. So what is this cloud? How is it different from the regular applications actually? So Cloud-based applications are something uh, not new to us. So the way how we operate our day-to-day -day applications already, like uh, the way you use your Facebook, LinkedIn, Gmail, all this. So the way these all these applications are remotely hosting the data and we can access those applications from anywhere, anytime, any part of the globe. And that they, and the data, whatever we have in that applications is accessed any point of time. So that is called the cloud process or the remote culture, the remote process. So you have your data remotely hosted and you can access it from any part of the globe anytime. For example, you upload your Google, uh, you, you upload some files into your Google Drive. Even after 10 years, you can open that files in the Google Drive in your account with a proper authentication into your account from any part of the globe on any device, just with an internet connectivity. So that's what the cloud model is. So your data is taken care by Google. Google is hosting your database. I mean, Google is hosting their servers in which our data is being maintained. Similarly, here in Success Factors, the HR data, that is the employee's HR data is being hosted. And that's those databases where the client's data is being handled are handled by SAP. 
SAP will operate and few data centers are also maintained by Microsoft Azure data centers we say. So like that, we have 15 data centers across the globe where the client's databases are being taken care. So we have uh, one data center in Sydney, Australia, where we can have some 500 clients databases in the data center. We have one in Saudi Arabia for the Middle East clients. So in Saudi Arabia data center, they can be 500 or 1000 customers databases like that across the globe. SAP is currently handling around 15 data centers. And in those data centers, we have large number of customers related databases that SAP is handling. So the clients just access it on demand whenever they, they require across the devices. Success factors applications are supported on desktops, laptops, iPads, tablets, mobile phones. In mobile, both Android and iOS versions, a success factors applications are supported. So that way, so the application access is wide across the devices and across the networks, across the countries, across the time zones, anytime you can access them the way as simple as you access your Facebook, LinkedIn, Gmail, anything, success factors can also be accessed. So that's the cloud model. And that is how the businesses are completely transforming their applications to the cloud-based platforms to make them accessible to their employees around the clock and across the networks from any part of the globe. Okay, so that this is also called as SaaS model, guys. We also call it as a SaaS model, which is software as a service, because success factors is being treated as a service, like Facebook as a service, LinkedIn as a service. We treat success factors also as a service. We don't install any software called success factors in your laptop. To access Facebook or LinkedIn, the way you need a browser with an internet connection. Similar way to work on success factors, you need a browser and an internet connectivity. That's it. You don't install any softwares. Even in few days when you go, you, when you guys are going to start doing the configurations, practicing and all, you're not going to install any software. It's just an internet connectivity and a browser through which you can access the URL where you have your ID password credentials to log in with. So that's how the cloud model functions. We call it as a SaaS model. And the remote locations where we maintain the client's database are data centers. Couple of examples are one is in Amsterdam, one is in Sydney. And as already told you, one is in Saudi, one in Singapore, two in North America, like that. 15 data centers are operating across the globe to handle the customer's databases by SAP for success factors in the HR data. Okay, so this is the initial three important things to understand. So, what does SAP? So from where it has started and what it is today and on what basis it actually functions, which is as a cloud model when you say, so what's the meaning of it? What's the background of it? And next also to understand the advantages or the reasons why clients are looking for these cloud-based modules, guys. Okay, so we understand this is how the cloud operates and this is how success factors operates, but why are the clients migrating towards it? So why has this become this product has becoming very much booming in the recent times and almost uh, it has started in Indian market uh, uh, during 2014-15 early and from last 2019 to this 23 in the last four years it's a huge hike in the uh, number of vacancies in the market number of projects on are happening in the market on success factors it's a huge demand so what has created this is that so first thing the cloud model is a very first important factor. With the recent pandemic, all the companies are have are trying to digitalize their processes. Nothing should be paper based. Everything should be computerized. And in that, they want those things, those applications to be remotely accessible for their employees. Even my employees sitting in a remote village should be able to access the application and get the things done. So in that context, when you expect to have everything to be remotely accessible, that's where it is cloud model. All the applications, everything is going towards the cloud computing. And even their internal HR applications, they are targeting to have the cloud versions. The very primary reason is that. Second, when I say, why should I go? As a business, the company should have their commercial benefits as well. Why should we move from their old software? The commercially, what are the benefits that they get is also a point. First thing is hardware. So, so SAP handling the databases, the client need not invest on the hardware. Right. So they need not buy the database servers, the backup servers. So the investment, what they spend on the servers, hardware part is reduced. 
and that's not a one time investment they have to keep on renewing their uh, uh, amc contracts the way how their uh, database servers will be handled in terms of support amc contracts they have to be renewing every year even that is reduced they need to hire a network engineer at least a couple of network engineers down the clock to take care of their servers even that is reduced so all this cost reduction is the first point where they are commercially benefited second second point is about subscription model so the way how sap charges the customers is based on the number of users if you are a company with 10 employees i mean not 10 if you are a company with 1000 employees i i you have to take 1000 licenses if you are a company with 10000 employees you have to take 10000 licenses that is how the success factors licensing would be but what is the benefit here to the clients is sap is not selling success factors as one costly license they are not doing it that way with all the 11 modules related features they are not saying they are selling it as one single license they are selling it module wise it's a slices so employee central performance recruitment individual licenses today if you are implementing 3 out of 11 modules i charge you for only 3 modules you are not forced to pay one single large license just for 3 modules level whatever costing would be only that i charge you that's an advantage and one more advantage is for the employees who never use success factors applications who are not educated they don't know how to use computers and all sap is giving an exemption on almost 6 modules out of 11 in 6 modules they uh, they have an exemption that they they are not charged on those modules say in a company of 1000 employees you might have at least 100 employees who are like peons drivers floor laborers who are not computer literate they don't know how to use computers laptops and all then there is no point in investing in these uh, applications so that their sap gives an exemption on almost 6 modules out of 11 so the license cost is hugely differentiated there and for the large scale industries like where they have 30000 40000 employees they easily have minimum 10000 employees who are these uh, blue collar employees the contractors people who have uh, who, who just do the factory work the labor work and all so there is no point in investing on their name for license so they are again commercially benefited in the licensing front and when it comes to releases success factors comes up with a new version new release every 6 months in the month of may and in the month of november twice a year new features and functionalities keep on releasing guys so that's how success factors is keeping up to date with the latest features and the offerings in the market and they are being offered free of cost so clients are not going to require to invest any additional budget on that every 6 months they can keep on uh, availing the new features what sap's innovation team is releasing and they don't even require any technical support or any uh, it support the client can themselves upgrade their system the way how simple uh, we update our mobile phones if there is a os update in your mobile phone or there is a app update on your mobile phone how simply you guys update it by just going to your play stores apple stores and all so that way the clients can update their applications by themselves without any it support even required so that is one important factor where without any additional budget and it support required i am keep on enjoying the new features every 6 months new fee functionalities every 6 months so that's also a very go to market point and in terms of accessibility it can be accessed from anywhere anytime any part of the globe so success factors applications are supported across the devices and over the internet same like you access your gmail linkedin facebook anything so these are all the reasons why saas based applications or why cloud based applications and why success factors and not today moving on so this is about the what is cloud and what is its advantages and all guys and next thing is also to get you into the systems so i don't want to bore you guys with uh, the modules uh, all this uh, basic stuff so let me take you into the systems and before that also list i am listing down all the modules what we have so these are all this employee central performance management compensation management lms is learning management system succession planning career development planning like this we have it's a portfolio of 11 different modules as i told so these many categories of modules we have as an offering under one single roof and success factors so they are just categorized into these four categories like core hr solution we say as employee central where the employee hire to retire process happens there 
hiring of employees, their promotions, their transfers, till their separation, the entire cycle happens in the employee central module, followed by we have performance management, where we have this PMGM is the abbreviated form. We actually call it as performance management and goal management, where the entire appraisal process, the digitalized appraisal process happens there. Then the compensation management, learning management, like this, we have different modules. And to set up and execute all these modules, we come across two systems. As a consultant, we work on two systems, which are called the provisioning and instance. These are the two systems, guys, where the ratio of activities that we do in these two systems are like 15 is to 85. Where provisioning system level, we do very few things, 15% of the things in their project maximum, but those are very crucial things. Without you doing those basic things in the provisioning, you can't uh, execute the rest of the configurations. Okay, so the provisioning system is what we call as background, uh, the back end of SF, and the, and the things what we do there are only activations. We don't do any configurations, it's only activations. Okay, like out of 11 modules that we have today, which modules the client wants to implement, we activate only that. And out of 43 languages that SAP supports today, which language this client wants to use, activating that languages. So that activations of modules, languages, features, functionalities, with a, just a single checkbox happens in the provisioning side. Provisioning level, we don't do any configurations. Configurations are all done on the front end system, which is called instance instance system and 85% of our project activities happen on the instance side, gentlemen. Okay. And one more point about the provisioning is a very important point that only a certified success factors consultant can access the provisioning system. Not every individual, only a certified success factors consultant. Even a client who is investing lakhs of rupees or millions of dollars into the project they never get the access to into the provisioning system. They should only see the front end instance system. So only if they, are, if they have a certification, then only they can get into the provision. That's one thing. And the instance system where we do majority of the configurations, that is a system where the end users will use. Say for example, if Coca-Cola is our client and I, IBM is the IT company. Say if we are all the consultants of IBM company, we work for IBM and the project of Coca-Cola is what we are working. So that way we have an IT partner and a client con concept. So the consultants of IBM who are certified will work for the project like clients like Coca-Cola or PepsiCo, whoever might be the client. For them, we implement success factors and those customers related employees, that is Coca-Cola employees will use success factors from the instance side. We have access to both provisioning and instance, but the end users, the employees of Coca-Cola, as the end users, if they have to uh, apply leave in the system, if they have to do their goal setting, if they have to give the performance ratings, anything, the end users like employees, managers, HRs, HODs, even a CEO in the company, that is the client side, Coca-Cola side as a client side company example, they will use the instance side of the system only. Okay, but the, their permissions will differ. A general employee of a Coca-Cola can have uh, some permissions. A manager can have some extra permissions. A HR can have few more permissions. Like that, the permissionings will differ based on their role and login. But when it comes to the access, they all access the instant side only. We, the consultants, have the access to both the sites. That is the way. In terms of systems, we look at two systems. And let me start showing you the system. How does it look like? The navigations and all. Okay, so let me take you to the, so this is how the login page comes up, the very basic login page when, when uh, the project is starting, the initial blank system has this kind of a basic login page where this can be enhanced with the client's logo instead of success factors logo. If you want to have Coca-Cola logo, if Coca-Cola is your client, so like that. And this background light blue color, if you want to change with some client specific colors, you can change it. or Instead of a basic color, if you want to have an image, instead of simple plain background, if you want some background images, you can upload. So the customization can be done right from the beginning, right from the login page. Okay. And we will have the credentials for every user. 
like you you might be as an employee or you might be as a manager hr hod or a ceo whoever is logging in everybody will have their own id password credentials to log in with and when it comes to the current login i am using an administrative login so if you see the id sf admin is the id an admin login is which i am trying to use and login and to show you the most possible features in the system so whenever we log in into the system guys we see the first page as a home page we can call it as a home page or a landing page okay just give me a moment so this is the one where it is we call it as a home page or a landing page where that starts with uh, wishing us good morning good evening messages based on the time zone and all and next thing it also gives you the quick actions the quick actions are those things like uh, or uh, the items whatever the employees and the managers or the hrs whoever the people generally uh, regularly require to access the frequently used applications will be kept as uh, the quick actions like uh, for example i want to apply a leave i have the second icon called request time off when i click on it it comes up with a pop up where i can just select my leave type whatever i want to apply i can give my start date end date my leave details and i can submit the request right from the first page itself you see this there is a drop down and the pop up with some list of leave types i can choose which leave i want to go on and i can choose the dates with some comments if there are any attachments like medical certificates and all i can add it and i can submit the request this way without navigating anywhere internal into the system right from the very first page i got the leave application navigation so this way and if i am a person from the management level if i want to uh, uh, access some reports so this second line the fourth icon view tile reports so different kinds of graphical analysis of data reports all that can be accessed from here for the managers and top management kind of people so you get different kinds of analytics here system is going to generate different kinds of pie charts graphs all that those kinds of pie charts bar graphs all that can be displayed when you click on it it gets opened in a more bright in a more uh, broader view with the detailed information and for in each category for example there are many people in on track who are the people on on track if i click on it like their goals or their names the people details come at the bottom and if i want to download this data i'll have an option to download in the form of excel or csvs like this so this is how the top management level people like hods and the top level if they want to access some analytics right from the initial home page they can access that this way okay and then scrolling a little bit down so any things that is waiting for your attention your approvals and all will appear like this for you today kind of a section so wherever my assessments like i as an employee have to do my self assessment or i as a manager has to assess my subordinates uh, goals kind of anything those things what is looking which is having my attention required will come up here on the home page and any other internal areas of navigation to the internal applications we can place it at the bottom like this so this way we can organize the home page and we can even customize it and from here on the left hand top you will have the list of all the modules what are implemented in the system and for which all you have the access so i currently logging in as an admin user i'm having a lot of things which are activated in this system like the goals performance compensation management career development succession recruiting like this each and every area what is activated in this is all present here and this access list the list of items what you are seeing here will differ from company to company user to user like one company might have implemented only three modules another company might have implemented eight modules so the drop down items differ even in a employees of a same company permissions might differ so you might be having permission to access three modules i might be having access to more, access to more access like permissions to access five modules you have three i have five so my drop downs will be a couple of more line items so that way based on the company based on the uh, login so the drop down differs that way and we have something called as employee file where when we say hr system where where is all the employee data hosted it will be under this employee file when you click on it the current logged in users profile will open so i currently logged in as an admin user 
and her name is called Anya Singh. So Anya Singh's login is what I used and I logged in. So right from her profile picture with different sections of her information, like her personal information, her compensation, salary details, her education details, everything, each and every minute detail of information. If you keep scrolling down, you can find it. Okay. So this is speaking about the personal details initially, like the name, gender, marital status, all this, followed by the national IDs. So if you are a person from US, you have a social security number. If you are a person from India, you have Aadhaar number or PAN number. Like that, you can maintain your national IDs, your work permits. If you have any work visas of other countries, you can maintain the work, work permit details, your contact details, emergency contact details, address, dependence details, lot of information. So a lot of information of this kind can be maintained. And all this is accessible in different kinds of reporting as well. Tomorrow, if you want to bulk download the uh, dependence details of all the employees in one Excel file, you can do that. You can generate reports. Okay. So like the day address data, anything on bulk data of employees to be extracted, we have the reporting as well, which we'll see in the down, down the line sessions. So this is a profile place where each and every minute detail of employee information can be hosted, right? From basic first name, last name, till the employee's position details, hierarchy details, which department he works, which location he works. Next, the compensation, the salary part, each and everything is hosted in this single page from top to bottom. That way. And this is all part of our employee central discussions. How do we set up these screens? What are the validations in maintaining the data? What is the process flow in maintaining the data? Which is mandatory data, which is non-mandatory data? A lot of things we discuss down the line. And here we also have something called org chat, where org chat is going to describe about the hierarchy of employees. Who reports to whom? Pictorial representation it brings up. So Anya Singh doesn't have any subordinates, but if I click on one level above one level up, it shows me to whom she reports to in the system. So she reports to the head of HR, like CHRO, where she's called Kristen Dolan. And she has a team of 10 plus people in which Anya Singh is one of the subordinate. Like this, we can keep on navigating till the top of the organization. And it might be MD or a CEO position. It goes till there. So Mr. Mohan Kumar is maintained as a CEO in the system, where he has a team of four. And one of his team member has again a team of four. And from there, the team size is increasing. This is how the org chat is built, purely based on the data that we maintain. We, we hardly require any config for this. It's a plug and play tool. Only based on the data that you maintain, this representation comes up. So you have 1,000 employees or you have 10,000 employees. When you're loading all the data into SF system, you will obviously maintain the tagging. Employee A reports to B, B reports to C. You anyways maintain that data, right? So based on that, system will automatically generate this hierarchy pictorially and shows us. We literally have no configuration required for this. And it's only a permission that we handle, whether this tool should be shown to an individual or not. It's just a permission that we handle with a single checkbox. And here you have the option to download this in the form of a PDF or, a P or an image option whatever navigation you have, you have expanded. If you want, you can download it. So we have this kind of good features on this. Okay. And on the right hand top corner, guys, we have the uh, user option where the current logged in users photograph opens and few options what this user can do in the system will be available. And then if you go to the settings, if you go under the settings, we will have the options like an individual user can change his own password at any point of time without any, any support or uh, any uh, involvement of administrators. The uh, end user cannot change his own password the way you be change your LinkedIn password or Facebook password. As easy as that, you can change your SF password. And in the same list, on the fifth item, we have change language. So this is an option where it will show you what are all the languages that are enabled in the system. Out of 43 that are being supported today by SF, client can activate few languages what are required for them. Everybody doesn't require every language. So if my company has its locations in uh, Saudi, then I need Arabic for my Saudi employees. 
if i have my office in uh, japan then i we need to activate japanese like that based on the locations where my workforce is spread accordingly i will choose the required languages where in this system almost around 17 or 18 languages are activated and the user has a choice the end user has a choice of using whichever language that is available here so company has decided to offer these 18 languages to their employees in these 18 it's their choice which language the employee wants to use it in today it is in english us the us english we also have the british english supported we have spanish portuguese russian korean arabic like multiple languages i am an employee from saudi i can choose arabic if i am comfortable in that i choose the arabic and i click on switch system will start displaying everything in the arabic content so with within these 43 languages the standard things are automatically auto translated we have the translations maintained for all the 43 languages so any customization that we do like if i had a custom field or a custom screen custom section anything there it's it is consultant's responsibility to maintain the translation in the other languages but for all the standard things offered sf will come up with the default translations now i selected arabic and you see everything is being shown in arabic the module names the good evening message everything and even the screen alignment got changed if you observe generally our indian our generally our hindi english uh, all these scripts will be written from left to right but arabic is written from right to left so everything is from right to left section headings all went into the right hand side so till to that extent sap will take care in terms of handling the translations of the end user experience okay and again go into the settings if you want i can again switch it back to english so it's the end user choice every minute he can keep changing the language it's not mandatory that we have to use the system in this language for minimum this much time nothing like that so i i opted arabic if i if i think english itself is better i can again come back to english english us you have english uk you have multiple versions whichever one you can select that way we will be switched back into english again not only that uh, in the previous screen that i've shown you where employee data different sections of employee information is stored like personal information contact details address details all that so while hiring an employee what all sections of information are to be captured is what we configure for example personal information we are capturing in this what all fields are to be captured the more client says that no i don't want uh, nationality to be captured at all if they want to remove it to remove that field or if the client asks you one more field called blood group which is not standard if you want to add a custom field called blood group onto the screen we add that new field into the configuration so these are the things what we do as a consultants okay and also to show you a screen where that if i want to add a new field here one more called blood group as one more field where you added on the front end itself we don't have any coding here just we'll have we'll go to a different screen called business configuration we have the tool called manage business configuration in this we will have for all that sections like contact details address details dependent details for every different section what all fields are appearing we have them listed here so example personal details here you have on the left hand side personal info as a category if i go for personal info what all fields like first name last name gender etc etc fields whatever i am seeing on the front end they are coming from here first name last name middle name salutation like mr mrs all that and even the fields that we saw like uh, gender nationality all that are here the more if my client is asking me to add one more custom field called blood group i'll just go to the bottom complete bottom at the list end of the list one more custom field i can add so sf has given you option to add a lot of custom fields wherever required so if you want to add a custom field just custom blood group like this we will start typing blood group and we can start do the doing the configuration of what all fields we want to have like this little bit more conditions validations what to be done all that is what we do and how to do it that is what we down see down the line in our sessions like this so that way you will be working as a consultant to configure the system they want with all their requirements and conditions so that they can use that system for their 
internal employee hiring, internal promotions, transfers, terminations, recruiting process for anything, they use this success factor software. And more down the line, when you day, day by day, when you start seeing the screens, you get more clarity about how the configurations happen on a, on, on a weekly manner when you're completing the sessions, you'll get more clarity. Okay. Everybody who has like, any questions, don't hesitate. Keep your hand raised and uh, ask a question. When one person is asking a question, others can also learn from it. Okay, this can this can also be a point. They can learn from it. Okay, so you have a question you ask and others are having, they also ask the question. So each other learn from the questions you come up with and what the answers that I give it. Okay, that's a good practice. Next, uh, okay, let me move forward with the discussion. One more thing on the right hand top under the settings, guys. One more thing we have is about mobile. On the left hand bottom, you see an option called mobile. So from here, you can uh, get some instructions on the, the information required how to set up your mobile app. And frankly, nobody requires any instructions there. We are all smart enough to download and install a mobile app in our. Uh, mobile phones. So you can just go to your Play Store and download your mobile app and install in your mobile. To log in, it's very uh, uh, decent way that SF has given. Instead of a traditional way of entering ID password, SF has given a QR code method. So on the mobile app of Success Factors, you will have a option to log in with QR code. So once you click on that QR code button, here you can act, click on this activate via camera on the browser and you get a QR code. So you can scan this QR code with your mobile app and immediately this current login, the Anya Sings login related QR code, because of this QR code, yeah, this login will come into mobile. That way every employee can log in into his laptop once and scan the QR code and their profile comes into their mobile phone as well. So that everything that they want to do, they can do from mobile. It's not even required that they have to log in into the web-based version. From the mobile itself, they can do it. As an employee, if I want to apply a leave, I can apply from my mobile. My manager will immediately get a notification on the mobile and he can on the spot take a decision of approve or reject button like that. As an employee, if I have to set my goals and targets, as a manager, my performance, my manager has to give me rating. Everything can happen on mobile as well. So that advanced SF applications are. Okay. And here under manage devices, I can look at all the devices in which my mobile app is installed. So example, my, uh, my account I am using in my home iPad, I'm using in my mobile, like those different applications. I can see in all, in which all uh, devices did I have my login. Like say example, you have your Facebook. If you have an iPad in your home, you might have logged in your Facebook in your iPad. You might have logged in in your laptop. You might have logged in in your mobile. So where all it is logged in, you can see in one single place where it is about success factors. So this is, these are the different options that we have with us. And then let me also give you the look and feel of the provisioning system, which is the back end of success factors that I'm saying, and you do only activations in that system. Let me show that. But the point is you have to access provisioning and instance in two separate browsers, guys. So each of the systems will have a separate URL, ID, password, credentials to log in. So instance has a separate URL, provisioning has a separate URL. And it is every time recommended to keep two separate browsers in your laptop. So in one browser, you every time use instance, in other browser, you every time use the provisioning. So if you try to use both provisioning and instance in the same browser in two tabs side by side. So in this tab, uh, I use uh, instance. In the other tab, if I open the provisioning, if you say, as soon as you open the second system, the first system will go, get logged out immediately. If I log in into the provisioning here in the other tab, instance get logged out. If already I'm using provisioning, then if I log in into instance, provisioning gets logged out. So that's technical dependency. That's why the instance, the front end system, I'm showing on the Google Chrome, whereas the provisioning is what I'm showing on the Safari browser in my laptop that way. So that is one technical prerequisite that you have to follow every time make sure you are having two browsers that, that that's totally a technical dependency we just have to adhere to, adhere to that and once we log in into the provisioning this is how it actually looks like with which projects you are working which clients you are associated with their names come up here 
for example currently you are working for a coca cola as a client a coca cola company name comes here as a hyperlink with a unique project code given for that for every client sf will be giving one unique code guys so this kind of a unique code will be given so this is for say coca cola here a coca cola name comes up generally in the real time this being a demo system we are having code in both the places so we just have to hyper we just have to click on the hyperlink of the company name and get inside and here we have a lot of things that we'll be exploring down the line when we are looking at the modules but the majority of the things will be under company settings which is all about the activations that i am talking in all that will be under the very first one called company settings where when you go into this company settings we'll have hundreds of check boxes here so once you enter into the company settings scroll a little bit down and here the check boxes start do you want to activate performance management module? Do you want to activate succession planning module? Do you want to activate compensation management module? Like for every module name, you will have a respective checkbox activation. Under say once you activate compensation management, in that module, which features and functionalities are required to be activated, deactivated, you have the respective checkboxes. Like this, there are hundreds of checkboxes on this page but you need not look at everything. So majority of them are already default activated. Per module on an average 15, we have to remember. As an employee central consultant, around 15. As a PMGM consultant, that consultant around 15, like every module will have around 15 on an average to remember. So to take care of activations in the activations, which we will down, down the line learn, learn about each module, what are required and what is the meaning of each and every checkbox here. That's it, just the activations. You don't do any configurations here in the provision. And you'll also have this kind of a language packs as a section where you will have all the different languages listed, guys. These are the different languages, 43 languages, in which what languages your client wants to activate, we can enable them. English, US, English, UK. You have uh, the Hindi for India also supported. You can use SF in Hindi as well. Arabic for Middle East, like this, 43 global languages, which are applicable across 168 countries across the globe, SF is supporting. That is how the provisioning looks like with just uh, the point of uh, the activations to be, to be done. And definitely look and feel wise, the provisioning is not, have, not having that great uh, UI guys, because provisioning system is accessed only by consultants. So SAP is not investing on the uh, provisioning side, their investment is all towards the instance where the end users, they, they are giving importance to the end user experience. So the instance side, they invest a lot and they are improving the UI interface, the, the, the mobile apps and all for the end user experience. So this is about the systems as well to make you guys understand what systems that we regularly use as a part of consulting. And here one point I want to make it clear guys that people generally confuse. Success factors being a HR software, people think like only HRs in the company use. No, every employee in the company can use success factors. Say if Coca Cola is implementing uh, success factors in their company, all the employees of Coca Cola, if there are 10,000 employees, all 10,000 employees will have their own ID password credentials to log in so that everybody can apply their leaves, they can update their uh, personal details, they can update their certification details, anything they can update in the system as an employee. Okay, every employee will have the login guys. Don't think that this is only for HRs like that. Every user will be able to log in, but permissions would differ. As a general employee, what I can do, as a HR, what HR can do, as a HOD, what HOD can do, role to role, the permissions will differ. Okay, and we have dedicated uh, sessions on permissioning. So if you just search with the keyword as permissions, you have a lot of things about permissions that we deal down the line. We look into those permissions concepts as well. Okay, good. So now going further, before we get into the config level sessions, we also have to understand about the project methodology. So whenever you are implementing success factors projects in the real time ways, as a consultant, right from the starting stage of the project till the end of the project, what are required? So I generally concentrate on these things as well, guys. It's not just about learning something and uh, uh, going into the market. You should be able to have the functional understanding of the entire process. 
So tomorrow, if somebody is going to ask you, how do you do a project? You should have that answers. Okay. So I make sure till from this point, I cover from the basic sessions. So SAP Activate is a methodology that we use in the real time. SAP Activate methodology. So the way how the project to be delivered in the success factors will be based on this methodology with four important stages involved in it. Prepare to deploy. So whenever a project is coming, if when the project is initiating, that is say Coca-Cola as a client example, IBM is a IT company. So the contract between these companies as a client and IT partner, the contract between them happens in the initial phase. That's called the prepare phase. That is deciding what is the budget of the project, what is the timeline of the project, what all modules we are implementing, which languages we are implementing. Okay. Next, which countries? If you say Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola is not only in India. It's in US, it's in Canada, it's in Australia. So which all countries are currently in the scope of the project? So all the scoping of the project, budgeting, timelines, everything is done in the prepare phase. It's a preparation of the project is happening. By the end of the prepare phase, once everything is agreed, by the end of prepare phase, consultants will be allocated to the project. Say we are implementing three modules, employees in, in central, performance management, recruiting management. Three modules we are implementing. For every module, one dedicated consultant will be allocated. So this is Mr. Shiva who will handle EC module. This is Mr. Suresh. He will handle uh, recruitment module. Like that, the consultants will be allocated. That's the end of prepare phase. The agreements, project documents, the project scope finalization, everything, and the consultants allocation happen there. Then we enter into the second stage called the explore phase, gentlemen, where explore is all about requirement gathering. So we should understand the client's requirements. So what is their existing software? What are their pain areas in the existing software? So what are they not able to do why are they suffering from the existing software? So what is the workaround or what is the solution that we can provide from success factors for that uh, pain areas for them? And what are the inputs that we require as a consultant to configure the software? So all the as is and the to be discussions we make there. As is is what is your current process and from success factors, how do you want to set up it? So as is and to be is what we in detail discuss and that's what we do the requirement gathering. We call it as explore phase. And that requirement gathering happens on an average between two to four weeks. So for a few modules, it will be done in two weeks. For a few modules, it would require four weeks of regular sessions with the HRs in the company, understanding their policies, requirements, everything. And we then we can do the configurations. So second phase is the, all about requirement gathering. And the third phase is the realized phase. And that, that this is the lengthiest phase in the project. This takes months together. This is all about configuration and testing. Realize phase is all about configuring and testing the product. So for the requirements, what we have taken from the uh, client in the explore phase, configuring that thing in the system, we do in the realize phase. And once our configurations are done, the client to do the testing and confirming that everything is working fine, that testing also happens in the realize phase. So in the realize phase, both configuration and testing, both will happen. That is the lengthiest phase that can run for minimum four months till uh, eight months, nine months also. That depends upon the complexity of the project, the timelines increase. And once client has said everything is okay, and now we are ready to start using it in the live system. So the main live system is what they have to get it ready. So in the realize phase, they make use of Development systems, quality systems, and all guys. That is, let me show you an Excel sheet. Generally, whenever we work on IT softwares, most of you should be already aware. If not, not a problem. Let me open and show you one document. So if you see on my current Excel sheet, this way we'll have an environment of three systems, guys. Development system, testing or the quality system, then the production system. This is a basic IT thing where most of you should be already aware. Three systems we use. So during the realize phase, where I say configuration and testing both will happen, these two systems will be used. Where in the development stage, the consultants will do all the configuration in one system. And by the time we the, it, is the, it is time for the client to do the testing, we co copy all the configurations to the testing system. And here the client will do all the testing. 
and they give their say yes or no they go 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 ahead or uh, not okay something they confirm if they say everything is okay then we have to move configurations into the production system the final system and this is a system what they are going to use in the real time the actual employee data hiring employee leave application salary processing everything will happen on this main production system that way we'll have three systems for sure and deploy uh, sorry the development and testing systems will be used in the realize phase and deploy phase is all about preparing the production system the deploy phase the last phase is all about getting this last system ready the production system to be ready that is to move all the configurations to the production system to upload all the employee data so if coca cola wants to implement success factors from today already coca cola has 10000 employees all the 10000 employee data you have to upload into system so uploading that process data say setting up the permissions as an employee, what permission should be given? As a HR, what permission should be given? Setting up all that permissions, all that things we do in the deploy phase. Getting the main system ready for go live is what we do in the deploy phase. And the final stage of deploy, it is go live. We announce the project is completed and we'll release the system to the employees of the client. So Coca Cola employees example, they'll start using the system. That way, we have the success factors project that will be executed with four different stages, right from prepare to the deploy with four stages in a phasely manner, we deliver it. Okay. And now, people who are already into some other IT areas, IT software areas can ask me a question. How is it different from other software? If I, the way how I told you the four stages, this is common even in even you do a Java project, a .NET project, an Oracle project, these are common things. First, there will be a contract between the company and the IT partner. Then there will be requirement gathering. Then there will be configuration, testing, and finally preparing the main system. How is it different, different from other softwares when it comes to success factors? So for that question, point is, explore and realize phase play a major role, guys. The explore phase and the realize phase. Okay, these two have a very important differentiation. That is generally requirement gathering means when once we have the discussions with the uh, client after understanding all their requirements in any general IT uh, sector, what happens is a business blueprint document will be prepared. A, a word document, which is called business blueprint document, they say BBP document, which, which almost 200 pages, sometimes even it goes to 400, 500 pages, a lengthy document with each and every company's processes, their existing practices, their uh, new requirements, conditions, validations, everything will be documented. And on that document, they take the sign off. As per this, we have to configure the system, the business blueprint document. So replacing that, SF has come up with an approach of workbooks, guys. Replacing that uh, documents, SF has come to a predefined requirement gathering Excel sheets, actually. Predefined requirement gathering Excel sheets. So those are called workbooks, where for every module of success factors, there is one default requirement gathering work, uh, Excel sheet in which you have to take the requirements. That will save a lot of time. And that will make sure you are covering each and every required input to do the configuration. So tomorrow after one month, you, you realize that uh, I forgot to ask this point to my customer. So that situation should not come. So if you follow the standard Excel sheets, SF has made sure that each and every point what is required for requirement gathering is placed in this file. You crossing each and every sheet in this Excel file will make sure you are covering all the questions what you should ask the client to get the required information. So this is what they call it as workbooks, configuration workbooks, where you record all the details in this file. And on this file, you take the sign off and then you start your configurations. That is the way. So this is one key differentiator when it comes to other regular software in the market or when it compares to success factors. It's a predefined template from SAP for every module you have it. So example, success factors being a HR software, we maintain the client's uh, list of departments. What all departments the client has, we have to definitely capture. So tomorrow while I'm hiring an employee, I, I should know which department are available, right? So the list of departments we have to capture. So for that, SF gives a default sheet. 
list of department names, the department descriptions, who are the head of the departments. Like this, we have a different defined Excel sheet with all the columns in which we can capture the data. This is one thing. When you're going to maintain the list of departments in the company, say this company has say 20 departments, like HR, sales, marketing, branding, IT, like this, they have say around 20 departments. You have to maintain that list of 20 departments in the system. And that's not just simply a drop down, guys. When you have to maintain a department name in the success factor system, you have a screen with all these kinds of fields that you have to fill in. So when is the department started in the business? The effective date, the code of a department, the name of a department. Code is like a unique identifier. Like for every employee, there will be a unique employee ID. For every department, we can come up with a unique code, the name of the department, description of the department. Today, the department is currently active or not. The status, who is the head of the department, like this, different fields we have on the screen. Filling all these fields, one department is created. Like that, if it is 20 departments, 20 to 20 times the screen will be created and 20 department inputs will be given in the system. That's how the standard screen of department creation looks like in SM. So we can show this screen to the customer. And if customer is okay with this, fine. But if they, if they say that, no, we don't want to have this field cost center remove this or I want to have one more custom field add at the bottom or make this description field mandatory. Uh, uh, relabel this name field as department name. Like this, any changes the client is asking, mandatory, non-mandatory, visible, invisible, label change, add a new field, remove an existing field, any changes the client comes up, we can record all that in the same Excel sheet on the left-hand side. So all the fields, what you're seeing in the screenshot on the, on the right hand side are present on the left hand side here, all the standard fields. Mm -hmm. So these are the standard field labels. If client wants to give, change the label, customer labels is where you have another column where I can record everything here. Any field label change, I can record it here. So which are mandatory, non-mandatory, yes or no. Okay, length of the fields, if you want to increase the screen length or anything. Any additional uh, conditions or comments about each and every field, you can write it down here. Or completely a new field if you want to add, you can come to the bottom. At last, they have given a place for custom. So cust, cust is like custom fields. If you want to have three custom fields, you can add three line items. You can record it here. Like this, each and everything till a granular level, everything is recorded here. So to tomorrow, everything, it will be present in this file, even a length related input, mandatory, non-mandatory, anything, you record it here. It's not that I forgot this point, nothing. Everything is discussed and documented here. So this way, SF has followed, SF is following the standard requirement gathering templates for the requirement gathering process. This is one key differentiator, guys. There is no option to download a workbook kind of an option with the requirements. Okay, so every time a workbook has to be definitely be filled in by a person. And if there is a change of consultant or a change of company who is supporting the project, that has to be part of the handover. If they did not give it, then look, you have to analyze the system, look at what is present in the system, and you have to prepare a workbook with the existing configurations. If there are, say, 20 departments, you prepare this Excel sheet of the workbook with all the 20 departments, and you have to prepare. There is no way that you can generate a workbook with all the configurations. From the SAP website, what you can download will be only a blank workbook without any inputs. You have to fill it. So in success factors, we have just the places of config where you have to go. That's not in the form of a T code. So example, you want to hire an employee. In SAP, you might be calling it as PA40. But here, it's simple English language. We say add new employee. So it's not any codes. We have statements. So I want to do a hiring, I go for add new employee and I go there. If I want to apply a leave, I just have a keyword called time off. If I click on time off, I go to view my time off. From there, I can apply a leave or right from the shortcut on the home page, I can click on this request time off and I can apply a leave. Like this, it's not any codes we have to remember, just a statement to, uh, to, uh, to the place that, that will take you uh, for the required config activity. So one more example is you want to uh, set up the password uh, policies in the system. Just search with the keyword as password. 
So regarding password related, what all options are there? They come up here in password login policy settings, the password related length, like minimum length of the password, maximum length of the password, any settings you have to do, you can do it here. So nothing is codes and success factors. You need not memorize. You just have to give the keyword what you want to do with matching that keyword, what are all available, everything comes up. Just give me a moment. Let me go back to that point of uh, the implementation model. So these are the four stages where explore phase phases one that makes a difference where instead of a business blueprint document, we have the Excel sheets in which we do the requirement gathering first thing. Second differentiator is about the realize phase. So realize phase is the place where all the configurations and the testing happen is what I told. So example, if you are given a project of say six months of time, almost five months people do the configurations. And in the last month, we give the product for testing. And in two weeks, they do the testing. Once testing is done, then we do the deploy phase and all. But avoiding that, SF comes up with a different approach of agile based process. Agile based, where we deliver the project in an incremental way, such that we are giving a chance to the business or the client to visualize the system in different intervals. I don't uh, keep them waiting till five months. And I say that at the end of the fifth month, I'll show you the output. No, not in that way. So once the project has started, configurations have started, I can work for say 45 days, one and a half month we can work on. And then I can go in front of the client and I can showcase the pro progress of the project. Say it's example like 25 to 30% done. I'll showcase the base, the base design, what is being uh, set up, we can showcase them. So that is at this early stage, if there is any difference of understanding, the client says, no, this is not my requirement is. So that can be corrected at the early stage. Instead of we spending five months and then we realizing this is what, this is not what client wants. We'll have a chance to, we are, we are basically involving the client indirectly in the project. So along with us, we are asked, we are making them work along with us. So everywhere you look at the progress, you see what are the changes that you require. If is that meeting your requirement expectation? So that at least we can correct, correct it, the design or anything. So that way we go for the uh, client presentation after say 45 days, we take the feedback and we come back to office. Any changes to be done, we do it. And we do few more configurations. We work for a few more weeks. And again, at uh, somewhere around 11 weeks or 12 weeks, we go in front of the client for second round of demonstration. By this time, we make sure at least 60 to 65% of the configurations are done. Here, again, if there are any comments, feedbacks, we take it, but not on a scratch level design. And after the second round of walkthrough, now they can't say a scratch level design. Yeah, I already demonstrated you last time. Now what I can accept is any change of requirements, like any new workflow changes, approval process flow changes, custom fields to be added, that I accept. A complete process flow change from the beginning can't be accepted like that. Now, again, we come back to office, work for a few more weeks and somewhere again in the 16th week or sometime, I go in front of the client one more round. This time, 100% configuration should be done and I give the end-to-end -end demonstration right from the first step to the last step, complete cycle demonstrations I can give. So that way, we follow SI process incremental way. So in multiple intervals, I go in front of the client and demonstrate and show the progress. So wherever corrections required, I can correct it. And this is how the realize phase functions. And at the end of the third walkthrough of the product, now we release the product for testing, trainings, all that. So this is how realized phase makes a difference when compared to any other products in the market. This three rounds of walkthrough is a general, uh, uh, general thing in the market, guys. So it's not mandatory that you should stick to three. If it's a project with a lengthy, like it's a large enterprise project like Coca-Cola, it's a big project, you're doing it for one year. You can even have six rounds of meetings with the clients. Every 45 days, if you want, you can make it to six rounds also. Okay, it depends upon the project design. So the main target is to have multiple rounds of uh, uh, iterations with the client. Okay, so three or more than three, it's up to you. So that way we have the activate methodology that plays a difference with the other methodologies in the market, specifically in terms of explore and the realize phases. Now also to explain you guys in terms of that certification related question guys. So when you have to go for certification of success factors, one key point is it's not a single certification. Every module has a separate certification. 
employee central recruitment performance compensation like this 11 modules have 11 independent certifications which module you are certified you can work on only that module in the real time it's not that i just get one certification and i work on any module no it doesn't work which module you are certified only that you can work in the real time first thing second in terms of certification cost and all so it, it is going to cost you in indian currency we have to say uh, around 45000 includes I mean, uh, excluding taxes uh, with taxes it might go to 47 max so that is a one time cost that you make and you can write up to six certifications if you see the third point it gives you six attempts so six items you use for six different modules or only one module you write six items, it's up to you. Okay, generally 90%, nobody gets disqualified. So the first attempt itself, everybody will be qualified for sure. I'm confident about my training. So the point is six items for 47K one-time payment, you will be getting where you can write up to six different modules of certification. Every module has 80 questions in the exam, 80 questions, completely multiple choice. No descriptive answers, completely multiple choice, no negative marking. Okay. If you if you got a right right answer, it's one point. Wrong answer, nothing gone. So, like that, you have to take 80 questions exam in three hours. It's three hours exam. That's a decent time. And the pass percentage differs from paper to paper. For one module, it might be 60% as a pass percentage. For another module, it might be 65, 70, 75. Between 60 to 75, the pass percentage generally varies, guys. So this is about a high level detail about the exam. So where do you subscribe for that? Where do you apply? How do you prepare? All that more in detail down the line in my sessions. I'll anyways explain you guys. Hello, everyone. I wanted to provide a brief overview of Zarentix training program for SAP Success Factor Employee Central and Performance Management and Goal Management. This comprehensive course covers key concepts and tools to centralize and optimize employee performance across your organization. Over the past few years, hundreds of HR professionals and managers have leveraged Zarentex Success Factor Training to improve performance evaluation align employee goals and advance their careers. After completing the course, many have shared their success stories on Zarentex testimonial platform. So in just few weeks, you can learn how to configure and roll out success factor performance reviews, capture employee achievements, provide ongoing feedback and automate talent development plans. This can open doors to new HR opportunities to help you get more value from success factors at your company. If you want to learn more about managing and motivating your workforce with Success Factors Employee Central and PMGM, visit the link below for detailed course information from Zarentech. Getting started now with the training is a smart investment for anyone looking to expand their expertise in this cutting edge SAP solutions. And uh, to start with the agenda today, we'll be looking into the day one activities. So once you are got trained, you got certified, and you are uh, into the jobs of success factors, the way how the sequence of activities start. So whenever you are allocated to the project, what are the things that you have to take care of? So such kind of things is what we'll be discussing. So that is in a more realistic way. What happens in the real time projects is what the first thing is. Next, we'll also get introduced with some important SAP Success Factors websites. So as a part of Success Factors Consulting, whatever are the important websites that you should be aware of to access a lot of documents, resources, all that. And then we'll be also looking at the way we can set up the logo of Success Factors in the system and the way how we can design the theming, the themes in the Success Factors system, the way we can, the colors, combinations, how we are looking at. So how can we handle that is also what we'll be focusing on. These are the primary agenda items. So if we still, if we still have some time, we can also co cover up additional things, but this is the main agenda. Okay, this is what we'll start with. And one second, let me share the respective slides of the day one activities. So whenever we are allocated to the project, guys, if you say example now, uh, once you are into the career of success factors, 
once you are into the career of success factors you are into a job say example you are employed with ibm ibm is your employer say then somebody in the ibm comes and tell you, tells you mr shiva you are allocated to this coca cola project mr shiva you are allocated to coca cola project if that is what it happens so as a consultant how can i start contributing to this project how can i participate in this project is the point so in that in that sense it is that we should have the access to the system first of all without having the access to the success factor systems we cannot go further in that context as we got in, initially introduced already so provisioning and instances are the two systems that we generally work on success factors provisioning system and the insist instance system two systems okay so first we should get the access to the provisioning from there eventually we can obviously get the access to the instance as well and for getting the access to the provisioning we have to approach sap we have to raise a request to the official sap where sap can only give us the access to the provisioning system of any customer and for that to happen you should definitely get certified only a certified success factors consultant can get an access to the success factors provisioning system that is the thing so here to get an access to the provisioning system you should have an approval email from the client so let me share you one slide yeah so we have to write an approval email to the client asking for a, their approval stating that i am an employee of this company this is my certification id and i need access to your systems to test to start working in your project so that's how you have to mention your details and raise a send a email to the client and client has to give you an approval so that with that approval you can raise a request in the hcm cloud operations portal we have a website called hcm cloud operations portal in that you can raise the request that is a way so along with the approval email that the client is giving client also has to give us two more details called as customer id and the data center guys customer id and the data center so customer id is nothing but every project in the market will have a 10 character unique id every project in the market will have a 10 character unique id so that is what you have to give along with that the data center that is across the 15 data centers that we are that we are having uh, across the globe that are maintained and managed by sap to maintain their global customer database so in which data center this current project database is hosted the data center also they have to confirm okay so the customer id what has been given to the project and also the data center what has been allocated to the project these two details the client will be able to give us basically sap will be sharing the details uh, with the client and client has to share it with us that is a way so approval email is what they have to give us along with these couple of details yeah and once we have the details we go into this website called hcm cloud operations portal where once you go to that portal there you should be able to uh, log in with your success factors certification credentials whenever you are certified in success factors you will be receiving some credentials called s user credentials as sap user credentials in short they call it as s user credentials so that s user credentials are what you have to utilize with that you should be able to log in into any sap websites even into this portal also you will be able to log in with that credential and in, in internally in that we'll have a application form kind of a thing that you have to fill with all your client details your uh, certification details the approval email that you have received all that you have to mention there and you have to submit the request once you submit within max 5 business days you will get the access to the client's provisioning system 5 business days to the provisioning side of the system you will get the access so 5 is the maximum sla period so mostly by the next day itself by the next business day itself the in the recent times they are releasing the access but 5 is the maximum time so this way we have the initial activity to be focused on as soon as somebody mentions that you are allocated to this project you are focus should be on how can i get the access to the client system that is the first thing okay and once you take the approval email and if you have to go to this portal and apply how does that portal look like what is the application form that you have to fill in we'll have a look at that now where uh, uh, we can't get we can't actually get into the actual uh, login of this portal but uh, i have a uh, document with complete screenshots of that i'll show you because that portal will be connected with the official projects i can't uh, directly log in into that 
but I'll show you the document with the detailed navigations. Once we visit this uh, portal, the HCM Cloud Operations portal and give your uh, certification credentials and uh, login, you will see this kind of menu items, operation requests, reference URLs, demo instance like this, some headings. In that the first one called operation request is what you have to look, look take, uh, that is, the, is what you have to go for guys, operation requests. Under operation requests, you have a couple of them, request forms and request status. In that the first one called request forms is what you have to go for. Once you click on the request forms, again, in the next screen that is coming in the name of BizX provisioning account mapping request. There also the first one, customer instance access request is what we have to click. Easy to remember, the first menu item, in that the first drop down item, in the next screen again, the first link, customer instance access request. So once we click on that, system will come up with an application form, which is customer instance access request form which is abbreviated as CAR, CAR, but people call it as CAR. We don't call it as CAR. We call it as CAR form. CAR form is the terminology that they represent it, where you have to just fill all these details, self-explanatory details, customer name, say Coca-Cola is your client, say Coca-Cola Beverages Private Limited, like that the client name will be given. Estimated go live date is whenever the project has been already uh, agreed, the project management level, the budgeting of the project, the timeline of the project is already decided. Your project manager will be able to give you what is the go live date is expected. So today on today in the last week of May, if we are starting the project, from here on average six to eight months, so you can take somewhere in December kind of a go live. A date can be given. You need not be so sure about it. Some tentative date can be given, not a problem. Then here we have to enter the third field, company ID. So you call it as a company ID, tenant ID, instance ID, it's all the same. Customer ID, anything, they're all the same. So the 10 character ID, what I've told that every project will be allocated with. So that has to be given here. So this, this information your client would have already given you along with the approval email. So that you have to enter here, the 10 digit uh, customer ID. And the second, the next field is the data center location. So this is a drop down field. You see on the right hand side, data center location is a drop down field where it comes up with the drop-down values of all the 15 data centers, in which data center your client's database is hosted. So that data center you have to pick. Even that data center information also, client would have given you in the approval email, whether it is in the Sydney data center or Saudi data center or South Africa, whatever, we can choose from this drop-down. And the fifth field here is the person who has given you an approval from the client side company approver email addresses, the client side, whoever has given you the approval, you have to give their email ID. Here. So these are the five fields that you have to concentrate in this page. Customer name, go live date, company ID, data center location, and the company approver email address, five fields. That's it. Once you're done filling those fields, next you can come to the further part of the application form where it shows you the module the modules names. So which module are you requesting the access for is what you have to select here guys. So we have employee central performance recruitment, multiple modules in this project. But the point is you are allocated for which module that is what you have to select. So this, this project might be having three, four modules, but you should not select all the three, four for which you are allocated only that module. First thing, second thing is you should select the module on which you are certified. So if you are say that you say you are selecting EC, but if you are not certified on EC, then your request will not be entertained. As soon as you select EC, the system will even give you a pop-up saying that we don't find a valid certification uh, for, of, of EC against your ID. Against your ID system has a registry of what all certifications you already have. So if you choose a module other than those, it will definitely give you a pop-up error stating we don't find a certification on this module against your ID. So you should be certified on the module what you are selecting for sure. And then consultant name and email address is something that will be auto-populated based on your uh, login credentials, based on your certification credentials. When you log in, automatically that ID belongs to which user, his name and email ID will be auto-populated here. And then we have the region and location. The region and location is something that you have to fill your region, your location. It's not the project region and location, your region and location. 
it might be a project of india us australia canada any country from where you are working is important if you are an employee from in an indian company working from india then you have to choose your indian details if you are a person from us working from us location for a australian customer but your location is us you have to give us details so in the regions it comes as the continental list like uh, the apac as asia pacific next latin america next you have this uh, europe uh, next you have uh, middle east area like this they have give they give you these uh, continental regions and once you select say example you are from india in the region you will select a drop down as asia pacific apac under that in the locations the countries come in the locations under apac whatever are the countries that countries will come like apac countries like india sri lanka singapore malaysia all that will be coming you can select the respective country so it should be the consultant region and location and then approval attachment so whatever is the approval email that you have received from your client that approval attachment is what you have to make here and finally an optional thing you can upload your certificate copy but they already have the the registry of your certifications if you want you can also optionally upload your certificate copy and submit the request so this way filling all these details like maximum around 10 fields of information is what you fill here five and in the next page the module region location all this around 10 fields is what you have to fill and submit the request if max within five business days sap will respond with the credentials that you can use to log in into the provisioning system of the client the url id password with the url id and password you can log in this that is the way it is okay to we'll go forward so this is the way once we place this or we place this request to get the access and once you get the access guys so this is the activity that should be done by every consultant every consultant has to uh, do the same activity if there are say three consultants allocated to the project each each of them should get an approval email from the client and they should uh, uh, fill this form fill uh, then submit a request and wait for the credentials to come it is not that one person in the project does this every consultant has to do it for themselves individually first point next this thing can happen either on day 1 or it can ha happen on day 5 or day 10 or day 15 so initial days in the initial days people will generally expect to have this to be done but it depends upon the how fast the things are moving in the project say for you to get an approval email first client should know who who you are if suddenly mr shiva raises an approval email to the project manager in coca cola how will he know who is shiva so there should be an introduction call at the team introduction call is what it happens in the initial days where your ibm project manager you say example you are an employee of ibm your project manager of ibm should arrange a meeting with the client side team saying that this is a team who will work for your project from our company so this is mr shiva who will work for employee central this is mr suresh he'll work for uh, recruitment module like that the team introduction should happen then you have to write an email then they will recognize who you are and they will be even then they they might take couple of days and then they'll approve the request so for this to happen project to project in the initial one week two weeks three weeks the things happen it depends upon project to project okay so when we call it as day one from your end you should be ready from day one but how soon the other things are happening the dependent things are happening it differs from project to project okay that is the way and once we get the access guys once we get the access by following these steps there will be few things that you can carry out in the provisioning system immediately as soon as you get the access to the provisioning system these are the few initial steps to be carried out in provisioning where provisioning is a place which is the the things what we do there is all about activations out of 43 languages supported which which languages to be activate and then out of uh, the different uh, what do you say <coughs> out of the different uh, modules that are available which modules you have to activate in that module again which features and functionalities that we have to activate all that depends uh, all that activity is what it happens in the provisioning okay but before even that module level things and all some base core core activations some basic minimum core activations around four to five things every consultant should be aware of that's what we'll first discuss 
The first thing is language packs, as usual, the main mandatory thing to be activated. So for activating the language packs, you need not wait for input from anybody. So already by the time the project has started, already what languages we are going to implement will be decided at the project management level. The requirements can be decided only once the requirement gathering session is done. But when it comes to the language packs, that will be done even before requirement gathering sessions. In the prepare phase, I mean, in the in starting of the project where the client and uh, the company will have their agreements, there itself they decide what languages to be implemented in the project. So the language packs can be activated like that, followed by something called profile, permissions, some storage limits like this. We have the things. So I'll take you to the provisioning system and show you one by one. How do you activate them? What are they and all? Okay. So let me log in into the provisioning system. So the major point to remember here when we are accessing the provisioning system, guys, you should definitely have two separate browsers. So one system uh, should be used for the instance and another system should be used for the provisioning side. So the one that you are now seeing is the provisioning system where I am using Safari browser in my laptop to log in. Whereas the instance that I show will be every time on the Google Chrome that way. And so whenever we log in into the provisioning, this is the very first, the very first page. And this is the main thing that we see where the company for which we are working, that tagging is done with this provisioning login, with the login that was given to you in that uh, access to the client system. The company's provisioning system is mentioned here internally. So that 10 character ID represents that particular client. It might be Coca-Cola, it might be PepsiCo whatever that ID belongs to that project. And here in the company name on the left hand side, which is a hyperlink here, that generally comes with the client name in the real time. The client name like Coca-Cola Beverages Limited, PepsiCo Limited. So that client name generally comes in the real time. But here this, this being a demonstration system on both the sites, it is the ID that is repeated. Okay. So here we just have to click on the hyperlink of the company name. And the next page comes up in which we can start looking at the various features that we'll be having from the provisioning system. So here in this page, once we click on the hyperlink of the company name and we enter here, the very first link called uh, company settings is what we have to look for. The very first link called company settings. In that, we'll have the several activations, all the checkboxes that are required to be done. So in this company settings page, we keep scrolling down. So we have several checkboxes that keeps on coming, guys. It starts with the module of performance management, followed by various other things. Here we have a succession planning as a module. Here we have language packs as a section like this. We will have several checkboxes that we can actually activate. Okay. So among them, the initial things, what you can do as soon as you get to get into provisioning is what we are considering as of now, immediate things. In that, the first thing is language packs. Here we have language packs as a section under which all the 43 languages are listed. You can choose the required languages. And finding this language packs is not a big deal. Once the checkboxes start in the, in, within the initial 10 to 15 items, you have this uh, heading of language packs. So it's not a big deal to a, uh, uh, find it. It's very easy. And you have all the 43 listed here. You can choose whatever you want. You have two versions of English, the US English and the UK English. You have uh, the Italian language. You have Hindi for India and Arabic for Middle East. Like this, we have multiple languages uh, around 43. Among that, we can activate and deactivate the respective checkboxes. Apart from this, the next thing that we have to take care of activation is profile V12. Profile V12 is what we say. What is profile? Does anybody have an idea what is profile, guys? First of all, okay. But here, when it comes, when we particularly call it as a profile, out the screen in the success factor system, the screen in the SF system, that is. Here, when we go into the employees uh, file here, my employee file in the instance system, when you go for this my employee file, where system is going to show you all your information right from your profile picture, your personal details, your uh, 
contact details, your salary details, everything when it is going to show in a page. So that's what we call it as a profile. Okay. So this is a profile. We can call it as uh, employee profile, people profile, or simply profile, different terminology. Employee profile, people profile, or simply profile. Officially, they call it as people profile. Guys. This interface where you see all the employee data is generally referred as people profile. So you call it as simply profile also. It is the same thing. Where we have different sections of employee information that's sorted here, one after the other, the different sections come up here. So for this page to be available in a system, because that is the main place where all the employee data can be accessible through. So we have to activate this checkbox called profile V12. So V12, what I've been showing in the slide, profile V12. So this V12 is nothing but the version 12, the version 12 of the user interface. So this current profile interface that you are seeing is a version 12. When success factors was uh, uh, acquired by SAP in 2011 December, it was in version 9, V9. In last 10, 11 years, it got updated uh, three more times from V9 to V10, V11, and now it is in the V12, version 12. So this is one we have to activate, profile V12. And then we have to activate something called as permissions, the permissioning framework. So the way how we can set up the permissions, the roles and permissions to the people, like what things a general employee can do, what things a manager can do, a HR, a HOD, how the different people can participate in this and uh, have the different access levels. So that for that, all the access to be set up, we need a framework to be activated in the name of role-based permissions. Role-based permissions as a framework. So let us first see how does these two activations look like where they find. First is profile V12. So in the provisioning system, when you enter into the provisioning system, once the checkboxes start, the language packs in the section that is in the initial 10 to 15 line items, and you can easily find that. That is okay. But when it comes to the point of the other activations, once you keep scrolling down in the hundreds of checkboxes, it is not easy to find out. It is the best way to control F search. Do a search in the name of profile V12. So this word called profile V12 will be available in several points. You just have to keep on searching all these areas where it is getting highlighted in yellow color. All these other places where the profile V12 is a word present. But I need it as an activation with a checkbox. And here it is. Profile V12 is a checkbox that is to be activated here. So this is one of the second prerequisite that has to be activated. First is language packs. Second is profile V12. Once both these are done, the next thing that we have to look at, look for is the permissions, the RVP, role-based permissions. So for that, the keyword that I use is generally refresh. If I use this keyword as refresh, refresh RVPs. So just above that, you will have the checkbox to enable the concept of role-based permissions. Just below that, here you have refresh as a button. So that makes it easy for me to search every time because refresh is a word that's only present uh, only twice or thrice on this entire page. So role-based permissions is the one activation that you have to do that for enabling the permissioning framework. Okay, so that's where we have to have this role-based permissions as a framework. When we start the project, there are some necessary activations for the screens, what we have to access on the front end to be available, guys. For the different screens that are to be available on the front end, because profile is a very important page where we have to see the employee data and all. So for that important tools to be used on the front end, the necessary activations are required in the background. Okay. Where already these this is a mandatory activation that would require be that would be required to do in every project, where SAP has already uh, reduced a lot of such activations and made them default. By the time you come to the system itself, majority of the activations are already made default, but still few things are left at a control of the uh, uh, at the consultant level that they have to do it by default, uh, by mandatory. Okay, so without the activation of profile V12 checkbox, you don't get that user interface on the front end where you are able to see all the employee data. That is the reason. But in the near future, these kinds of mandatory things can also become default. 
okay so that it's not uh, required for you to manually go and do it if it is an optional thing only that should be given at a consistent level so in the near future you can expect even this becomes a default thing without manual intervention and uh, so this role based permissions is the third one that we have to activate and we have just done that next followed by we have set storage so set attachment storage size limit set attachment storage size limit that is we are not talking about the entire uh, success factors database size we are only talking about the limit that we set on the attachments that is say example you are a company with 1000 employees or 10000 or 50000 employees so how much volume of data of those employees you are maintaining there is no limit definitely when it comes to the database size that that, that we used for a company of 1000 employees and 10000 employees it's huge difference it's like 10 times more 10 times more uh, size of uh, information will be present for that company but there is no limit on that how many volume how many employees data you are maintaining electronically on the screen saying this is his first name this is his last name this is his department location electronically on screen whatever data is being maintained there is no limit on it but the limit is existing on the documents the scan copies of the documents that you are uploading against an employee record level so employees educational documents employees previous experience details employees uh, visa document passport or scan copy uh, and in, even the recruitment module you get attachments from a lot of candidates the resume is in the form of pdfs word documents and a lot of resumes you get from the recruitment module in performance module to showcase their achievements and the targets that are achieved they uh, and candidates or I mean, employees will attach some documents like this across the modules you have a lot of pdf files image files that are being attached in the application so for that documents that are being stored into the application, their SAP has come up with a limit, a capping limit of 1000 GB per customer. 1000 GB is not a small thing, so that will be never exhausted. So in my last seven years of experience, I never saw any customer complaining that my 1000 GB is exhausted kind of. So that is more than enough space. Even you implement one module or all the 11 modules, that is a constant value of 1000 GB that you will be offered. So that 1000 GB is the capping, but initially it will be set as only 500. From 500, you can increase it to 750, from 750 to 1000 later on, but initially it will be by default set as 500. That's like almost half of your eligibility. So there is a potential chance that 500 GB of space in an organization like with 20,000, 30,000 employees, that space might be exhausted within four or five years. Okay, let me just show you where is that attachment storage limit point in the provisioning side. So once we are into the provisioning and if we have to search for that attachment storage thing, just do a control F search in the name of document attachment. So with this keyword as document attachment, if we search here, the system will find you the very first line item under that where you can utilize the space what is present here for the storage allocation that is 500 GB was a default space that can be increased to 750 or 1000 GB later on, but these are the options available. Where this 500 GB can be exhausted in three to four years and then they have to increase it to 750 and that is also exhausted, then increase it to 1000 GB. That is how it happens. But no, nobody, uh, I don't see any customer who exceeded 750 also. So that is uh, 750 GB of documents means that's not a small thing. It's a huge space. So generally customers don't get exhausted to that extent. So even if you go with 750 also, it will be fine. But it is not recommended because if you keep it to 500, after the space is exhausted, they have to change it to 750. If that is also exhausted, then they have to change it to 1000. There, a manual intervention is required and an access to the provisioning system is required. Where a client will not have the access to the provisioning system, it is only the consultant and whenever the space is exhausted, they again have to take the support of the uh, IT, IT, IT teams or the official SAP who can support for them. So to avoid that, we recommend to keep it to 1000 GB on the day one itself. Let's not hesitate. Let's keep it to 1000 GB on the day one itself. So exhausting 1000 GB is not an easy thing. It will take a decade minimum. So by that, by then many things can change. So SAP is, uh, might update this quota to 200 GB or I mean, 2000 GB or 1500 GB, anything. So we, we recommend to keep it to 1000 GB by default. Document attachment is a section and the document, uh, I mean, attachment storage allocation is a subheading. 
Okay. This is how it functions. That is the fourth activation. And the fifth one is to create an admin user for yourself on the instance side. For getting the access to the provisioning, you are dependent on SAP. You raised a request to a official SAP by uploading the client approval, by filling other details, all that, and you were able to get the access to the provisioning. But once you get that, you are the boss, you can create your own access for the front end instance. You need, not, you need not depend on anyone. In the provisioning, we'll have a place that a consultant create can create an ID on the front end system for themselves. That's the fifth step where every module consultant will create his own ID. I as an EC consultant, once I get the provisioning access, I'll create my own front end instance ID. Similarly, the other consultant, recruitment consultant, PMGM consultant, everybody will create their own front end instance ID. So those are the initial things that, they, that one has to do once they get the access to the provisioning. Later on, the other things, like once the requirement gathering is done, the other things like uh, activating the employee central module, activating the EC, uh, PMGM module, in that the different features and functionalities, all that happen uh, module to module I mean, uh, and uh, project to project as per the requirements that are present in the project. So this is the initial things that are to be taken care. And how does that admin user creation for the instance happens? Let us look at in the provisioning. Here in the provisioning, I make use of the search keyword as search for first name. The search with this keyword as first name, it will exactly bring you to this place where admin username, password, admin first name, last name, admin email, all the details will be requested. You have to fill all these details and you have to click on the create button on the right hand side, create admin button, by filling all this. So whatever ID you want, whatever user ID that you want. So you can create your own username, password, your first name, last name with all this and click on the create button on the right hand side. So with that credential that you have chosen, you will be having your own ID password created and that can be seen on the front end. So with that ID, you will be logging into the front end instance system. Even the login, what I'm using, the SF admin login on the right hand top corner in the instance that you see. The SF admin ID, what I see also, is something that was created once upon a time in a similar way from the provisioning system. That way, every module consultant should create his own ID credentials, and with that, he can log in into the front end instance. Okay. But here, one question that you should have is how will, once he uh, got the access, how will he be able to, uh, what do you say, log in into the instance? How do you know the URL? He created his ID password, but how will he know the URL? There's a question that should be coming there. Where in the email, what SAP has sent out to, uh, what do you say? The, in the email, what SAP has sent out to actually uh, provide the provisioning URL ID password. In the same email, they also give the instance URL as well, but ID password, they leave it to us to create by ourselves. Provision, uh, along with the provisioning URL, instance URL also is sent in the same email, guys. So this is about the day one activities, guys. So whenever you get into a project, the way how we have to uh, focus on the things is to get the access to the systems. So we have two systems, the provisioning and instance. So how do we get the access to them? In that process, the what are the steps to be followed? How do we get the approval email? Uh, go to this website and place a request and you get the access. And once you get the access, what are the immediate initial things to be carried out in the provisioning system? All this is the initial discussion. Now let me go on to that is important websites. So as a part of success factors consulting, there are some important websites that every consultant should be aware of. So for you to access on the day-to-day -day basis while during your implementations, that is very much important. Let me open that. So here are these three guys, Partnerage, Customer Community and Support Portal. These are the three important uh, portals that you should be uh, aware of where for accessing all these three, you should be certified on at least one single module of success factors and you have to have some SUSE credentials, Certif certified SUSE credentials. Some people also get a SUSE ID without certification. That's not useful for all the navigations or all the websites. So once you're certified at least once on any single module, so that SUSE details what you'll be receiving on your certification. And with that, you can access these portals. Where the first portal that we say as partner edge, that is a portal where the client related, uh, uh, not client related, uh, documents that are related to 
consulting or project implementations will be available. So you as a consultant to do the configurations, whatever kind of documents that you'll be accessing, the product related to config documents, all that, you'll be, have, you'll be having them under the partnerage. And that is a place where you as a consultant can also download the requirement gathering documents, workbooks. So workbooks are something where we will be uh, gathering the client's information, the, client, the client's requirements. So for that documents, where we can require, where we can take the client's requirements. So that workbook can also be downloadable under the partner edge. And then we have the third one called customer community. So the second one, the second one called customer community, where this customer community is a place where any consultant can actually raise a request to the official SAP regarding some features that are not actually functioning in the system. For example, if there is a feature not functioning in the sense, there is no such feature at all example. So a client is asking a particular functionality that is not at all available in success factors. Then as an enhancement request, you can raise it to the official SAP and they'll be having a check in that, check on that. So is that, is this a really a, a important requirement? So if we develop this feature, will that be applicable for only this client or many other clients can also be benefited with that? Like that they evaluate the inputs that are being given and based on that, they do the development and they release in the upcoming uh, releases. That way we have the customer community as a place to raise some enhancement requests for any system, any features that are not working in first place. Second, customer community as a title is itself suggests, it can also be a place where clients can access, where client can have a database of, uh, what do you say, uh, different documentations on their sense, not non-technical documents on the process uh, specific, the end user related documentations of any feature modules, functionalities that can be acquired from the customer community. So the client facing documents are something available. So that is one place. And they'll also have an opportunity to co collaborate with other customers. So they can, uh, some customers uh, can actually collaborate among themselves stating that this is what we have done in this, in our project in this manner. So how, how have you have uh, how have you achieved this concept in your project kind of any uh, knowledge sharing the kind of things to be required so then customer community is a place where the client side top management can collaborate with the other clients in the market that is a way and the last one is the support portal so the support portal is a place where we raise a request to the official uh, sap regarding some features that is not working as expected they have a feature or a functionality where we uh, thought of a particular uh, behavior to work, but it's not working even after following all the correct config steps as per the document. So then to complain such kind of things or to raise it to the SAP's assistance, that's where we use the support portal to reach out to them. And in that, again, you will have uh, the tickets with different SLAs, like some tickets to be resolved in four, uh, the four hours, some in uh, eight hours, some in uh, two days kind of, it depends upon it. The power, that is how the support portal is. So these are the three important websites that you will be requiring for sure in the, the process of delivering the projects. So this is about the important websites. And next thing is, let us start having a look at uh, the concept of the logo upload, so which we were actually not able to achieve previously. How do we upload the logos to the client system of what we'll first start with, followed by, that's a very small thing, followed by we'll be looking into the concept of themes, how does the themes work in the success factor system? Yeah, so now for the logo to be uploaded guys, obviously it's a common requirement from every client. The client will expect to have their own logo of their choice. And on the left hand top corner, you have a best run logo, which is not so visible. Uh, and when it comes to the clarity, it's not so visible. So if you want to upload the client logo, if Coca-Cola is a client, we can upload a Coca-Cola logo. If it's PepsiCo client, PepsiCo logo like that. So for that here, if you search on the top, the top search area with the keyword as logo, you will get the options. The first one, upload company logo is an option through which you can achieve it, guys. Upload company logo, the very first one. You have two things in the name of logo, just don't confuse. Only the first one, simple and perfect. Upload company logo is what you have to go for. And here it will ask for you to attach the photographs. Here you can choose file and you can now uh, uh, link the email, uh, link the image of the client, and you can click on save the logo of the client and you can click on save. Whereas here the point is, 
there are some specifications to be followed for the image that you are going to upload. So if you just mouse over on this uh, question mark symbol on the right on the right hand side, this question mark symbol when you mouse over here, then the system will come up with a pop-up which is going to show you some specifications of how the image format should look like. Where in the second line it shows uh, exactly at the end of the second line it shows the image formats and what formats you can actually have your uh, uh, image to be loaded is that it can be in the .png format or GIF format or JPEG. Okay, PNG, GIF or JPEG are the three formats in which you can actually upload. And then next thing is it. In the third line you see that it should not be larger than 1 MB. In terms of the memory size, it should not be more than 1 MB is one of the requirement. And in terms of dimensions, it should not, it should not exceed one, uh, 210 by 40 pixel. In terms of dimensions, it should not exceed beyond 210 by 40. That is the dimension size. With these three specifications, we need to have a client uh, logo and never depend on Google images for the logos, guys. If you want to upload a logo, never depend on the Google images. Just uh, try write this point to your client side manager, asking them to provide a logo of their company within these specifications exactly. Okay. So whenever we have that uh, uh, logo received from the client is what we generally download on our desktop and we can import it once. That's it. So in, in between, we never take the responsibility of uh, preparing the image of the required required type and then we uh, uh, upload it and also that's not a big deal. So this is the way and for the time being, let me take a logo which is exactly going to fit into this window on the left hand top corner. So for that I have a, a Colgate logo, the most uh, uh, well known uh, toothpaste brand in India at least, just Colgate, I have a logo for that which is exactly fitting into these dimensions, this uh, uh, memory size, all that. Let me just select that, give me a moment. Yeah, so now I just uploaded the Colgate logo, guys. Just a second, it's going to preview. Okay, I am just uploading the similar image, that's why it's not updating. Let me take uh, the proper Colgate logo. Here it is. So this is the well-known logo for most of at least the Indians who have joined the uh, training. So Colgate toothpaste is what we have, have, have picked it as one of the logo. I'm clicking on save. So whenever you save, it doesn't immediately reflect, guys. You need a logout and login back. You have to logout and login back. So here the logo has already started appearing in the admin center page. But once you log out and login, right from the login page, it starts reflecting. I'm just logging out now, right on the login page, you see the updated logo. This is the way. So once you got it updated, login, and in each and every page on the left hand top corner, that the Colgate logo will start reflecting. Whether you are on the home page or admin page or any other page, that logo will appear. That is how it is. A simple activity just go to the keyword as logo, search for that, and go to upload company logo over here. You will have the option. To choose the file, what you prepared uh, with the required dimensions, size, all that, and you upload it. And they never depend on Google Images. So just only ask your project manager or the client side project manager to give the logo, and you just update it. That is it. Okay. That's about the company logo. Any other queries till this point from anyone? Okay. The next thing that we have to look at is that, guys. In terms of the themes, the themes that we have to use, that is, say, if I show you this system. So here, whenever we are accessing the system, you see it is in a uh, basic color here in the background is a dark gray kind of a color in the background. And the highlighter color is orange color. Whenever I'm trying to mouse over on my mouse control on any of the fields it is going to highlight that in orange color so highlighter color is orange and the background color is in this uh, dark gray shade of gray dark shade gray shade kind of so company to company they will be having some color requirements theme colors so every company will have their own signature colors 
and they expect to have their internal website, their, their company's official website, internal portals, everything is with that particular color combinations, guys. So that's what we have to now work on. If a client is coming up with the requirement of a particular combination of colors, how can I deliver it? Can we say it is possible or deny it? So in that context, we'll be looking at now. Okay. So the next thing is to go to the tool. If you search with the keyword as theme on the top search area, if you search with the keyword as theme, you get this option called theme manager, gentlemen. On the very top search area, give the keyword as theme. This will give you this tool. So any tools that I'm showing you, the config related, the logo upload is one, one of the things that I've shown you. Now the theme manager as uploading of themes that I'm showing you, all these are available only to consultants. We the consultants who work for the configurations and maximum some super administrators on the client side, client side, the company HR side, some so there will be at least two or three super administrators kind of, they can have the access, that's it. A general regular employee can't get this. The previous option of company or logo upload or theme manager and all, a general end user of a company will never get it. Only the clients, and they have, you know, only the consultants like us and the client side super administrators, very few, three or four super administrators will have it. That's it. So remember that. Don't think that every employee can do these things. Not at all. Only the consultants and the administrators. So when I search with the keyword as themes, guys, the theme, the keyword as themes, when I search for here, we can get a list of some standard themes. So if you scroll down, you see there are multiple themes which are like grayed out kind of with a, a locked symbol. They are with a locked symbol. All these are the various themes that you have in the list. And all these themes, what you see here are the standard success factors pre-delivered themes where there'll be around 20 themes of standard. And each and every theme comes up with a different color, color combination, color uh, backgrounds, all that. So we can make use of these themes in most of the projects using these existing around 20 different themes we can just take against every theme and the extreme right on the extreme right hand side against every theme you have these dots and when you click on those dots you get the options like try it out and duplicate try it out and duplicate has two options so when we go for try it out immediately the system on which you are currently working that will be reloaded with the new theme with the different backgrounds color combinations and all and you can just navigate few screens for five minutes you can spend time on that theme and you can experience it if you are okay you can continue else you can try it out another theme like that try it out is a feature that you can it's like a, the way you you make trial of your clothes kind of try it out feature where you can do a trial and uh, 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 trial and error kind of each and every theme, whichever theme that fits good for your company as per your color combination requirements that can be activated. So like that, so let me uh, select some theme, anything here, say dark blue, dark slash blue, tortoise metallic one. Against this, I'm going to choose try it out. So when I click on try it out against this, the system is going to get reloaded with that particular color combinations what is present. This is the way it got updated where the background here also almost looks similar like a previous theme, but definitely there is a shade change, almost similar. And in the previous theme, the highlighter color is orange. Here it is the blue color. The blue color is a highlighting color. Like this, you will find different, different uh, differences when you keep on navigating to the different screens and you try to experience it. Okay. I'm again going for the theme manager. Yeah. So this way here, now one theme I have just done it right under Like that, some other theme. So here uh, I'll go for some dark charcoal blue fabric. This is the theme, dark charcoal blue fabric as a theme for which I'm again going for the uh, extreme right hand side, the dots. And under that, I have this try it out option. That's what I'm trying to click on and make use of try it out feature. Now the system will again get reloaded with a different color combination. This time it's a dark brown shade kind of a thing that's coming up. In which the highlighter color this time is some gray shade. 
a gray shaded uh, highlighter color is what it is coming and internally again different other places different color changes will represent okay so this is how we can experience the success factor system in different uh, themes and whichever theme that we find that is good for the company that can be activated so either client can decide and give it or the, uh, the consultants can also decide and give it guys so in my experience 50 percent of the clients will say whichever theme that you feel that is good offer us that that way some people say some people say so we want particularly this colored theme we want it for sure it depends upon clients choice whether they want to go with their own specific two choice or they ask us to recommend whatever will be good whichever the way we can do it now if they want to choose it we give them this access and they allow we'll ask them to spend some time and go for try it out auction against everything so for client, we'll give an ID password through which they can log in and choose their uh, option by using this try it out feature against everything. That is the first thing. Second, second, next thing what we have is if a client says that this theme, this particular theme, uh, uh, dark blue, uh, this metallic one is something uh, I like it. This is something near to our requirement, but we need some changes in it. Okay. Then what we can do is we have an option to duplicate. It's a copy of the standard. The standard theme, you don't have an edit icon. You don't have an edit option. The standard theme can't be edited. You can make a local copy of it. And in that copied version, you can make your necessary changes. So if I go for this duplicate here, system is going to create a copy of the standard. System is going to come up with a copy of the standard here on the left-hand side. Uh, you can see the theme name, which is the copy of the standard one in the name of dark blue and tortoise metallic kind of you have it and on the bottom you will have there several options to make some changes to it where you have a second category here called fine tune so using this fine tune as a category you can actually make the necessary changes here on the right hand side you will have the preview of every change what we are making on the left hand side whatever change you make that preview will come up here say example you have background on the left hand side you have something called background this background is something here it is coming up with some texture texture images in the background it is metallic dark if i want to make it as fabric dark i can choose that so as soon as i change immediately on the right hand side you saw the preview that it got updated fabric dark dark background i choose it as next blue light which is a blue light accordingly the background got changed that way the textures we have some list of textures and the users can choose among these available different textures okay and let me just go for sandy dark some background is selected and here you have header background for the background whatever you have chosen the combination of the header area will be selected this top area this uh, around uh, <coughs> one to two centimeters of area what you have here on the top that's called the header area so that is what it will be come up uh, automatically get selected as per the combination of the background whatever we select so now if i go to select the background as a billy's uh, light so as per the background the header background got updated here on the top so like that if you want to have a different header background of your choice initially it is kept as default default means as per the header background whatever comes uh, as per the normal background whatever is a combination it comes that is default instead of that you want to choose some uh, the particular color you can keep it on solid color and here you have a color picker when you go for this you can choose which color you want to see here on the top if i want to see that top area in this uh, in this kind of a blue version and I so click on apply, the system will update the top header area and the blue version this way. So that is how we have an option to go with the combination of the background or choose an individual header background, two different options we have. That is the way. And then we have logo. So logo is something already we have uploaded in the company logo as a default logo apart from that in the theme if you want to change the logo again here you can use it if i keep it as default logo whatever the logo that we already uploaded previously that will be taken up 
But if you want to upload a different logo here, you can go with the upload logo option and you can upload one more time here. So mostly come people will go with the default logo option. We keep it as it is. Then we have something called placemat. So this placemat is about the title, the title colors, guys. So here you have page title. So this, this is in white color. If if that page titles, the link colors, which are in white and all, if you want to update, this place map is the color that you have to update, where currently it is the pink color that is selected. So sorry, the white color it is selected. If I want to have it uh, in a different shades example, if I want to have it in this orange shade example, some darker orange shade, click on apply. You see the page titles are updated to that page titles, the small hyperlinks and all, they're updated to that particular page title color of orange shade. That is the, pay, the placement as an option. Next, we have this module picker, the home dropdown that we call, where you have the list of all the modules that comes up, guys. So this module picker is something. Here also, you can have some config option. That is where it starts as label text color default. By default, the text is appearing in white color. If I want to see that in a different color, so label text color default. This first attribute under module picker is what you have to choose instead of white. If I want that to be in a red shade, let me give it as red and click on apply. Now you see the module picker as a word on the other related subheadings are all turning into red color. But that's not good for, it's not so readable you think. You can change it in a different color, whichever the way. That way we have, let me choose black. Now we have black, which is more readable. Okay, so the label text color default is black. Label text color hover. The next attribute is label text color hover. That is when I mouse over, what color it changes into. So when I mouse over, it is changing into white. That's what the color it is currently already selected as white color. So when I mouse over, if I want that to be updated into, uh, into some, uh, uh, what do you say, a green shade. I just bad it colors, don't mind. Click on apply. So when I mouse over, if I want to turn it into green shade, you see this. When I mouse over from black, it is turning into green. That is the way. So label text color default, label text color hover. Like this, you have two different. And next thing important is about the various buttons that we come across. Primary buttons is what we have here. So you have two buttons on the screen. If you see on the right hand side, primary and secondary. Secondary is every time going to be the grayed out color. That's it, the gray color. You'll now you'll not have an option to configure anything. The secondary button is every time the gray color. So what is the secondary is generally any screen you go, you get two kinds of buttons: submit, cancel, approve, decline, yes, no, save, cancel. Like that, everywhere you'll have two buttons. So the primary and the secondary, the no, cancel, reject kind of things are in grayed out. And the highlighter, uh, highlighted one is the primary, where this can be updated. For the secondary, you don't have any customization options, but the primary you have. Where as per this current theme, blue color is a highlighter that got taken. So the button color is also in blue. So here if you expand, here you'll have an option, background color default. Background color default, which is currently blue. If I want that to be somewhere in the saffron shade, orange or saffron shade kind of, I can do that. Click on apply. So now, now it is updated, the background color. In, in that background color, if I want to wish to have the text as a, not black color, if it is to be in white color, text color default, which is currently the black, I can update it to white. Click on apply. So the text is appearing in white color, primary as white color. When I mouse over, it is still going to the blue and the text is also going into black. So here you have text color hover. When you mouse over to which color the text has to change. So I want the text to be changed to red color. Keep it red as now click on mouse over. So whenever I'm mousing my, moving my mouse under the button, the text which is in white initially is turning into red. That is the way. Similarly, the button is which is turning into blue from yellow or orange when it is turning into blue. The background color hover is also what we can change it. 
this is my low shade kind of if I change. See this, when I mouse over, it is turning into the yellow color background with the red color text. That way, the button color default and mouse over, the text color default and when it mouse over, both the options we have it. This way, everything is all about trial and error, guys. On the left hand side of the screen, you have an option to do it. Try, you have uh, the fine tuning of different options. Immediately, the preview of that is seen on the right hand side, and you can do the trial and error, and you can design your themes what is required. Once we make all these different changes and we come up with the uh, updated theme with all the different colors, everything, we can click on save at the bottom. And once we save it, then we are ready with a new theme along with apart from the standard given 20 themes, one more 21st theme is ready. And if you want that theme to be that theme to be used, we can. So once we save it, let's come back to the previous page, manage themes, where the latest one on the top will be ours, which we just got created. For that, we can select it as default. So that when we select it as default, every employee in the company will start, will start to see the same theme when they log in. So whichever is set as default, every employee will see that new theme. So this activity, whatever we have done in customizing this theme, guys, this is totally done only to an extent where it is few couple of changes or few changes what it is easy to modify. If a client is almost giving a requirement like a complete new custom theme kind of everything they are changing and designing it in a complete different color combination, which is not at all given by SAP, with a lot of changes and effort involved, then we deny doing it. So this is definitely not our responsibility to do it in a complete scratch level. If it is any fine tuning to the existing one, we do it. If it's a whole change of theme, we deny it. And we tell them that nominate somebody from your internal branding team. Every big companies will have the internal branding teams who will take care of their uh, social media pages, their uh, uh, Twitter accounts, the, the company's websites, all that. So they will be having a team who can design these backgrounds and all. So we, we ask them to nominate somebody from your internal branding and PR team, where we will show them how, what, how can this tool be used the way how I am training you in last 15, 20 minutes about this topic. We'll explain them this tool, how to utilize it. And we give them an ID created for them so that they can design the theme of their choice with the different color combinations, what they want, because we are not designers. We are not any uh, designers here. We are the functional consultants, the business consultants. So we don't go into this designing related things. So only if it is a minimal changes, we take care else. We know we ask them to nominate from somebody from their own internal team. That is the way how it happens in the real time. Next here continued one more question that we can have is now if I keep any theme as default, every employee is going to see the same theme, the same theme they are going to experience. But if a client comes up with a requirement that they want to have different themes, guys, that is theme based on the location of the employee. If the employee belongs to a Mumbai location, he has to see one theme. If he belongs to Chicago location, a different theme kind of location specific or department specific, or we have another parameter called divisions and success factors, departments, divisions, and locations. So based on the department or division or location of the employee, if the theme has to vary, then that is also possible. So what can we do is, so here currently we have some list of different divisions. These are all the divisions, guys. Don't think as departments, these are the divisions, real estate division, uh, retail division, sales division, kind of, we have different divisions here. So the first theme, if I want to give it for say three divisions, I can give it. Second theme, I want to give it for another three divisions. So the four, five, six, these three divisions are given with the second theme. Like that we can set up the people with different uh, themes with the different target populations. The first theme is applicable for the people of these three divisions. Second theme for the people of these three divisions. That way we have the selection done here. Okay, that is the way. But here now this is called divisions wise. If I want it to be departments wise or locations wise, then the system should be giving me here the list of either the locations or the departments. Instead of these divisions, if I want to get the locations, how do I achieve it? Your yeah, system is giving based on divisions, but if I want it to be locations drop down, how do I get it is? 
we have a parameter in the provisioning system, guys. In the provisioning, we get that option. Let me take you to the provisioning once. So this is the provisioning. Let me log in. So once we log in into the provisioning and we click on the hyperlink of the company name and we get in. In this next page where we get in, if you keep scrolling down, you will find, oh uh, no, sorry. And once we get into the provisioning, we click on the hyperlink of the company name and get into this edit company settings. The very first one called company settings is where you go. That is the place where all the activations are also done. The modules, languages, all that we do the activations. Get into that company settings page. And in that, where you find several hundreds of checkboxes. Here, let us search with a keyword as theme. With a keyword as theme that you search, you will only find the direct place, this place. Field user to group users to themes. What is the field that is used to group the users to the themes? This is the one. Currently, it is set to divisions. That's why on the front end, in the theme manager, I'm getting the list of divisions. If I keep it as department on the provisioning, on the front end, it comes with the list of departments. Or if it is locations here, there the list of locations come. So on what basis you want to group the theme in the company? It is based on divisions or departments or locations. You have to choose it from here. And these are the only three possible options. If the, if the employees, sorry, if the organization asks you the requirement that we want the team in our company to be based on the country, we want it to be based on the employee's gender kind of other things, it is, it is definitely a no. We don't have an option to bring any other, other parameters. Only based on these three parameters, you can decide the theme. That's it. Okay, so there are uh, previously, there are some enhancement requests that are raised to SAP also but SAP is not considering that. So almost from for last three, four years, these are the only options that are available and I don't think SAP is going to offer any new other options also. So here, I'll again show you the navigation. Once you log in into the provisioning, click on the hyperlink of the company name and get in. In this next page over here, just go for the very first link called company settings. In that company settings page, where you have uh, the hundreds of checkboxes that you find here, search with the keyword as theme, and you'll be brought to this place. Field user to group users to themes by division or department or location. Once you update this and save on the front end instance side, this drop down what is appearing against every theme will be instead of the divisions, it comes as a list of departments or the locations. So whenever we establish a company structure, it can have multiple layers in the company's organizational structure actually. So in success factors, if we have to look at the company's organizational structure, the root of the company, the company is what we call it as legal entity. Like Coca-Cola Beverages Limited is one legal entity. So under, under that company, you have different business units. Business units are nothing but line of business, line of business. Say Coca-Cola is into manufacturing, beverages manufacturing line of business. Like, like that, they, they might be having a, a real estate as a line of business, banking, pharma, different lines of business. So, what are the different lines of business? That is what the business units layer we give. In the in that line of business, what divisions that can be? So under divisions, there can be some departments and all. This is how the org structure will be set up, guys. So the way you already understand what is departments and locations, division is also one of the org structure item. So when we hire an employee in the company, under which company we are hiring, in that company, in which business unit, in that business unit, in which division we are hiring, we maintain all this information. And to replicate this structure of Employee Central with an example of uh, a well-known organization in India, if we take Reliance as an organization in India, so Reliance has multiple lines of business. They are into communications, petroleum products, textiles, multiple lines of business. There's a couple of examples is what I've given. Under communications line of business, they have the 2G division, 3G division, the 4G geo division, like that multiple divisions. Under that, they have the branding, sales, HR, IT, marketing, different uh, departments and all. So this in this reliance or in this reliance business under communications, the way you have uh, these divisions, 
like that in every company in their line of business they'll have divisions different divisions so example you take educational or uh, it's an educational institution if they are implementing success factors they can have line of businesses teaching their line of businesses about educational services into teaching in that they can have divisions like they are into schools they are into colleges they are into universities they have three things example that is the way they can divide the divisions okay so that way it based on business to business we can have a respective division what they have okay so this is our main agenda guys as i introduced you with the agenda in the starting of the session the three things that i have uh, targeted for today which is initially the you know, look the way how we can start our day one activities in the real time the success factors uh, projects and then followed by the important websites that we keep regularly accessing as a part of the success factors consulting and then the themes as a concept the way how we design the themes in the system how do we upload the logo uh, client logo in the success factor system all the things the main agenda is covered so we'll take up something else some new some more additional things uh, here <laughs> that is to talk about the modules so here i'll, I'll just uh, speak sometime in the general things not about product particularly config and all just two five minutes what is your understanding about employee central module guys okay most of you come to when, whenever the people come for training requirement people come and uh, tell me that uh, i want to start learning success factors and i want to learn employee central when i say employees why employee central particularly they say that uh, yeah that is the base of success factors uh, uh, that is where all the employee data is maintained uh, that's why i want to learn from starting i want to learn employee central as a first module that is the answer i get so do you agree with this explanation if somebody comes and tell you that employee central is a base we have to learn that first do you agree with that so that's the point guys so others there are still a lot of people who are in assumption that employee central is a mandatory module no employee central is an important module because that is the place where main employee hiring promotions everything the main employee record maintenance minimum thing is an employee to be available in the system that's a basic thing so because that is an important thing if there are say 100 projects on success factors happening you will see 60 plus projects which will definitely have employee central module okay so that is a module which has more requirements in the market more demand in the market that is the importance of employee central but when it comes to your learning you you to establish a career and all employee central is not that you have to mandatory do first do employee central then only other module no there are people in the market as just now shilpi has been telling there are people who start directly with other modules also they do recruitment they don't know ec there are people who do pmgm they don't know ec like that every module and success factors is definitely independent you can learn any module and do certification and you can work on that modules definitely individually it's not that you have to first complete the cc then only the other kind of no dependency there are a lot of projects in the market in which there is no ec at all they implement success factors directly with initially pmgm or initially recruitment kind of so ec having is not mandatory with or without ec you can have your career similarly with or without ec a client can have a project just that's a clarification that i want to make even a couple of days back i spoke with a participant from our batch itself and they were with this assumption but i want to make that clear in the foundation level you should be clear in these aspects second why particularly i'm talking about this at this session now is when we talk about that success factors can be implemented without ec then ec is a module where you maintain all the employee data you hire the employee you maintain all his data you do the promotions transfers everything if you don't have success uh, ec in success factors then client should definitely have some other software which will do this job okay so hiring promotions transfer these are the basic functionality in a hr system but if you say you are not implementing ec then without ec you might be doing these activities the similar activities of hiring promotions transfers all this in some other software and that is where 
we can integrate success factors with that system. That's where integrations come in context. So if a client is not easy, having EC, then definitely 100% that project would require a hybrid model so that it is integrated from success factors to the other system. It might be the Oracle system or some other local Java system, .NET system, anything we can integrate. Okay. Why do we integrate then? The question of integration, why do we integrate is, so in that system, when they are in the other system, when they do the hiring, any new employee coming into this uh, company, they first go to that other system, there they do the hiring. So example, Mr. Shiva is joining a, a company called ABC Corporation India Limited. Some ABC Corporation India Limited is a company and that company is using success factors, but not EC. Then they, they might be using some other software in which the hiring can be done. So they enter my details in that other software and they generate an employee ID there. In that other system, the employee ID generation happens. They hire maintaining all my data and an ID is generated. Then that employee ID and that employee record with his first name, last name, all the details, the record will be integrated into success factors from the source system, the system where the employee hiring is happening. From there, the data will be pushed into success factors through integration and the record will be created for that employee here also in success factors also. But here we don't call it an employee then, we just call them as users. If you, if you, if you are using success factors only for talent modules, only as a talent suit, only for recruitment, performance, kind of uh, uh, the talent modules purpose only if you are using success factors, then here we need not call them as employees. We can just simply call them as users. Okay. So the main system where the hiring is happening, there I call them as employees. The way how I am user in LinkedIn, the way how I am user in uh, Link, uh, Gmail, Facebook, all these different websites, I am also user in success factors. My company is using success factors software and I, and I am go, I am given a login way into that system where I can log in. I am a user in this, that's it. So the main hiring happened in some other HR system. It might be Oracle or a Java system or a .NET system somewhere. It was happening. But that is what we call it as a legacy system. The old system, uh, the client's uh, uh, old system where they are still using it for hiring. That is what we call it as a legacy system. And there, then, there we refer them as employees. When SF is used only for talent modules, then here we call them as users. And we only have the minimum required information in SF for that users. All the data, what is maintained in the legacy system is not getting integrated here. Only the mini master data, what is the employee's name, his department, his location, who is his manager, who is his HR. Latest today, today who is his manager, today who is his HR, today in which department he is working. Latest as on date information is only what we are bothered about. After uh, two years, if his designation got changed, he got promoted. The latest from our designation will appear in success factors. The old one will be overrided. So we don't maintain the historic data and all in success factors in that case, because it's already present in the legacy system. When you are promoted, when you got transferred, when your salary is increased, anything will be maintained in your old system. And the history is all maintained there. But in SF, latest changes are only integrated. So when you are passing the data from the legacy system into the success factors, only the latest updates are transmitted and the over the previous things are overrided every time without maintaining any history in success factors. Because we need not duplicate it in different places. You already have the history there. I need not uh, again duplicate it here. That's how only the mini master data with around 25 to 30 columns of data, non-historic latest data only. The latest as on date data is only is what we have to capture in SIF when we don't have uh, employees enter. That's the background to differentiate with EC and without EC, how you refer it, how you see it is that here we don't have uh, any historic data and we just call them as users. Okay. That's one thing. And then, then how do that user data looks like is let me show you a file yeah hope you are able to see my screen this is a, a file in which there is a record for each and every employee just one record for one user in this first uh, in the row that i highlighted it's user id one 
for this employee one, there is only one record. Next, there is employee number one double zero double zero nine, only one record. Like that, for every user, there will be one record with around twenty five to thirty columns of data. Like what is their first name, what is their middle name, last name, their job title, their gender, email ID, followed by the department in which they they work, the location. The location for which they work, the time zone they work, like this, around twenty-five to thirty important mini master data columns. What we would be required for running the talent solution, like for performance module, learning management module, for all these talent modules to run, what data we need only that will be present in this file, and this is the source for the talent modules. So whenever data is pushed from the old HR system into Success Factors with the mini master data, this is the data what it looks like. Only for every user, one record of around twenty-five to thirty columns of data is only what we maintain, and that what would that we would actually need to run the talent solutions like PMGM recruitment or career development planning, any modules. Okay, so this file is what we call with different names. We call it as a basic import file. You call it as a UDF file, user directory file. We say user directory file or a basic import or Mini master data file, three different terminologies that we generally come across. Here is you on my screen on the top in the sticky notes. So this file, which is containing the mini master data, is having three different terminologies: basic import file, user directory file, or a mini master data file. So the last one, mini master data, is a complete unofficial uh, terminology. You don't find that wording anywhere in websites or articles anywhere. But the first two you can find it in different places. The last one is completely an unofficial terminology. That way. So next thing is we have to look at uh, how to uh, load the data using this file. Say example, you are having a software and you are integrating it. Uh, then this is the way. Uh, when you are integrating it, system will automatically through integration prepare a record for every employee joining in the old system. How a record has to be created through integration it creates in the SF system, but if integration is not in place, if client is not investing on the integration, then we should be manually uploading the data. Okay, if client is not investing on the integration between the two systems, then we have to manually maintain the data by filling this Excel template and uploading it so that the users will be created in the success factors. For every employee joining here, the user has to be uploaded here. In this, so how does that record maintenance happens? What all columns you have in that file? How do you prepare that file and upload? Is the activity that we'll be now looking at treating success factors as a non-easy system for a while. So before we start our employee central specific sessions from next week, I want to give you a little bit overview. Also, if you don't have EC, how you treat it? Okay. So in that sense, let us start understanding this file. How is this file looking and all? What are the details that we generally capture over here? So first thing to be noted is it consists of two column headers, guys. It consists of two column headers. So do not touch them. Leave it as it is. Whatever was given from third row only, you maintain your data. It consists of two headers. Most of the files in the success factors when you are trying to import the data, you will have two columns. At least in employee central. Every data import file will have two columns. Okay, like that in various other modules also. Mostly you get two different columns. One column will be with the column uh, field uh, technical names, and the second column with the labels. The first, uh, not columns. Sorry, I have to call them as rows actually. Yeah, rows. The first row will be the technical field names, and the second row is the field labels. What you see on the front end. That way, you see for the middle name. Column F middle name. The technical field name is MI. The label with what you see on the front end is properly the middle name as a full word. So the technical names and the labels can be different. And from third row, you will have the actual data that you can maintain. Also, to understand the columns, the first column is something that is talking about a status, the status of the user, and it accepts only two values, either active or inactive. A person who is currently still working in the company and who can access the Success Factor system, his ID will be active. A user who is not going to access the Success Factor system anymore, his ID will be inactive. 
So first thing is terminated employees, people who got terminated or resigned or uh, res uh, retired from the company. So they should not access the system anymore. So that is you, you mark them as inactive. Not only that, if there are any employees who are suspended, okay, uh, who are on long leave, long medical leave, okay, or professional leave that they have done for doing some MBA and they'll come back after two years. Any people who are uh, on a temporary break from the company also, their, their IDs also can be marked as inactive. So their employment is still active, but temporarily for next one year, they will not be available. We'll make their system inactive, their ID inactive like that. So active or inactive are the only two values this field will take, this column will take. And then you have a user ID as a column, the column B user ID, where here we refer that as the main employee ID. User ID itself is what you can refer as employee ID and it can accept three different formats. Generally, employee ID means we generally refer it as only numeric, but in SF, it can be numeric, it can be alphabetic, or it can be alpha numeric, all the three. Numeric, alphabetic, or alpha numeric, all the three are possible. So here on the top, what you see are all the examples of uh, numeric, pure numeric, nothing, nothing different here. But if you keep scrolling down, let me show you the examples of which are pure alphabetic. Say this. So here what you are seeing, these are all pure alphabetic. And at the bottom, you'll also see something which are alphanumeric as well. Yeah. Here you see the list, E20, E21, 22, 23. All these are like alphanumeric. So all three formats are supported in success factors. It's the client's choice in which format they want their user ID. 90% of the market goes with uh, alpha I mean, numeric only, but the other 10%, if you want, you have an option. That's your employee ID. Whereas the column C is the username. So username is a login name, guys. So with what credential you'll be logging into the success factor system is the username. Okay, whenever you uh, see the login screen of SF, what uh, you enter as a login ID, that is a username. So some companies can have user ID and the username as same. Some companies will come up with a different thing. It's up to their choice. Then you have the self-explanatory fields like first name, nickname, middle name, last name, all this. Followed by here we have tech title, which is uh, the current job title that you have. Gender as male or female that can be represented only with the codes. You should not give the label. You should give only the codes in this file. M for male, F for female. O for others, like we also have like unknown others, undeclared kind of different gender values. So others also can be kept, but only with the abbreviated form. Email ID. And then we have two more columns called manager and HR. So for every employee, every user that you're maintaining in SF, you can tag him with a manager. Employee A reports to B, B reports to C. So that tagging is what we do. So for employee number one, employee number 102009 is the manager. Let me zoom this page. Yeah. So for employee number one, employee number 102009 is the manager. And employee number 102019 is the HR. So against every employee who is his HR manager, who is his uh, uh, reporting manager, both can be tagged like this, guys. And these are mandatory columns. Employees, manager and employee HR are mandatory columns. You should definitely tag them with somebody. And if you don't know whom to tag it right now immediately, then you should at least use these tokens called as no underscore manager, no underscore HR. No underscore manager, no underscore HR are the standard tokens that should be in uppercase letters. So whenever you don't know any input to be given in the manager and HR columns, you should at least give these tokens. You cannot leave the cell blank. If you're trying to upload the, with the blank cells like this, if you keep it blank and upload, it will throw you another. You should definitely have that standard strings. You can make a note of it. It can be a certification question. Next, we have uh, the other columns like department, in which the employee works, what job the employee works, the division, location, all these various columns. And uh, in, in between where I've shown you till the column of uh, manager and HR, Till here, they are mandatory columns, guys. In After that, the other columns, what you see, department, location, all these are non-mandatory. If you know the information you maintain, else not, or else uh, you leave them blank also, that's fine. So next, keep scrolling to the right. 
where you also have the employees hire date, employees phone numbers, fax numbers, address details like this. All this mini master information will be maintained. And here some important column to be discussed about is default locale. Default locale is the login language. Whenever the user logs into the SuccessFactor system, a new user whom you got created, in what language he should experience the system for the first time? So we have Hindi, Arabic, Korean, Japanese, multiple languages activated. For the first time when he see login, what language he should see? That's the default language we maintain. So EN underscore US represents the US English language. If you want British English, EN underscore GB is what we can maintain. The British English, Great Britain it refers to. Like this, we can maintain the language code. But this, where do we find this language code? Is that you have it in the provisioning, the place in the provisioning where you do all these activations, the language pack activations. So there itself we will find it. You need not memorize these language packs, guys. Then the names of the, the codes of the languages, you need not memorize it. Don't worry. So nobody will ask you as an interview or certification question. But on experience, automatically those frequently used languages like English, Arabic, those regular projects, what we do. So that we'll obviously memorize. In the provisioning, here in the third column, you will have the list of all the languages, the third column. The codes of each and every language will be present here. From here, you can just copy paste it into that file, but you need not try to memorize it. Okay. This is one. And then on the extreme last, almost last columns, you will have a place called assignment ID external. This assignment ID external is one more column. That should be repeated with the same input of the user ID. Whatever the user ID that we have given, or I called as employee ID in the column B. As it is, you have to repeat here one more time. So this is a prerequisite. This is a column that got added in the recent times around 2021, where for the external integrations and all, this column will be referred instead of the direct user ID. So that's one technical prerequisite to be followed. If it is integration process, it automatically takes care of it. But if you are manually uploading, you have to repeat the same user ID one more time here in this assignment ID external. That's it. So these are the important columns to be taken care. Other things we'll be anyways discussing down the line when the context comes. But you to prepare a record and upload a, a record through this file and create a user. So these are the mandatory columns what we discuss now. Also, SF gives us some custom columns, like around 15 custom columns here. You see custom 6, custom 7, custom 8 and all. So if you want to maintain some additional information, apart from that around 25, 30 standard columns, some additional information you want to maintain, we can relabel any of these columns and we can maintain that additional data what client wants to maintain here. Okay. So how do we, how do we control, the, uh, control this file configuration? So here instead of uh, custom 02, if I want to have the blood group of the employee captured, so how do we change the column label? It's not that you update in this file. You have to update somewhere in the system. For custom 02 as a field, here the label should come as blade group means we have to update somewhere in the system. So how does that config happen? Where does it happen and all is what we'll see down the line. As of now, this is what the file is through which you can expect the input to be uh, feeding into the success factor system and you don't have EC. So maintaining one sample record in this file, how do we prepare this file? From where do I download this format? And finally, where do I upload it manually? So all that things is what a practical activity that today I first introduced you the background of it. Why do we use this file? And how the file looks like and the introduction to the column names. But how do we practically perform the activity? Finish this activity of uh, practically doing that uh, upload process and user gets created. For these users that are getting created, how do we control the permissions? The permissioning concept in success factors in a detailed way, how does that role-based permissions concept works is one dedicated topic that we'll be targeting. Hello everyone. I wanted to provide a brief overview on Zalantix training program for SAP success factor employee central and performance management and goal management. This comprehensive course covers key concepts and tools to centralize and optimize employee performance across your organization. 
Over the past few years, hundreds of HR professionals and managers have leveraged Zarentech's success factor training to improve performance evaluation, align employee goals, and advance their careers. After completing the course, many have shared their success stories on Zarentech's testimonial platform. So in just few weeks, you can learn how to configure and roll out success factor performance reviews, capture employer achievements, provide ongoing feedback, and automate talent development plans. This can open doors to new HR opportunities to help you get more value from success factors at your company. If you want to learn more about managing and motivating your workforce with Success Factors Employee Central and PMGM, visit the link below for detailed course information from Zarentech. Getting started now with the training is a smart investment for anyone looking to expand their expertise in this cutting-edge SAP solutions. So, guys, in our uh, session, the things at the basic level, what we perform when we are related to the projects, the day one. So, that is like, how do you get the access to the success factor system? And that is both the sides in terms of provisioning and instance. And there, the way how it is important to be certified is what we have understood. And as we get the access to the provisioning, from there, how can we make some basic initial settings in the provisioning and eventually where we can create our own ID to the instance as the main agenda that we focused, followed by we are also looking into the way how we can design the themes in the system, load, uploading of company logo, all these things. And at the end of the session, we have been looking at the topic of if we treat success factors without EC, so a non-EC implementation. So in that case, how does the user data be loaded into success factors? The file format of that is what we started discussing. And in our agenda today, we'll continue that discussion where how to upload that mini master data, what I've been mentioned yesterday, when you are implementing success factors without employee central, only for talent modules. So for the talent modules to operate, we just read the mini master data. We don't require the historic data of the employees, the latest as on date record. So what is their latest current, today's department, today's location, today's designation, who is uh, the current manager, current HR, the latest as on date information is only what we require. So how do we import that? And then how do we deal with the concept of permissioning and success factors in the name of role-based permissions? And at last, email templates. So these are the primary focus areas in our session today. Okay. If not, let's get continued. This is a one, guys. So this is the template that we use to import the basic users in the success factors system. And whenever we have uh, success factors being implemented without EC, we call them as just users. So here in this file, I already introduced you with uh, the columns and the headers. We have two rows as the column headers and then uh, the important columns over here is what we have been discussing yesterday. But where did I get this file format from? So in that context, we can get into the success factor system and we can download it from there. So here in the system of success factors, we have a place called employee export. In this employee export as a place, the second button called export user file is the one that will help you to download the existing user file. I export user file and I click on it, the file gets downloaded. So when this is downloaded, it comes as a zipped folder. Let me open the unzipped file. So now the similar file, which I've been already showing you one more time, the latest one is what I downloaded. So that is from this place, export user file as a button. So first we come to this place called employee export, or you can call it as user export, employee export or user export, anything you can search for and you get this. So in this current system, what I'm showing, it is already employee central activated guys. That's why you're seeing this terminology as employee export. Whereas this can also be in the name of user export when it is a non-EC system. Okay. So when we click on this employee export and we uh, get downloaded with the data file, 
when you first come to the screen, you see three buttons uh, where you click on the export user file, the second one. And when you click on the export user file, the file gets downloaded. In the file that is downloaded, we are already seeing some list of users. There is a lot of data in the system where this is a, all the test data. So the, in this demo system, what we are using for this sessions, so there will be around 1400, around 13 to, 13 to 1400 test user data that success factors will be already preloading and providing us. So that is all this data. So by the time I downloaded as already there are these many users for each and every user one record is being present and the file is downloaded. This is one way. Whereas in the real time, in a fresh project that you have started, so yesterday only you got the access to the provisioning system you created in your ID for the instance system. Okay. So now for the first time when you go and download this file, what data is expected to be present here? How many records are expected to be present here? Any idea? For the first time, when you export this file in a new project, and when I download this file, how many records will be expected to be present in this file? So two answers. So the point is every user that is present in the system, guys. So that is a person who is an end user or a person who has got as admin level access to do the configurations. Anybody is a user in the system, an end user or an admin user, kind of. So as I mentioned yesterday, that every consultant is supposed to create his own ID to the instance system. So if there are say a team of five consultants working, all five of them would have already created their IDs in the uh, uh, IDs from the provisioning for the instance system. That means there are five people having access to the system. And when you download this file for the first time, all your team of five IDs will be downloaded, guys. So you have five, a team of five consultants, all your IDs, where each of you have created your own IDs, that will be present, that initial five records. That is the way. Okay. So this way, make sure that uh, be clear with this understanding that in this file, each and every record, this is not specifically only for the employees of the company. Anybody having a login into the success factor system will have their ID listed here. Okay. You might be an end user. You might be a consultant. You might be a HR admin. Anybody, whoever is having an ID password to login will be present there. So the first time the consultant IDs will be seen. On top of it, we can load the customer specific data. So the client will give us the data where we'll ask them to share the data in this format. So they have to prepare the data of their existing users in this format and give us and we'll import it. Okay. That's about the way what data we see initially. Coming back to the agenda guys. No, now say if we have five users or 500 users, whatever. Now if I have to add one more user and upload and know the process, how it happens. The point is you can add a new user anywhere. You can add it in line number five. You can add it in uh, uh, at the end of the file somewhere else. There is no uh, compulsion that you have to add it in a particular piece. You can add it anywhere. Okay. So here, let me add one record, which is a new record that I'm trying to add for this demonstration purpose. So any new record that we add, we obviously prefer to have it as active. Then user ID. Well, that is what the employee ID I told that that can be alphanumeric. I just keep it as demo underscore today's date May 28. So this is having alphabets. This is having numericals. This is having a symbol. Underscore is also a character. So we have a combination of all that. Okay. And then username. So that is a login name. What you have to enter on your login screen. So that can be the same as user ID or it can have a different one. I am maintaining it as the same. Then the first name. So I'll just take the name of somebody from this uh, session itself. Then I'll take uh, V1 A like this. So the first name and last name is only what I've given. Middle name and nickname are obviously optional. And here suffix is never used. That is something obsolete column. Next title is what I'll give it as say analyst. Gender as we have male and female. We have to give the codes only. Any gender value you have to give only the codes, not the entire label. And then moving on the email ID. Some dummy email ID is what I'm maintaining for now. Then manager and HR columns where for this manager and HR, either you have to maintain an input or you have to use a standard string as no manager, no underscore HR kind of. So currently I want to maintain the manager as SF admin. 
SF admin as a manager I want to maintain. So that SF admin is nothing but the admin user login that I'm using Anya Singh. So now for this new user, Anya Singh is going to be the manager. That's what the SF admin I've entered. And when it comes to HR, if I don't know the HR, the way how the input would be is no underscore HR. That way, so one with the data and one with a uh, standard string. I'm using both the options here. If you don't have, if you don't know whom to be assigned as manager, also you can keep it as no underscore manager here in uppercase letters this way. So till this column of HR are something important, guys, that you have to fill this. After that, the other columns that you see, department, division, location, these kind of all these fields are completely optional. If you have the data, if the client has given you the data, you can maintain else system will not stop you with any errors like phone numbers, fax numbers, address details, all this. The next important field that I told you in this order is default locale. So the default locale is nothing but the default language when the user is going to log into the success factor system for the first time. So in which language is expected to see the system is a default lag, is a default locale. So en underscore us represents us English, en underscore gb represents the uh, British English, like that for every language you'll have a code. So now I'm going to give it as US English. So you'll see the system for the first time in US English. And then again, the last column, the last but one here we'll have uh, in the name of assignment ID external almost in the last third place, third place on the last. This is assignment ID external as a column is one you have to repeat again with the user ID what you maintained in the column B. So we have kept it as demo underscore May 28. Demo underscore May 28 is the user ID that we have given. The same thing I repeated one more time here. So this way the first from the active column till the column of uh, HR and manager is what you have to maintain. Then the default locale and the assignment ID external are the two columns the later you have to maintain. All the other columns are optional. If you have the data you maintain else system doesn't stop you. And the reason why we maintain this assignment ID external one more time is that this is a recently deduced field in the year of 2021 updates they've released this. So this is a column that will generally be used for integrations. So whenever there are integrations with, from the success factors to the third party systems, so the integration process will be referring to this assignment ID external as a column instead of the column B user ID. Okay, we have to repeat the same exact input what is given in the column B. That's the prerequisite. And if it's an integrated way, you need not deal with it. System will automatically take care. But if it's a manual way only, we are required to look at this. So this way, the same one what is maintained in the column B is what I repeated again in the last column. So this way we have to maintain the record either you maintain one record or 100 records you can maintain that and let us save this file so this added one more latest record and once this is done come back coming back to the system way to be imported back from this place called employee export using the second button called export user file you downloaded it and you added an additional record now when it comes to the point of importing the data and creating that user in the system we have a place called import employee data. Import employee data. I'm again telling the word employees here, we are referring here all because this is an employee central activated system. That's where you're seeing this uh, terminology as employee, day, employee, where in a non EC system, you will see the word as import users. Okay, instead of import employee data, you will find it the word as import users kind of. That is the way we get in there. And once we are into that import users, we have a drop down of different kinds of data what we can actually import. And in a non EC system, the very basic import is only what we would be requiring. So the basic import is what we select in this drop down. So this is nothing but the three terminologies that I told you yesterday. You can call it as basic import, user directory, or you can call it as mini, mini master data file, anything. This is the one. Once you select that, browse for your file once you even browse for your file just uh, that's it these two are the things that you have to consider let's leave the other parameters as it is do not worry about them just the basic import and the file what you have pre prepared with the additional record and just click on the import button on the right hand bottom corner when you click on import 
system will give you a message saying that your file has been uploaded to the server. System says your file has been imported to the server. It doesn't say your data is loaded. It says just the file, the raw file as it is has been loaded to the server where it will internally examine the file, whether all the mandatory columns are taken care of, the text in the uh, fields are properly formatted, all that it will check. Then once everything is fine, it will import the data and confirm you over an email. An email notification will be generated once your file has been processed, indicating the final status of your request, whether it is imported or uh, uh, failure or out of say you, you loaded 10 records, eight are success, two are errors, so what are the errors like that with that details a log email will be sent on the user's mail id so as currently this data is loaded from an admin user called anya singh on that anya singh's email id you will get the acknowledgement email that is the way okay and it hardly should take a couple of minutes to process this file so demo underscore may 28 is the id that we have given so if we search this, see this, the record got immediately created as well. G1 as the first name that we have given. K is the last name. Demo underscore May 28 as a user ID. Analyst as a job title. XYZ at gmail.com as an email ID. Anya Singh as the reporting manager. So with all the details, whatever mini master data we have given, the user is already created in the system. This is the way. Okay. So which is all about two different places. One place to export the existing data file. Whatever number of records that are present in that, you add one more record anywhere in the file and upload that updated file in this place called import employee data. Import employee data is a place and that basic import is the category that you have to choose and you have to import this file. This is it. And you can also, the common question that comes up is, are we required to upload the entire file back into the system every time? Are we required to upload this entire file? It is already having 1400 users for just creating one user. Should I upload all these 1400 users, this entire file back into the system? Will that cake, so will that not create any duplicates? There's a couple of questions that we regularly face. The point is here, user ID is a primary key. It's a unique identifier. So with the same user ID, you upload 10 records also, it will create only once. It is not going to create any duplicates. First thing, there is no chance of duplicating. Next, how does the processing happen is, it will start processing record by record, employee ID 1000, 100009, like this. And when each record is being processed, it will check this ID number one is already in the database or not. If it's already in the database, it will, not create any new record. It will go for the next record. For this 10,000 as an ID, it will check whether there is any record. If that is also found, it is there. Then that also is not created. Like that, when it comes to this new user, demo underscore May 28, it understands that this ID is not present in the current database and this ID will be newly created. So wherever, where it is processing line by line, whenever it comes across the ID, which is not in the system, that ID gets created for the first time. Others which are already in the system, there is no chance of duplicating. Against this ID, if any changes are there, the changes can be updated. So against an existing ID 100009, if you updated an email address of this user, so this latest email address will be updated. So that, that, uh, that way of updating the existing data and creating new users, both will be taken care at a time. That is a way. So that is the first point that it will not create duplicates. Second, it's not mandatory to load the entire file every time also. So in the place where we downloaded this uh, export user file, that's where you clicked on this button called export user file and we downloaded the existing data. Instead of that, you have export template as a button, the first button. If you click on this export template as a button, system will download the file, which is not having any data it is only the file format that gets downloaded. It is only the file format with the column headers that gets downloaded. Whatever new users you want to add, you can add the rows. You want to load one user or five users, whatever, you add the required uh, uh, rows of data and you upload this file enough. So we have both the options 
either to import the entire file back into the system or to import only the uh, new records using this template, both the options are available. So here in this, the first button will give you only the import template without the existing data. The second one will give with the existing data, both are available. The reason why I, in the initial days, why I recommend to use this format in which there is existing data is, while you're adding a new record, if you already have a reference of the existing records, okay, so in status, what kind of input to be given, in gender, whether it should be given as male or female, with the text or with the quotes, okay, what are the mandatory columns, what are the standard strings as no underscore manager, no underscore HR, so these things, if you have a look at the existing data that gives you a more uh, uh, details about how to fill this file until you get used to this process. That's why I recommend in the initial days to follow the export user file with the existing data. Okay. Once you are comfortable, you got to know how to use this file format. Later, you go with the normal template without existing data also. It's fine. Okay. Just for the ease of the participants, I recommend to go with this option. End of the day, but for both the processes, it, it negligibly takes any time difference. Within two minutes, any file gets processed. Okay. So that is about this. So this is how we deal with the user creation. Either it can be integrated from the legacy system to the SF system or manual import You're using this format. You have the export user file to download the template, fill the data, and in this import employee data, you upload the file and create the users. That is the way. Next. For the users that are getting created in this manner, if we have to deal with the permissioning concept, how does the permissioning, so what all access they get once the user is created for them. So we can come up with the concept of role-based permissions. In success factors, the permissioning is completely dealt under a framework called role-based permissions, where everything is driven based on a role. So you as an employee, what access to you should have. You as a manager, what access you should have. You as a HR, what access you should have. It's all based on your role, employee, manager, HR, like this. The different roles is how the permissions are defined. Role-based permissions is what we call as a concept generally. And to deal with this concept, let me open one presentation that gives you an overview of the architecture of this component actually. So this is how the permissioning concept looks like in terms of its uh, architecture of it functions. It has two main things, roles and groups. Role, a role is the one that contains some set of permissions. Employee role with some set of permissions. Manager role, HR role. Like this, I can create different roles where every role is a bunch of permissions. And that role can be allocated to the groups. The yellow colored blocks that you see on both the sides are called the groups, group. Granted users group, target users group. That is, once I create a HR role, example, I create a HR role and I keep some permissions, the HR role is ready. Who whom I am I granting this role? That is a granted users. I can create a group of like 10 HRs or 20 HR somebody and I grant this role to that group, HR users as a group. That's granting. Then once these say 20 HRs have got this uh, role, the role is having the permissions to do promotions, to do terminations, to do salary increments. Okay, so different things this role is giving the permissions to. Once these 20 HRs have gained this role, on whom they can perform these permissions? I got a permission to uh, do promotion. For whom I can do promotion is the target population it is saying. I have a permission to terminate an employee. Which employee can terminate? Is a target population that has to tell me. Target users. So on the right hand side, we'll create one group called target users. Left hand side is a granted users for whom the role is being given. And right hand side is a target users such that these granted users can perform those permissions on the target users. That is whether I can uh, do the promotions or increments of uh, specifically India employees or specifically Australian employees like the country level target populations or department level, I can, uh, these HRs are given access to touch only the finance department employees or the IT department employees, like the department wise or location wise, country wise, however they way you want, you can keep your target population. Okay. So 
that is how a permissioning concept is every time dependent on two things roles and groups a role has a bunch of permissions and that role once created to whom you can assign is the granted group and on whom they can perform is the target group one role with two groups is what it functions every time and here so just to have a theoretical uh, uh, statements of it a role is the one that will define the access to data and the functionality a role is giving you an access to the data and functionality so you able to see the salary data is an access to data you able to perform increments salary increments is a functionality so seeing the salary data is one thing you having the capability of uh, performing salary corrections is a functionality so the access to the data and access to the functionality is what it is defined through a role okay and then we have groups so one is the granted users group on the left hand side as i just told so the people to whom you are uh, granting this role is called the granted users group and once they get the role on whom they perform that role are the target users that is a target users group two groups will be created most importantly groups are dynamic in nature the thing that uh, acts very smartly here is group population is dynamic that is say example i want to create a group called hrs i am not going to add the hrs one by one into the group automatically system will detect who are the hrs and it will have a, have the group consisting of all that hrs as one bundle from that existing hrs if there is one employee terminated automatically the group counts reduces or if there is one more employee joining in the company in the hr role automatically the group count increases so there is no manual intervention of maintenance of the groups required so that will be dynamic and how does how does it look like is what we will now practically configure and see so for this demonstration we take an example which is this one the one that you now see on my screen we have two blocks at the bottom the first block is what we will take as an example and we will configure guys where we will take up the hr role hr role is a role that we will create with some set of permissions in it and then we'll create two groups us hrs us employees so that i am going to grant that role hr role to the us hrs and that us hrs can perform that role on the us employees that way we will create one example a hr role with us hrs having their access on us employees and if you see the second block same hr role with the same permissions will be granted to german hr on german employees deu represents germany the country code deu represents germany so the same hr role with the same set of permissions is given to the german hrs and they can touch only the german employees like that only one common role but the people who are going to access it on on whom they can uh, utilize that permissions will be segregated so that the, the us hr can touch only us employees german hr can touch only german employees like that so this is the one that we will now start configuring where every time we have to start with configuring the groups then the role first step will be creating the groups second step is to create the roles third step is linking them okay so we'll start with creating the group called us hrs the local block that you see us hrs is what we are now going to first take up so let me get into the instance system you search with the keyword as groups just groups is what you give you get this option permission groups here manage permission groups okay this is the one that we have to access and when we visit this place manage permission groups here in this demo system i see there are already lot of groups that are listed here but this is being a existing system which is already set up with lot of things that's why you are having these groups but in a real time when you go to a fresh implementation a new project you find nothing it will be a blank page that you have to start creating your groups there is nothing like standard groups standard roles nothing given we only have to initiate it so here this is how the permission groups page looks like and you have to initiate by clicking on create new you have a create new button click on it a pop up comes where you have to fill the details starting with the group name 
it's a granting group i just give you the keyword as grant us hrs the today's date may 28th so this is how the group is what i'm creating granting group us hrs may 28th is a name and now as i told i'm not going to add the people into this into this group one by one okay i'm not going to add the people one by one this is a system which is already with 1400 users okay so in the, in this we have uh, in this 1400 we have us employees uh, canada employees australia india different country test data sf has given in this so from treat this as an excel sheet of 1400 users if i ask you to filter the usa employees you choose on the country as a filter or a company as a filter us company as a filter Similarly, if I ask you to filter the uh, HR, HR employees on the department as a filter, you will choose the HR employees. That way, similar way, here we have to make use of filters. Here these you have a PK category. All these are the different filters that we have. Here it is, the list of the different filters that we have. So on the department of the employee, the gender of the employee, you have the hire date. Like this on various parameters, we can set the filters. So based on that filters from the existing active database of around 1400 plus users, system will fetch us the data what we require automatically without we entering them manually. Okay, so for that, the recommended uh, options, what I generally every time prefer and recommend us, we have some set of information fields called job information fields. Job information fields that will define your uh, which company are working, which business unit in that company are working, in which department, like this, in which location and all. Your job details is what it is defining. So using this, we can easily find out the required employees. So if I need the employees who are working for US, I need, as our current requirement is US HRs, first is from this 1400 people, I need to filter the US in that HR employees. So first is, People who are working for a US company, so that is say Coca-Cola India, Coca-Cola US, the way you have. So people who are working for a company that belongs to a country as US, this is a parameter we can use. Job information, company, country. So they're working for a company that belongs to a country is my parameter. So I'll give the country as United States. This is a way. So once I give this input as United States, on the right hand top, you have active group membership. You click on update. It brings 397 people. Say this. Out of 1400 plus active users in the system, 397 users are working for US, a US company. That is what the parameter is here. Company is country. So it, this company belongs to a US country, kind of. That is the parameter. So people who are working for a US business are 397. But I don't, don't want all the US employees. I need HR in particular. So add one more category. In that, let us use a filter called department. We have a filter called job information department name. In that department name, I'll give, use this human resources. If we have multiple human resource departments. In that particularly, US human resources department, human resources US that way so that is the name of the department so from 397 one more parameter is added now when i click on update on the right hand top system will again narrow it down to 19 users from 1400 total employees us specific are 397 in that people working for uh, hr department are only 19 so out of 397 us employees i'm having i'm having 19 HR employees working who are working for the department of HR. This way, it is narrowed down to 19 users, guys. And when you click on this 19 as a number, system will give you a pop-up with the list of those names, who are those people, their names, with what job they are working, in which location they are working. You have all these details in the pop-up that comes in. Where we did not add them one by one into this group manually, so system has automatically filtered from the existing entire uh, list of uh, users that are present who will match this parameter. Working for US company in the US uh, HR department are 19 people, okay? How you would like to use these filters is totally your choice. So we have uh, 
no specific recommendation here. It's, it's we have different filters. You want to go with uh, country and the department, or you want to go directly with department. Okay, it's your choice. So here, if I don't use this US country directly department, also it, it brings almost the same result because people working for exactly HR department of US, it will be the same one. It is our choice the way we fill it to be more optimized with the filtered results. Yeah, okay. And once you add your filters and got the group of 19 users, click on done at the bottom. And the group, which is in the name of USHR's May 19th is sorry, May 28th, 28th is got created. The latest one will appear on the top here like this, which is a group of 19 users. Now, in the US company, in, the, in, that, in that business of US, if there is one more employee who has joined the HR department, automatically the group count goes to 20 guys. So you need not, uh, I, I come and add here uh, the name manually. So automatically the group count increases to 20. Or in this existing 19 users, if anybody got terminated, resigned anything, automatically the group count reduces to 18 as well. So that this is the dynamic nature that I told. You define the, you define the process, how the people to be pulled into this group. Once you define this, as per these parameters, if there is new employee found in the system with the same US country and uh, uh, HR department of US, they're working, automatically the group counts increases or decreases based on people entering and exiting the company. Okay, that's the dynamic thing. And let us create the second group. As per our example, we need one group for US HRs. That group is now completed, US HRs as a group. Next is US employees as another group that we have to create. That is the target users group. So let's go for this group creation in the same tool called manage permission groups. Now we shall go for create new and give the name as target US employees May 28th. That's the name. Done. Now, if I need to fetch the US employees into this group, what is the filter that you guys can recommend me? <coughs> Anybody? I want to get the US employees. Very good. So we can definitely go for the company country. And here, USA is a country that I can give, United States. And now, if we click on the update button on the right hand top, update group membership. So it's bringing me 397 US employees. This is how the simply the second group is created. US employees 397 with the people who are working for the US business. Straight forward. Done. But let us uh, complicate this requirement. If a client says in the target population, I want the US employees excluding the HRs. That is, a HR person should not get the access on uh, uh, <coughs> his own department employees. So. A USA HR should not get an access on his own department employees. So he can uh, do the promotions, transfers, terminations, anything on the IT department, finance department, sales department, other department employees, but not on their own department employees. I want to exclude the HRs from the total US employees. That is, we have 19 HRs we already understood. So from this 397, that 19 HRs have to be excluded. That is the way. So in the group that we are creating, here we are using this option to include the people into the group. Include people into the group is what we are doing using these filters. So US as a filter, 397 people got into the group. From this 397, if I have to exclude those HRs at the bottom, if you scroll down, you also have an excluding area. The same filters will be available to even to for the exclusion also. Here I'll use this department name as a filter where those people who work for human resources department of us so these are the people who may want to exclude as we know there are 19 people who are working for human resources us as a department from 397 we we exclude those 19 the remaining count is 378 this is updated count so that is in a company of 397 us employees 19 are hrs and the rest is 378. So these 19 HRs are getting the access on the rest of the 378 employees to deal with their profiles, to update their salaries, to do the promotions, terminations, anything kind of. That is the way.
So this is just to add something more real time scenario. I have given you this. Excluding logic also will be required in the real time cases. Now they don't want to exclude the entire HR department. They want to exclude any couple of users. Okay, any couple of users, any specific names the company says that. So I do, I'm not asking you to exclude the entire department of HR. Only one or two names I give you, you exclude those names. That is also possible. So here we have a, we have to add one more category here. And here in the category of different filters, if you go to the extreme bottom, you have an option to add the user or username kind of options where you can exclude by user and you can start typing their names. So if you want to exclude say, a user called Anya Singh, just start typing their name and add. You want to add exclude one more user? You want to exclude a person called Sydney Battle. Just like this, you just start typing their names and you can add exclusively the required users whom you want as well. So we have an option to go on these parameter names like department name, location name, country name kind of you can or exclusively exactly the particular person name also you can give an exclude as well. We have both the options. That is the way and now clicking on done. So the second group which is a non-HR US employees with around 378 people that group is also ready. So both our groups are ready now. That is the way. And as for the process, once the groups are ready, the next thing is we can concentrate on the role creation. As per this example, we have to work on creation of a HR role. A HR role. And for that, get into the system again. And last time as we searched with the keyword as uh, permission, sorry, we searched with the keyword as group. And we got this permission groups as an option in this list. Here, we got permission groups. Similarly, if you search for roles, we'll also get permission roles as an option. This one, manage permission roles. And here in this as well, again, you see some list of different roles that are present, which is again, purely because this is a system that is already being set up with some data and all. But in a real time system, when you go for a new project, there will be nothing when you are configuring and setting or setting up a new project completely blank. So you don't have any roles listed. Nothing will be standard delivered. Any basic role or uh, admin role or anything, we only have to configure. So here we have to click on the create new button and initiate the role creation where a role is basically consisting of three parts, guys, three basic parts. The first part is about naming the role, giving a name and description of the role. I just create it as HR role. May 28th as a role name and some description which is optional. Then we have the permission settings where the main part exists. That is when you click on this permission button in this, now we can set up what all permissions that this role should be granted with. When I click on it, a pop-up comes in which you have all the permissions classified into two categories, user permissions and admin permissions. User side of the permissions and admin side of the permissions, two permissions it is classified ways. So the permissions which are required for the end users to use the system or the user side and the permissions that are required for the consultants to perform the configurations are the admin side of the permissions. And even uh, for HR administrators to carry out some functionalities in the system also, admin permissions. Admin permission is of, uh, required in two places to do the configurations and to perform some admin level activities like HR people, they'll have the admin permissions. User permissions are the end users for their normal day-to-day -day transactions, whatever they want. That is the user permissions. Okay. So now uh, if I want to give a role, if I want to create a role called CEO role, CEO, okay. If I have to create a CEO role. Will I choose the permissions on user side or admin side guys? A general employee in a company, a reporting manager, a HR, HOD, directors, CEO, anybody, they are the end, end of the day, they are the end users in the system. That's it. They are not going to work on any configurations. Okay. So it is the user permissions is the side where we work on admin permissions. Most of the time, we give it to the consultants. Okay. So now, if you open one of the category user permissions, the permissions are well segregated module wise like time management permissions, goals, performance, career development planning, 
like this succession planning module wise the permissions are segregated and here in each category that you go you have several check boxes of permissions okay so several different check boxes you have so you should first understand what permission you have, you have to give so if i am going to give this manage team goals as a check box that means i am giving the hr to work on the team goals in the in the system okay so what what is this team goals at this point we have no idea so our concentration here is not to go into the understanding of each and every permission we are only concentrating on the steps involved in the permissioning process the steps involved in the permissioning process how to create groups how to create roles how to connect them okay all that is a process later on when we discuss the modules when we are discussing ec module ec specific what are the different permissions we have what are the different check boxes their meanings we will discuss similarly when we are discussing pmgm module we'll again come here in this goals what does each of these check boxes mean so the, if I give this checkbox, what does that uh, that actually mean on the front end? We will discuss in detail at a later point. As of now, I am giving full access on the goals, full access on the performance, and on employee central, one of the employee central category also, I am trying to give the full access. I am selecting all the checkboxes like this. So this is how, this is how I just created a rule, a HR, a HR role with access on goals, performance, and a little bit area of the employee central. Employee central has a lot of other areas. One of the area of employee central, I've given the access, full access. And clicking on done. So now the role is initiated with the name, some permissions in it. What all permissions you selected internally, the names of all that will be listed here. The list of all the checkboxes that are selected are shown here. And once all that list is done, at the bottom, you will have the third area which is granting of this role. The role is now created with some checkbox list of permissions, what I wish to grant through this role. And finally, now role is ready with the permissions. And now it is time to grant this role to the relevant group in the company. So where I already created a group called US HR group, to that group I want to grant it. So for that granting part, here you can click on the add button at the bottom in the third section. When you click on this add, System will give you a pop up where it is going to ask you the granting population and the target population both. So, granting is to whom you are going to grant. You click on the select button on the right hand side, click on the select. System gives you a pop up with the list of all the groups. Here, you can search for the groups that you created with today's date. So, two groups we created granting group and target group. So, granting USHRs May 28th is a group that I am selecting. So, in this group, there are 19 HRs. To all that 19 HRs, this role is being granted. Once they get these permissions through this role, on whom they can perform is the target population, where I can select this last checkbox. The select button is activated here. When I click on select, again the groups will be listed. Again, search for this May 28th. The target US population is the non HR US employees, what we created around 378 on them, those 19 HRs are going to use the permissions. So this is a granting group and this is a target group that we have here like this. That is the way we link the role with the groups that are already created in the first step. We click on done. So that is the assignment is also made. That is active. You see the active assignment is also made. And then finally, just click on save on the bottom. <coughs> That's basically consisting of uh, three important parts. The first thing is to have your uh, name of the role given. Let's click on the button where it gives you the classification of user and admin side of the permissions. So if the HR role is a user role, in that, which modules level, what permissions access you want, you have given all that. And then finally, you are able to go for the granting part. So here it is. The granting part is here where you can click on add button and choose the granting population and the target population to whom you are going to give it. In the process of granting these guys, we also have a default option called everyone. Say example in this company, the company decided that the HRs in US should have the global access. The HRs in US can touch the Indian employee, Australian employee, any country employee. Then I can keep it as everyone. So target population is everyone, a default one. You need not even create a group system will automatically give the full access. It's a blanket access. 
or else particularly a target population then you should click on the second radio button and choose the last checkbox where it will give you an option to choose your own groups what you created that way okay so once we save this go to the bottom save this so the role creation along with linking of the role with the groups both are both are done at a time that is this role hr role may 28th is done that's how this activity of setting up this permission like the role with the groups and connecting them is all done okay these are the sequence of steps that are involved in the process of setting up the permissions in the success factors system okay so one more thing i want to cover up here is you see now in the target group we excluded the hrs already okay hrs who are getting the permissions we excluded them on the target group so that they don't get the access to their own department people that means if i am a person from hr department i cannot touch any other employee any other hr employee record and even my own record also i can't touch because i am also from hr department i can't touch my own record i can't do my own promotions my own salary increments anything so that is taken care but if this requirement is not there if client did not give us this condition that hr should not uh, touch their own uh, department employees if we did not have that condition so we would have not excluded the hr department employees then the 19 hrs would have got the access on all the us employees 397 us employees where he or himself he or she is also part of that group if i am if i am a hr i am also part of the target group of us employees and i can touch my own record that would have happened so to avoid such things sf has given one checkbox called exclude granted users from having permission access to themselves so by any chance if the person who has got the access to do something if he has got the access on his own record also but if we want to avoid that we can use this checkbox as a precautionary thing so that he will not able to change his own data his own salary his own promotions his own terminations anything he will not be able to do so this checkbox will save them exclude granted users from having permission access to themselves so that is the way we deal with granted users having access this is one checkbox then and all these steps whatever i am showing guys so the, all the steps what we are looking at like creation of the groups whatever we are doing so how are we navigating to it so the navigating with the deep links and all is an old fashion now we have the top search area where you can directly give the keyword so the target places say manage permission groups is where you have to go just give that keyword as permission groups it will show you the option and you can navigate so in this current screenshot it is giving you some path and all so that's a old fashion just forget about it once you come to the place click on the create new button and then system gives you a pop up to enter the name of the group and at the bottom you have the filters to include the people exclude the people all that using different filters you can uh, choose the people into the group and then once both the groups are created for the same example the step by step document is prepared second step is to create the roles so out of three three steps creation of groups roles and uh, granting the roles first step of groups creation is done now we are in the role creation so for that role creation again where do you navigate once you go there click on the create new button and then it gives you a place of three three sections first thing is to enter the create create the role name click on the permission button to give the check boxes what are required and the granting part everything is here so when you click on the permission button user side admin side permissions with what all check boxes you want to select and all and finally linking that role to the group that's where the granting part and you click on that grant uh, under the third section called grant this role to and we click on the add button system is going to give you this pop up where on the top you can choose the granting group and at the bottom you can go the target group and you can finish this activity of linking so that's how the step by step each and everything what we have just now seen is also present in this document and this document will be made available for you to even look at the context how can this be done and uh, slowly uh, we have started releasing the system access guys so whoever has made their payments and all you will start getting the access by max latest by monday or tuesday you will have your access so this is the way
And here in this permissioning and the granting part, one more point I want to highlight is now we created groups, HR group, employee group, all them. If say example, this permissions, whatever we are giving is to be given to all the HRs. It's not specifically to US HRs or uh, uh, Indian HRs, nothing. To all the HRs, you're going to give it a commonly. Then here we have the, the first drop down as permission group. You click on it. Here you have some default groups, guys. Managers, matrix managers, HR managers like this. If I choose HR managers as a default group name that is present here, you need not create any group at all. All HR managers in the company will be automatically taken by the system. It, it might be India, US, Australia, any country, HRs will automatically be detected by the system. How will system know who are all HRs in the system without we giving any parameters, anything is. So when you're when you're hiring an employee, you're tagging the employee's manager, employee's HR. So whoever is tagged as a HR, system will bring them into this group automatically. Say example, I am hired. For me, Mr. Alex is maintained as a HR. That means system understands that Alex is performing the role of HR in the company and automatically system will take Alex into this group. That way. Similarly, managers as a group we have. All managers. So whoever is having at least one subordinate under him, he is treated as a manager and all the people across the countries who is having a subordinate will be having will be part of this universal group called managers. Or you want to give some, some permissions to all the employees in the company, you have everyone, everyone, all employees in the company. Like this, this is a one default group. So this way also we can make use of the standard groups where managers, matrix managers, HRs, employees kind of standard groupings you have, or you can create your own groups with the required parameters of country, location, department, any filters that you want, you can do that as well. So this is all around the concept of permissioning where we focused on the steps involved in the process of setting up the permissions, but not the meaning of the actual checkboxes what we selected. So that discussion will again resume one more time when we discuss the modules exactly. Standard, standard rules will every time available. It's not that uh, something you have to do by the default, by the day one itself, you will have these uh, groups listed like this. It will be standard default available. Great. So that's the second agenda item, permissioning thing. And uh, next thing we shall be looking at is uh, on the email templates. So with the success factor system, the way we can deal with the different email templates is what we look at. The next topic will be on the email templates. So across the success factors modules, it might be employees in general recruitment, any module. So there will be definitely different places where the emails will be expected to be triggered. So for various transactions that we are performing or employee initiating the things in a lot of places, a lot of email communications are required, something to the employees, something to the managers, HRs, like that. The basic example, you take a leave request, a very common scenario. So when you as an employee apply a leave, your, the person who is nominated as an approver for that leave should be notified about that leave request got triggered from this employee. That is one notification. And if that manager did not respond even for weekdays or 10 days kind of, we can have some uh, uh, set up for reminders that can be sent. So reminder email templates. And if the workflow is approved, the person who actually raised the request, the employee should be getting a confirmation that the request is approved or it is if it is declined or the, uh, that it is got declined. So like this, different sort of communication should be triggered from the system. So regarding the transactions that are being performed. So leave is one basic example, which is having around four to five different emails that are required. So initially to, to intimate the approver, later to remind the approver, Next, uh, to inform back the employee that it is approved or rejected, like this, different uh, emails for one scenario. So for a cross success factor system, you'll have different scenarios where emails will be expected across modules. And for all that emails, what is the subject of the email? What is the body of the email that is going to be triggered is standard delivered by SAP. With an option for the client to update it. The standard subject and standard body of the email is default given. And if we want to update, we can change the content of it. And all that will be administered under a place called. You search with this keyword as e mail, you get this option called email notification template settings. 
So if we go for that, in here in this tool, you will be able to find almost 150 plus email templates. On the left hand side, you have the list of them. These are all the templates that are available that will be used across uh, the entire 11 modules. They are around 150 plus email templates where SF has maximum covered all the possible situations where an email update will be expected. So you will not have a situation that here an email is expected, but it is not stand available kind of, you'll never come across a scenario. SF has covered all the possible situations where a mail communication will be expected. So these are the almost 150 plus different email templates. What config access we have here is right from activating and deactivating them. That is say example, uh, here on the left hand side, you see, we have a notification for goal creation notification. Goal creation, that is in the performance management module. If there is a goal that was assigned to you from your manager or from your HR or HOD, somebody has created a goal for you, you should be knowing that. If you are not intimated about it, you don't know that there was a goal assigned to you and you never look at it or you never work for it. So you should be notified via email that there is a no, no new goal created for you. So this is an email template where client says they don't want it. We can deactivate the checkbox. We have to select and deselect the checkboxes where the emails would be required or not required. If I deactivate this checkbox, then that means whenever there is a new goal created, there is no email communication to the user that way. So this is something we go through this list of email templates in front of a customer. So around 15, 20 minutes, we go to go the, go down through the list in front of them and we take their inputs and accordingly activate, deactivate the required templates. What are required, what are not required. We can enable, disable. Most of the time we prefer to enable everything. But if a client says that particularly, no, this will create a lot of unwanted emails in a company and they ask us to remove, then only we deactivate. Mostly we even recommend the client to enable everything possible. That is a way. And now when I, uh, when I use this email template, the goal creation notification, what is the subject of this email body of the email that gets triggered is when I click on that link, and I click on this hyperlink on the left hand side, goal creation notification. On the right hand side of the page, system will give you the detail about that template. So when will this be triggered? So this notification will be sent to the user when a goal was created for him or her. Anybody creates, it goes to the target person and the subject of the email is standard one. Objective creation notice from performance manager is a standard text. If you want, you can update the subject. Similar way you can update the body of the email, all that. And if you want to set some high priority indicator, if that email has to land in your mailbox with a high priority indicator, you can select this checkbox, which comes up with some exclamation uh, uh, mark in the email, as you already have in the Outlook kind of, this is the one. And this text, what you're seeing the subject and the body, not only in English, you can also update in several languages here. You have the option to choose the Arabic, English, Spanish, multiple languages. In whichever language you want to update the content translation, you can also do that. That is the way. So you can make the necessary changes in the content and click on save changes. This is the way we have an option. But generally, when you discuss this topic with your client, the common thing that happens is they say that we let us review each and every template. So they will be eager to review each and every template subject and they say that we will make the modifications as per our needs and all. But once they look at this count of 150, 90%, they say that, okay, let us go with the standard templates. If any, once we started using, if we feel this template text is not good, we will modify only that. So let's not go into each and everything. This is how it happens in a realistic way. So. We have an option, so either the client can themselves update it or we, they can ask us to make the changes, whichever the way they want. And here, signature. In every email, we have signature as a token, a standard token, such, such that at the end of your body of the email, so we can have some signatures uh, stating that this is an email that is triggered from the HR department, kind of, you can have some context set. So what should be triggered in the signature? is also one of the template that is available on the left hand side. So if you search with the keyword as signature, here it is. 
email signature as a uh, one of the template. When you click on it, on the right hand side of the page, the standard signature text, what SF has by default is appearing. That's something that will be definitely be required to be overrided. So what the companies generally ask us to do is replace it with something like regards. Success factors team, HR operations like this. This kind of a text is what generally the client will expect us to replace it with. And this is what it will be triggered in every standard email that is being triggered from success factors, saying that this is an email from the SF side under the HR department of Coca-Cola. That way. Okay. So we can make these kind of changes. So these are the options that we see here in this email notification templates as a tool where first thing is to activate deactivate the templates what are required what are not required and then if you if you want to update that context of it the subject and body of the emails along with the translations and all you can deal with you can set the high priority indicators all these are possible on top of it if we have a situation or a need to create new templates still customer has come up with a scenario of a new first uh, new point where the one more additional template is required SF has not given it standard delivered if we want to deal with yes we have it possible in two of the modules in EC and recruitment only only in the employee central module in the recruitment module they have given that option but in the rest of the talent modules we have no option of any additional templates SF has almost covered all the required scenarios so how we create new additional email templates in the module of employee central and the other ways wherever we come into that modules down the line i'll also explain on creation of new templates as well so whatever updates that we are making here it might be the email signature content or every email related body email whatever we are updating so that is going to be applicable for entire organization guys so this is not specific to any particular target group kind of that's a unique text that you have across the companies across the uh, organization it might be us employees india employees canada employees everywhere it is common maximum translation is what you can uh, deal with so for middle east employees it should trigger in arabic content like that translation you can handle but the content is all the same so next thing we'll be starting with is the module of employee central guys so that is first we'll have one prerequisite topic that we have to initiate on the employee central discussion and then we'll get into the employee central structure followed by the employee central configurations that's in a sequence we'll initiate it so as a fresh topic we'll start it from next saturday on the employee central module discussions so these are a few areas on the mastery part and before we even get into the next week employee central sessions i want to highlight a couple of things one more time or the point is on the right hand top you have this proxy proxy as a functionality when you click on your uh, photograph you have the proxy so this is an option where whenever you click on it you will be able to get into the others profile okay so example i am in currently anya singh's login if i want to go into the login of alex without his id and password just by selecting his name as alex and i say okay system will be showing me the profile of alex now it gets reloaded now the screen gets reloaded and it shows me the LX login. Now on the right hand top corner, you see the photograph also displays the LX photograph. LX and here when I go into the profile, employee file, it shows me LX profile with his photograph, his name and all that. That means I am in the login of LX. So this proxy is a feature that will allow you to get into anybody's login without their ID password and perform the activities on their behalf that way and this is very sensitive feature then this will be restricted only to the administrators and we have a <clears throat> permission for this in the role based permissions that we saw in the admin side of the permissions you have a checkbox so who can have this for proxy functionality a general user a general end user will not see this proxy we as a consultants and the nominated super administrators in the company only will have the proxy feature a very powerful feature that will easily help you to get into anybody login and get the things done but to be used very carefully so where for us as a consultants it is very useful for us it will save us a lot of time say example you want to configure a scenario and test it like uh, 
the scenario of uh, uh, what do you say workflow say there is a leave request scenario that you want to test where whenever employee applies a leave it first go to the head of the department from there it goes to the hr like this you need a workflow to be tested so first you into your into the employee login you place a request then you have to log out again log in back as hod you have to approve that again log out and log in back as hr multiple logouts and logins so to avoid that using this proxy you can quickly switch between the accounts that will save us a lot of time during the testing process so this is a very important tool for us and i will make sure this is activated for all of you guys in the system access group that is going to be provided for you so you can also switch between the users okay and in the system that is being given you as i've been telling already you will have a lot of test data almost around 1400 users you will have if you just search with any english names so david william john different english names you search you will have lot of test data of users that will be present so you can navigate through them have a look at how the profile is maintained what all sections of information is being maintained so get used to the system so having the system access is not only about configuring and practicing guys that is secondary first to navigate and understand the system what are standard available what kind of data we can maintain in success factors at an employee level so getting used to that is also very important the more time you spend on the system where at least out of 80 questions in the certification exam in any module exam 80 questions minimum 10% like around 8 questions minimum you can just answer by your experience on navigating the system okay technical knowledge is second 10% is something you can easily answer just because of your navigational knowledge and the time that you spend on the system whenever you go to somebody's login so now again one more time i'll go for alex login so when i entered into the target employee alex login and i perform some activity from his login and when i want to come back the same right hand top i can click on become self and i'll come back to my own login if i click on self it brings me back to anya singh's login that way this is the way it is so there's one more feature that now this is a universal proxy the enabling that proxy permission is giving you full permission where i can proxy into anybody's account a ceo in the company or a peon in the company i can get into anybody's profile but if you want to give a proxy to a person on a target person for so example i want to give a proxy right for employee a on employee b this employee a can access the employee's b profile only that's it no not more than that okay so this is a realistic scenario that you will face in the real time sometimes uh, there is a situation that there is one of the member of the team he is on a business travel he is on a business travel is in the client place or he is on a health condition is not good he is hospitalized anything where the manager wants to have the access on the subordinates profile there is something that has to be closed from the subordinates profile the reporting manager need the access on the subordinates uh, login okay so they they approach the administrator saying that i need this so in that case admin can grant the proxy right for the manager on that particular subordinate users profile only proxy access how how is that possible is if you search with the keyword as proxy you get this proxy management as an option on the top search area so when we go for this proxy management so this is a place where we can deal with some proxy functionalities where this is a making assignments you can make the assignment so that you can just mention who will act as proxy that is say example anya singh has to act as proxy just an example as a admin he she she is a manager on which account she will act as a proxy that is a subordinate account say if alex is a subordinate search for alex that's it the combination is what i give this way who is going to act as proxy on whom they are going to access a proxy individual access is what we make and again you also have an option of choosing whether you want to give the full proxy on the entire login or in the target person's login you want to give access to only the you know what do you say the recruitment module or only the goals related tab or only the what do you say the performance tab like that any selective target places even once say proxy into other user i can't access his entire profile only the selected areas i can access kind of we can also give that so this is also a good option but maximum we avoid it in the real time 
giving this proxy access to the end user mostly companies 99% companies avoid it okay so i never see any customer using this feature also tau we have it because any small mistake can create a lot of mess in the company where that that because it's all related to the production data it's all relevant to the user's profile their uh, personal informations might be exposed somewhere or anything salary data might be by mistake exposed anything can happen so maximum they avoid it now we have a functionality and i'm introducing you but this is avoided this is every time restricted the admin level and the consultant team level only okay that is a way we can give the combination of which person should get the access on whose profile with what target restricted access we can choose along with the timings also so in this particular date from this particular time till this particular date till this particular time i can give it say couple of hours only i want to give it or couple of days i want to give it anything i can use the date and time and i can give the time time based restrictive access as well after that time it gets automatically disabled the proxy feature will no, no longer be available and we are clear with the basics to start with a module so generally whenever we start with any particular module we should be clear with the basics of uh, the platform the basics of this tool the systems involved then uh, the navigations involved all that so that's my attempt uh, in these sessions till now thank you one and all hello everyone i wanted to provide a brief overview on zarentix training program for sap success factor employee central and performance management and goal management this comprehensive course covers key concepts and tools to centralize and optimize employee performance across your organization over the past few years hundreds of hr professionals and managers have leveraged zarentex success factor training to improve performance evaluation align employee goals and advance their careers after completing the course many have shared their success stories on zarentex testimonial platform so in just few weeks you can learn how to configure and roll out success factor performance reviews capture employee achievements provide ongoing feedback and automate talent development plans this can open doors to new hr opportunities to help you get more value from success factors at your company if you want to learn more about managing and motivating your workforce with success factors employee central and pngm visit the link below for detailed course information from zarentech getting started now with the training is a smart investment for anyone looking to expand their expertise in this cutting edge sap solutions we'll start with having an understanding of the employee central structure and there are some data models a concept called data models so what is that data models concept in the ec structure how they look like what we do with that all that oriented discussion is what we'll initiate okay so in that context let me start with the ec structure but to get started with the employee central structure guys so as you see on my screen currently we have uh, the center part the part which is highlighted in the center of the page with a, cyl a cylindrical model with the blue color and the yellow color so this is the ec structure the main ec structure that we have to decide that that we have to discuss where employee central structure is of two parts where the blue color area on the top is referred as uh, hr data and the yellow color part at the bottom is referred as the foundation data where hr data is nothing but human resource data where uh, when you say a human resource it's nothing but the employees in a company so employee data is the first part and the second part is the foundation tables it is mentioned you can also refer it as foundation data that is nothing but the company specific data employee data and the company data that way you have you, you can divide it the first part is employee data the second part is company data when i say company's data it's nothing but uh, the different uh, masters of the company like list of uh, the departments in the company list of locations in the company the list of different grades the company follows like a1 a2 a3 b1 b2 b3 whatever the gradings the grading system that the company follows the different jobs the company has manager as a job uh, 
analyst as a job, director as a job, so like this, everything, all the list of jobs. So all that masters will be part of the foundation data, the second part. So the employee data and the foundation data, that way we have the employee's rental structure first level classified. When it comes to HR data, which is the employee data, that is again classified into two other parts called the personal and the employment information, guys. HR data, which is the employee data, is again classified as personal and employment. That is, every employee will have some information that is personal to him that doesn't change based on the employer. So I, I join company A or I join company B, whatever. It's few details like my address details, my contact details, my dependent details, okay, or even the national IDs, the national ID that you have in your country. These doesn't change based on your employer. Any company you go, these are the same. But that is called the personal information. But when it comes to employment information, that is employer specific. Employment information like your designation in the company, your grade in the company, your reporting manager, okay, your location where you work, your uh, the branch reporting location kind of, and various other salary details in the company, all that will differ company to company. So that is all the employment information, which is dependent on the employer. So the personal information and the employment information, this way we have the employee data classified into two parts, personal and employment. And to have a look at the examples of that, let me show you some examples. So as you see on this slide here, we have uh, two blocks, which is on the left hand side, the examples of employment information, and on the right hand side, the examples of the personal information. So on the personal information side, if you have a look at, we have the address details. The first block say talks about the address uh, details, which is the employees different addresses like uh, their uh, uh, permanent address, temporary address, whatever the addresses they maintain. Then we have the national ID, the third one, where national ID is all about your, uh, like in India, you have Aadhaar number, PAN number. In US, you have social security numbers like that, those national IDs contact details. So these are the various examples of employee data, which is personal to the employee, which doesn't change based on your employer. But on the left hand side, the blocks, whatever you see, these are all the employment information, which will change based on the employer. Like the first thing, if you see job information, the first thing job information is the one that will talk about which department you're working, which location you're working, who is your manager, what is your grade, all these kinds of stuff are under the job information. Similarly, the fourth one you see compensation information, which is salary information. So salary information is also something that will definitely change organization to organization. So what uh, uh, components that they give give to you, the amount, like the, the basic pay what uh, company A gives you or the basic pay what company B gives you, the medical benefits that they, they give you, the allowances that they give you, definitely will change employer to employer. So that is the compensation information. So this way, we have the entire employee data classified into personal and employment. And these are the respective few examples of each category. And end of the day, all this information is present in all this employee information. Where does uh, this be available, guys? Can anyone tell me if this is all the employee information present in employee central? Okay, of course, employee central is a module, I agree. So my question is relevant to the screen. So whenever we log into the success factors instance, coming into this uh, employee uh, login, and when we navigate into the employee files here, so this will take us to the profile page. So in this profile, we have all these different sections of employee information, personal information, employment, compensation, all this. So the headings that you see on the top of the screen, these are all the sections. Say example, you have personal information. On the personal information, here you have the different subsections, personal, ID, biographical, contact, all these are the different uh, subsections we see. All these are subsections, guys. And when I click on contact information as a subsection, see, then here we have the blocks in the name of, say, primary emergency contact, contact information and all. These are called as uh, the portlets, the terminology is portlet. Section 
under the section multiple subsections in a, against the subsection you have the portlets in which you finally have the data so portlets are those that are hosting the data sections and subsections are just classifying the screen into different parts so in terms of the terminologies to make it more clear for you i have some terminologies listed this is the one section subsection and portlet these are the three things where portlets are the ones that are going to have the data in it. So this is a spelling of portlet, P-O-R-T-L-E-T. -E okay. So I, Rick, I intentionally write down these things. So if you look at the words, you will more memorize it instead of I just say it orally. If I show you the uh, spellings of it, you will be more uh, uh, memorizing it. That's the reason I maintain the sticky notes and show you in this way. So this is about section, subsections and portlets and portlets host the data finally. Now, in the employee central structure, as an example of the first part, under employment information, under the personal information, when I say all these examples, each and every blue color block that you see here as an example is end of the day representing one portlet, guys. Address information portlet, contact information portlet, national ID portlet, like that. Everything is a portlet with, with some data on the front end. So that summarizes that. You call it as employment information, you call it as a personal information, whatever. End of the day, every information of an employee is present on the people profile in the form of different portlets. That's it. Okay. So that is about the first part of the EC structure, which is this blue color area, HR data card. When it comes to the second part, when I say it is about the company's data, the foundation data or the foundation tables, so the, the reason why SF is referring it as foundation tables is, so in, in the second part, what you have are all the master tables, like department as a table with a list of all the departments, a location as a table with the list of all the locations of the company, grades as a table with the list of grades like that. So the second part is all about the master list of the tables. Okay. So the entire company's data is again classified into three parts, organizational, job and payment related org structure pay structure and job structure is what we say the entire company's data so what do you have in each of each of them is so these are the examples guys org structure pay structure and job structure these are the three different examples of it where under each of them you have uh, the respective objects so under organizational structure so if you have to set up the org structure of a company not only in success factors, any HR product, it's obvious that we have to uh, set up the org structure. So let me show you. So this is how an organizational structure can be expected. So with the different uh, layers of the company, like legal entity is the top layer. Legal entity is nothing but the company. So under a company, they have their different lines of business. Okay, they are into manufacturing business, they are into IT services business, they are into construction business, whatever. So you have the different lines of business. That's what we call them as business units. In the business units, you have something called divisions. Divisions, under the divisions, finally, you have the departments. So this is the way how the org structure uh, layering will be expected. Okay, so all these items, what you see as a part of the organizational structure, are present as examples in the other slide where we call as org structure related examples, legal entity, business unit, division, department, and even the location at the bottom. All these are the examples of the org structures. So when I say examples, you can treat each of them as a table. So department as a table with the list of departments, a location as a table with the list of all the locations of this company, where, where all in which all locations this company operates kind of. Similarly, as a part of the pay structure, so you have a lot of pay related things. So example, you have pay grades, the third one. It's a list of all the grades that you can maintain in that pay grade. Grade one, grade two, grade three, or A1, A2, A3, whatever you call. Next, pay components, the fourth one on the screen. Pay components is all about the salary components, guys. So like you have basic pay, you have HRA, elevances, bonuses, whatever, the pay components. So that is the whatever salary components here in SF we refer them as pay components. Similarly, we have frequencies. That's the pay frequency. So when I say uh, your basic pay is fifty thousand, so is that fifty thousand of basic pay per month or per week or per biweekly or it is per year? 
So that's a frequency that you can maintain whenever you're maintaining the employee salary data, weekly, monthly, bi-weekly, annual, like that, the different frequencies we can. So these are all the pay related uh, masters that you can create. And in the third category called job structures, you have a couple of things that are related to job, which is the job classification and the job functions. But job function is not uh, much in use. Job classification is only in use. Where job classifications are nothing but the list of jobs that we have in a company, guys. Job, uh, job, the job classification is nothing but the list of jobs. Like uh, you have manager as a job, analyst as a job, consultant as a job. Okay, all these are the jobs. So on top of these jobs, later on, we'll build the positions in the company. Like if you say manager is a job, sales manager, HR manager, finance manager, all that are the positions. On top of the job, you will maintain the positions tomorrow. Okay. So that way you have job classifications on top of which tomorrow the positions can be built and jobs are generalized. A manager is a generalized thing as a job. Sales manager, finance manager, HR manager, those are positions. Similarly, analyst is a job. Sales analyst, HR analyst, finance analyst, they are the positions. That way we have the different jobs that we create in the job classifications. So these are the various company related masters that we have to set up. So, so that tomorrow when you're going to hire an employee, in which legal entity I have to hire him? In which department, in which location, in which pay grade, in which job I have to hire him. It's all the master list of values that will appear on the screen and I can choose from the drop down each of the thing and I can hire an employee. So that way in the, in the employee central structure, the foundation data is the very important one. So once you have this foundation data maintained on top of it only, you can maintain the employee data. First, these masters are to be set up, the entire foundation tables, whatever we say, these masters are to be set up. So they are the foundation of the company's uh, uh, structure in the digitalized systems. In any digitalized system, like uh, success factors or any other HR products. So this foundation data level, what all masters you have, that is the base. Once you set up this base, on top of it, the employee data can be expected. So this is the way we have the, the entire EC structure classified into two parts, the HR and the foundation data where again employee data is again classified into two parts and HR data is classified into three different categories, the foundation data side. And the examples, whatever we are seeing here, uh, irrespective of the blue or orange color, so don't bother about the color representation at this point. Down the line, we'll discuss what is the difference of colors. End of the day, all these are company related masters and each of these blocks that you see here can be technically referred as foundation objects. All these are part of the foundation structure and we call them as foundation objects, guys. A very important terminology. So these are all the building blocks of the company's structure. So they call them as foundation objects. And then that terminology is something that you keep on uh, hearing down the line from now. A very important thing, foundation objects. Okay, so uh, where in the HR data, what you have are all the portlets. The different blocks that you see in the HR data as examples, all these are portlets, employee data portlets. Whereas in the part of the foundation data, all these examples that you are seeing across three structures, these are all foundation objects. That is the thing. Okay. So back to the structure. So this is the uh, basic understanding, guys. The HR data and the foundation data, the two parts. Uh, what are they and how are they internally classified with the respective examples and the terminologies, portlets, foundations, objects, all that. Now for this entire employee central module to function, there are some data models that are prerequisite where data models are nothing but the XML files, guys. XML files for all the 11 modules of success factors for every module to run. There is one or the other XML file dependency for sure every module will have minimum one XML file dependency. And in the employee central, as on date, we have four XML files, or you can also refer them as data models, four data models that are required, where each and every data model is a, uh, is a file of thousands of lines of coding in it, 35,000 lines, uh, 45,000 lines, one lakh, cloud, uh, one lakh lines of code like that. That's each and every XML file or data model is having some thousands of lines of code in it. 
where all these are pre-delivered. We are not going to sit and do any coding. So they are already standard success factors, pre-delivered files, where whenever you start your project, you have to upload them into the success factors system as a client's provisioning system. So today uh, you are starting your configurations. So till yesterday you have been doing all the requirement gathering from the client. So now you want to start your configuration say. So as the first day of your employee central configurations, your first activity is to upload those data models into the uh, client's provisioning system. That's the first thing. Then only you can go ahead with the other configurations of this module of employees and you. That's the first activity, guys. Okay. So for that thing to perform, first of all, you should know where do you get these XML files to upload in provisioning. First of all, where do I get the standard XML files which are already done, uh, ready with the entire coding? Where do I get it? So for that, if you search in the internet uh, with the keyword as help SAP plus the respective module name. So here I'm searching with the keyword as help SAP employee central. So when I search with this keyword, then the system is going to give me the very first search result to the success factors employee central dedicated page in this SAP help portal. We have a SAP help portal called help.sap.com. In that we will have the dedicated page for every module actually. So now the one that I opened is for the employee central module, a dedicated page, which contains a lot of documentation of the respective modules. Okay. So once you come here, the third tab, you have to go for this third tab over here called implementation, where you have a lot of documentation resources that are, uh, that will be useful for your implementation in the real time. And scrolling down, you'll also find an area in the name of configuration, where under this configuration, you have something called as software download center. So software download center is a place where you will be able to download all that uh, XML files guys. Software download center will be uh, the place where to download all that four XML files or the data models. And for you to get in there, you should be certified. So whenever you are certified, as I told, you will be given with some SAP credentials. We call them as S user credentials. So with that credentials, you will be able to log in. When you click on this link, it will take you to some place where you have to give your ID password credentials. So you give that credentials and get in, then your, uh, all the four files will be downloaded as a zipped folder. As one zipped folder, the four files will be downloaded. So how do they look like this? So this is how the folder looks like. This is how the folder looks like with all the four files in one single folder. They are downloaded once you go into that uh, link. Okay. So all these are the XML files where each of them are having thousands of lines of code where once we download them, you need not even open them as it is what is downloaded can be uploaded back into the customer's provisioning system as a day one activity of your configurations. Okay. So to upload them, let me show you the place of navigation in the provisioning. But even before that, let me also name you the data models. What are these data models named as? So if you see on the right hand side, the first three succession data model, country specific succession data model, corporate data model, and the fifth one, country specific corporate data model. The first three and the fifth one, succession, CSF is country specific, the abbreviated form of CSF. Uh, this is a abbreviated form for country specific. So succession data model, country specific succession data model, corporate data model, and country specific corporate data model. This way we have the respective four data models or the respective XML files, which are very much important for the entire module functionality. They act as the four important pillars of this module. Okay, so without these, you can't expect the employee central module. They are very much important. And when employee central module got started, guys, initially, it used to be seven XML files in total. Total seven, it used to be. Now it is reduced down to four. The first three and the fifth one here, only the four are relevant here as on date in 2023. And in the upcoming upgrades, that four is also expected to come down to three or two actually. But we don't have any concrete uh, date given by SAP, but it is uh, expected that that four also might get reduced to two or three. That way. 
So each and every XML file is having some thousands of lines of code. But what does that code of each and every file actually mean to the uh, module? So how are they important? We'll discuss in detail about each and every file for sure. So what is the succession data models role and responsibility? What is this giving in the system? Corporate data model, what it is doing in the system? All that we'll definitely discuss in detail one by one. So as of now, we first get registered with the names. These are the terminology names. And once you download them from the help.sap.com, we'll be uploading into the provisional system. But let me show you the download process once again. Once you search in internet with this keyword as help, help SAP plus the respective module name, the very first link will definitely take you to that SAP help portal with a dedicated module related page. Once you are there, go to the third tab as implementation tab in that come down to an area for the configuration section in that you will find the software download center where you can download the config files or that is you can call them as config files or XML files or data models, whatever. So you can download them. So here they give the terminology as config files. So these are what you have to download where for that you need SAP certification credentials. And once you download them, you will be able to upload in the provisioning system. So once you download, this is how the folder looks like with all the four files in one folder. Now, let me also take you to the provisioning system and show you how does that looks like. Just give me a moment. Let me log in into the provisioning once. Yeah. So I logged into the provisioning by giving my certification credentials. And once I log in, so here the company name for which I'm working, that company ID and the company name comes up where the company name hyperlink is what we have to click and get into that company specific provisioning page. And once we enter inside here, yeah, we'll have uh, the company settings, the very first link that we are already aware. So that is a place where we do a lot of activations. You have hundreds of checkboxes, right? From languages, modules, the features, functionalities, all that, but crossing this. So going beyond this to the bottom, we will be now accessing some other place called in the name of succession management. Here we have an area in the name of succession management under this line number two, three, four, and five. Line number two, three, four, and five are the four places where we have to upload all those data models one after the other. Okay. Importing the data models is not a big deal, guys. You just have to click on the link. And here you will have an option to choose for the respective file, the choose file option. And when you click on choose file, you can browse the file, what you have already downloaded and it is in your downloads folder or somewhere. You can choose the file and you can click on submit. It will be loaded like that. One after the other, you can upload all those uh, data models. Just get in, choose the file, click on submit. The file will be uploaded. So that way hardly it takes five minutes to import all the four data models. Okay. And two points here to be noted is here you see the first one, import export data model. They did not mention whether it is succession data model or corporate data model. They did not mention any name. They simply referred as data model. So whenever you see such kind of uh, statements like simply data model without mentioning which one, that is default succession data model guys default whenever you don't have the name of the data model you can refer it as succession data model that is a way so one after the other we just have to get in and import them and in the process of importing you have to mandatorily follow a sequence the sequence of imports is important so this is a sequence that you have to follow where it has to start with corporate data model followed by country specific corporate data model then succession data model Finally, the country specific succession data model. This is the order in which you have to import it for the first time. So that is very important. A regular uh, certification question and an interview question. Please make a note of it. Okay. So now you will have the uh, have the documents. You will have the recordings, whatever. But I definitely suggest uh, uh, to have some running notes with you guys. So like few points, what I keep highlighting as important. It is better you make a note of it. Okay. So this is the one, you know, this is one of such where corporate data model, 
country specific corporate succession and country specific succession this is the order in which you have to import them in the provisioning system and i wantedly maintained the abbreviated forms here the second line i kept it as cdm which is corporate data model here just dm just simply data model csf as succession uh, sorry csf as country specific and sdm as succession data model so i wantedly maintained in that abbreviated terminologies because in various websites uh, pdfs documents wherever you find there is a chance that uh, sap follows that abbreviated forms as well so to make it familiar for you i started keeping it an abbreviated form okay so in this order following in the provisioning system you just have to import all the four data models one after the other and if you change the order you will obviously end up with error so there is no chance that you can try another order so whenever the order is changed automatically system will throw you an error so you have to definitely follow the order these are the four files that you will be importing so that way let me uh, again show you the navigations in the provisioning guys whenever we log in into the system uh, whenever we log into the provisioning system this is the first page that you see with your uh, instance id and the relevant uh, company name as a hyperlink clicking on the hyperlink of the company name get in and there if you keep scrolling down you will find a area in the name of succession management under that line number two three four and five are the four places where you have to import all these four data models one after the other that to in a sequence that i shown you that is corporate country specific corporate succession and the country specific succession that is the order so this is your first uh, activity under employee central configurations and that's the first understanding that you have to be having about this employee central module which is of two parts basically and for this entire two parts to function we have four data models that are uh, working in the background initially it used to be seven now it is reduced to four that is a discussion as of now and then now the further discussion is before we get into understanding of these xml files yeah so this profile plate where i told you have the employee data divided into sections subsections and the portlets now clients can have their requirement so they might say no i don't want a particular section at all they might say you relabel the sections or in the sections uh, these subsections remove one subsection or add one more subsection or relabel a subsection and again as the subsection the portlets what are pleasant the placement so bring contact to the left hand side and primary contact to the right right hand side like the swapping of places the subsections order you want to change the section order you want to change anything so these kind of different customizations the client can come up with so how to deal with the layout of this people profile is something one of the important activity that we have to do in every project success factors comes up with this this kind of a similar standard layout in every project okay once you upload the data models and you come into the instance and you see here uh, default section subsections portlets that layout the default layout will be automatically provided based on the client's requirement we can customize and enhance it to the way how they look they want to look at it so for working on this people profile related layout so i'm i'm specifically highlighting this word as layout the layout of the people profile that is what should appear where where they should appear that's it okay so on that context we have a place called as to handle that entire home uh, entire profile you search with the keyword as people the search with the keyword as people you get this configure people profile the people profile page where you see all the employee data that can be configured from a place called configure people profile once you go there so this is the config page where the entire uh, people profile whatever you are seeing with the list of sections subsections all that so further this is a background this is a uh, this is a background config page which is almost like the outline of that front end page so you see the sections personal information section in that you have around uh, seven subsections so that is the same way here it is listed so first you have personal information as a section with their own seven subsections one two three four five six seven they have the different subsections similarly if you go down you will have employment as an next section 
in that again we have some subsections same way that is how it is seen on the front end employment with some subsections in it that way against the subsection is where you have the portlet against contact here you have two portlets that is what it is seen here against contact as a subsection on the right hand side you have two portlets emergency contact and contact information as two portlets that will hack uh, that will host the data in them this way the way how you see on the front end in the same order the sections the subsections and the portlets are listed but what customization that you can do is we have several things that we can do here starting with section headings change the labels of the sections so the first uh, here the section is showing as personal information instead of that if i want to relabel it as personal info when i select it on the right hand side of the page i have this editable mode where personal information is what i am replacing as personal info and this is the default label if you want to update this label also in other languages so just be above this label you have a globe icon when you just click on this globe icon you will see the translation of that word in the different other languages that is already standard delivered in danish and german and uh, uh, spanish like this in different languages they have all listed so wherever you want to change the terminology you can change there in the respective modules and the respective languages also and save it so that way the default label and its translations also can be handled here itself that's for the section same way subsections so in the subsection say here you have id information id information is what i want to uh, change it as national id information example national id information is what i want to replace the label as the subsection label also is handled for that also you have a globe icon where you can update the label uh, here you can update the translations as well so section relabeling and subsection relabeling you saw but portlet label if you want to change so example here you have here we have primary emergency contact as a portlet if i want to relabel this so go to the contact information subsection and here you have emergency contact as a portlet but you can't do any label changes so portlet related you can't handle the labels even the fields of the portlet also now here in the portlet of uh, primary emergency contact you have name relationship phone email like some fields so here if you want to remove a field relabel the field add one more field anything you can't do from here so portlet related labels portlet related uh, fields nothing can be handled here on the configure people profile only the sections their labels subsections their labels and the portlets just as a placement you can handle but the label of the portlet or the contents of it you can't modify anything okay here they are just the what do you say here they are just the placement related placeholders now say example if the client wants us the contact to be placed to the left and emergency contact to the right that change of placements we can do where, where you have these menu lines the three menu lines against every portlet select that and with your mouse control you can drag and drop it so the place the one which is on the left hand on the left hand side and the right side so i would dragging and dropping and creating your own required sections i'm removing the unwanted one so this way previously emergency used to be on the left now with the mouse control i dragged and drop it so automatically when i'm dragging and dropping them so they are automatically swapping their places left and right left and right so that way so we can do that dragging and dropping of the portlets only the placement of the portlet is what you can control the label of the portlet or the fields in the portlet you have no config access from this place i don't say totally no here you don't have it but you have it in a different place different tools and all which we'll down down the line discuss but the main concentration of this tool is about the sections section labels subsections subsection labels their translations and even the section and subsection placements also so now employment is in the second place the employment section if i want to bring this to the first place let's go to the configure people profile 
look for the employment section. Against employment section also you have these menu lines. Select that and drag it. Drag your entire section to the top of the page and place it here above the personal information, drop it here. That way employment has come to the first place and personal is in the second place. That is the way. And in the personal, you see contact is in the fourth place. I want this contact subsection in the second place. So even the subsections can also be dragged and dropped. So here under personal info, contact information, which is in the fourth place, I want to select that menu lines, drag and drop it to the second place. So sections, subsection and portlets, all three things can be rearranged. Sections, subsections, portlets, all three things can be rearranged. But when it comes to label changes, only sections and subsection labels only can be changed. Portlet related labels or the portlet related fields you can't handle. That is a first understanding. And whatever now I've been showing you is about the existing standard delivered section, standard delivered subsections, all that. If a client wants to come up with a complete custom section, com com custom subsection, custom portlet altogether, that is also possible where here you see a live example of such kind of thing is COVID-19. This COVID-19 is a custom section. What SF has not given standard, it's a custom section with a custom subsection and the portlets, custom portlets that are configured to capture the employee's uh, vaccination status, to capture the employee's uh, uh, COVID uh, health tracking related status and all. So this way there can be multiple custom uh, section or custom portlet requirements that comes in the real time. We can do that. So that how to bring the new things we will discuss as a part of our employee central uh, uh, configurations down the line. So as of now, we will concentrate on how to make use of the existing things and what are the modifications that we can do to the existing things. So in that process, these are the few things that we have done. Section label change, subsection label change, uh, next to section placement change, subsection placement change, and a portlet placement change, all that we have done with all that we save here. So these changes, what we have done and have done now, will immediately start reflecting. Let this save first. Yeah, this is saved. Now coming to the profile, without refreshing this profile, I will create a duplicate. I am creating a duplicate tab so that now the duplicate tab, what is reloading? This will reload as per the latest config. So as per the previous config, employment is in the second place. Now in the new config, employment is in the first place. That is the first change, the placement of the sections. And personal information section label is changed. Old label is full word as personal information. The new label is personal info. That's it. That is an example of section label change. Next, subsection placement. The contact information in the old one, it used to be in the fourth place. Now in the new one, it is brought to the second place in the order. And subsection label example, you see, so in the previous one, you have ID information. This one is mentioned as ID information. Now I relabeled as national ID information. Here you have the national ID information as a subsection label. And final thing we have done is the portlet related placement, where in the previous screen, primary emergency contact is on the left. Now this primary is moved to the right, you see. Go to the personal contact information. See the primary emergency contact is moved to the right. And here on the left hand side, we still have the normal contact. That is the way. So that is, these are the different changes that we can achieve on the configure people profile option to uh, arrange the layout of the people profile as per the client's choice, rearranging them in the first place. Okay. So this is about the few changes still going forward. Still what, what few more changes that I can do is now if a client says, I don't want a particular section at all, this COVID-19 section, I don't want to see it at all. But then on the configure people profile. You go to go to the bottom and find that section as COVID-19. Here it is. If you select that section on the right hand side, here you have a checkbox called show this section on the profile. If you deselect this checkbox, that's it. 
that's going to be hidden no no longer the, it's it's not going to display on the front end that way completely if you want to stop using a particular section instead of deleting it you can hide it by just uh, removing this checkbox show this on the profile if you remove it it's not going to be shown anymore on the front end that is a way you can remove that section to be removed totally or in other ways say a client has a section with multiple subsections that is if you see this uh, personal and the personal as a section i have around 6 to 7 subsections any particular subsection if i want to hide so i can just uh, click on that subsection again a subsection also you have this checkbox show this subsection on the profile if you remove this checkbox that subsection will not appear so entire subsection if you want to hide or i mean entire section you want to hide or only one particular subsection in the section you can have both the options again portlet related you have no choice if you want to handle the portlets to be visible not visible it, this is not the place we can definitely do it but in a different place again so portlet related you don't have any control here guys it's only about the section subsections related more controls you have here okay that is one thing and apart from all this if you go to the top of the page you have this header area where the employee's profile picture employee some basic details like the first name last name job title which department which location we are working with the contact details all this is being appearing and there is a background uh, what do you say this uh, cover photo kind of the way it, it, these days you have it in linkedin facebook and all the bag is a background cover image or a cover photo that way here in the success factors profiles also you have a background image whatever you wish you can so here you can have some options to control like as an end user i can choose what background image i want to have here under edit header i have edit background image as an option so the second one edit background image as an option will bring us some options to change the image so whether first of all the user can change his own background image or not is what a setting we can control and we sf has given this option called about me when you click on about me system gives us some option to describe our ourselves like even in facebook linkedin and all you have an option to uh, describe yourself okay so about me as a section so here when you click on it system gives you a place where you can actually have your uh, about yourself some text can be maintained here okay, let me uh, refresh later but there will be one text box where you can write about yourself saying like uh, 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 i'm good at uh, uh this thing i like this I, I like to accommodate guests i like traveling whatever you would like to write about yourself kind of and the last a very good feature is a my name as an option guys so this my name is something that will allow you to record the pronunciation of your own name an audio file can be uploaded here where say you can uh, just uh, record your name say my name is say shiva shankar so if i want to uh let the people know how should my name be pronounced i can record an audio file just that one second or one 1.5 second kind of a small audio file how my name should be pronounced i can record it and i can load that here so that your system will give you a, a small audio icon where when i click on that icon system will announce my name so this is very much useful when you're working on a global environments you work with your counterparts of china japan korea employees like different countries employees that's sometimes common that we make a mistake in pronouncing their names they make a mistake in pronouncing our names that's obvious and generally people get offended if their name is not properly pronounced so to avoid that if you have this feature that will help them understand how your name should be pronounced that is one good feature sf has given so whether we want this my name feature about me feature uh, an option to change the background image all this is what we have in that uh, configure people profile to control similarly if the profile picture we don't want the company says that no we don't want the photographs of the employees to be displayed if this has to be removed we can here a lot of details like employee designation employee department employee location in which time zone he is working his contact details all is displayed client wants want don't want this much of info they just want the employee name title and phone number that's it so unwanted fields if you want to remove that also can be done so all these things is something you can handle under the same configure people profile page 
here on the top very first thing is general settings you click on this general settings here on the right hand side you have all such options guys general settings on the right hand side the first thing if you click on this hyperlink configure header fields as a hyperlink on the right hand side under general settings then system will give you the list of all the fields what are displayed on the header level like the employee photo employee name employee title department location their time zone their phone number email all that if i don't want these many fields i want to reduce some i just want the employees uh, I don't want employee division i don't want employee time zone local time all this if i want to remove some fields like this we can remove them and you click on save from next time that few fields will reduce on the page just simply that is the way you can choose that basic information what to display what not to display here through configure header fields as a hyperlink in the pop-up i can select and deselect the fields that is one basic thing and just below that you have the respective checkboxes which will describe about each and every functionality that i shown you there starting with allow employees to edit their background image so first of all are you allowing the employees to change their background image or not so default system will allocate one image for every employee guys. for every employee one image will be automatically default allocated with the way currently in anya singh's profile uh, you see some penguin uh, the penguin image in the background like the different uh, uh, sceneries kind of the background waterfalls parachutes some sceneries kind of some images will come in the background by default one can change it if they want so whether we want to give this edit background image feature or not first of all that's a decision point where we have to enable this checkbox or not if you enable now employees get a chance to upload whatever image they want so there is a chance that they might upload some unprofessional images. And if you want to control that, here you have an option, disable background image uploading by employee. If I select this checkbox, disable background image uploading guys. So now they have an option to edit this. Inside, here you have the option called upload image that will be removed. This button of uploading image will be removed so if they can't upload their own image. They only get an option to choose from the image library. There is a standard library of some images that SFSF will be provided. They can choose from that list only. They can't go with their personal uh, personal choice. That will default. We'll have both. But if I want to uh, restrict the first option of employee to choose whatever they want, I can restrict it and I can give them the option of only choosing from the library. Where when I click on this uh, library system comes up with a pop-up where it shows me the all the different images where in this demo system it's only one plain image but in the real-time client systems you will get up to 72 different sceneries guys the background the wallpapers kind of around 72 images will be available in this that is available in the client systems and the demo systems they just restrict it to one of them that's it here you have an option first to whether i can give the option of for the employees to edit or not if they start having the editing so they can have their own personal image option or only the library option or both you can choose that that is here under configure people profile this is option allow employees to edit disable background image if you don't want next allow employees to upload an audio file for a name pronunciation so if you select this checkbox that's where you are getting that last option of uh, my name my name so when you go here under this you will be able to upload your recording of an audio file a small audio file is what you can record your name and you can upload here that's one next you have uh, allow employees to upload a about me video or allow employees to edit, edit an in, uh, introductory text you have two things guys allow employees to upload an about me video that is about yourself you want to either uh, uh, type a text or if you want to describe yourself in the form of a video presentation both are available so this this checkbox says allow employees to upload a about me video or or allow employees to enter introductory text so both all both of them i'm activating so when i click on uh, save here and i save it i'm refreshing this once again and i edit header now when i click on about me you see this sf has given two options 
either i can upload a video or i can write in text if i am so uh, extrovert that i am comfortable in recording my selfie video about myself describing this is what i am kind of i can do that and i can upload a video or i can just write a text so both the options are available so whatever i write about myself that will appear here in the profile over here you see this is how my family and i love to entertain guests something fun some text is all given here that is a way and one last feature that we can also look at here is here you have show percent complete this checkbox show percent complete so what is this show percent complete is let me even activate and save it so how much percentage of your profile is complete as what system will try to give you some projection so when i refresh this once again this time you see your system is going to come up with a circle like this it says 94 percent of my profile is complete there are few areas where i have to fill few details so that my profile will be 100 percent complete with all the details that way so that is profile percentage completion is shown here only to the profile owner I am currently in the login of Anya Singh. So that is like as if Anya Singh logged in. So it is showing, it is showing me my profile completion. But when I try to look at others' profile, so if I search for any other employee, say Alex, and if I visit their profile, on their profile, it doesn't show me how much percentage of profile they have completed. When they log in, if that person Alex himself has logged in, for him, it will show the percentage completion, but not to others that way. Okay. So this is you have, these are the different options that you have here in the header level, general settings to choose what fields to appear and then what features to be available for the end user on the right hand side. These are the few things. Can admin choose a standard background for all employees, which is related to the company? That is, instead of uh, uh, random images for everybody, if you want to have one common image as a background for everybody, can the company do that? Is it? so definitely, guys. There is an option. So here, when you uh, under this allow employees to edit background image, you have a hyperlink called Manage Background Image Library. Like what all images should be in that library? Here you can choose that. So if you click on it, in a client system, already 72 images will be available. And on top of it, if client wants to upload any new images, they can. And here there is also an option. Randomly assign a background image, whatever client wants, or whatever the, image, the system wants to give for each and every employee, different things. Or give all users the same default image background. Default background for them. You can, you can choose them. If you say give all users the same default uh, one then there is something you will choose only one image you will not upload everything only one image you maintain here that's it and they don't even get the option to change anything that is the way okay we have both the things that is the way so this is all about the prerequisite topic of uh, the employee central guys so when we say employee central as a name itself suggests it's a module uh, having employee as a centric thing so the place where all the employee data is handled is all this profile so all our things uh, rotate around this employee data. So how is this profile page with all the different sections of employee information handled? The layout of it, with the sections, subsections, their label, their ordering, header level, what to appear, what not to appear. So all that layout related is only what we have dealt. But in each of these <laughs> portlets, so here uh, in each of these portlets, what fields to be present, what information to capture, which fields are mandatory, which are non-mandatory, which are free text, which are drop downs. So that main core data level configurations we haven't seen here. Only the layout is what we have handled in the configure people profile. The core fields level, the data level, their mandatory conditions, the length of the fields. So which is a drop down, which is a free text. We did not go into that discussion, which we'll now initiate. So people profile, remember that keyword, People profile is only dealing with the layout of the profile. That's it. Not any internal configurations or core configurations are not in that place. People profile workbook 
it contains of the same things what I told you, what section should be present, yeah. labels, subsection, subsection labels, that order and all. But fields, which fields are mandatory, that is not about uh, uh, people profile workbook, that's about the portlets, which will which will be as a part of the core employee central things. So now coming back to our employee central structural level discussions. So employee central structure is of two parts. And for this entire structure to function, we have four data models, all that we understood, like where to download those, where to upload them, all that. Now, the next level of discussion is to start having an understanding on the uh, importance of those data models, what, what each and every data model is actually doing. Okay. In that context, succession data model is what I'll start with, guys, where succession data model is a data model that is present in all the 11 modules. For each and every module, you will definitely have the succession data models uh, presence. Where for other modules, uh, the lines of code will be only around 10,000, 11,000 lines. But when it comes to employee central, it will be 35,000 lines of code. 35,000, almost three times more than the regular one. Okay, but for every module, succession data model has some importance for sure. So that's totally different. So when, when it is, don't... Uh, so keep it only as general settings. General settings level on the top, it's only the header level things that you are handling. In terms of the remaining things like sections, subsections, their layout uh, in terms of the order and all, it's the bottom place that you are handling, not only under general settings. Okay. Just visit that place in your access, you'll be able to get an understanding. Next, let, let us start having an understanding of these data models where succession data model, as I just mentioned, it has its importance of uh, importance from every module. Every module have a dependency on this uh, XML file. So let me first show you this XML file. How does it look like? As of now, I only downloaded, I've shown you once we download how that folder looks like with all the four XMLs. But to open and see the code in it, you need some software. Like for opening uh, uh, Excel files, you need MS Excel uh, installed in your laptop. To look at the PDF files, you need the Microsoft, uh, I mean, uh, you need the Adobe Orcobat or some other PDF viewer in your laptop. Similar way to even look at the XML files, you need some XML editors in your laptop. To look at the code in the XML, XML editors are required. So we, we have hundreds of XML editor softwares in the market in that the two best that I recommend, one for Mac and one for Windows. So I currently using the Mac software. So the one that I recommend is called brackets. You see the, the one that I highlighted, open with brackets. Brackets is one XML editor that's good for the Mac users. And if it is Windows users, it is something called as Notepad++. Notepad++ is one software that will help you to open the XML files for Windows. That way, brackets and Notepad are two. Notepad++ are two things. Notepad is different and Notepad++ is different, guys. So Notepad++ is what you have to install for your Windows laptops. And that's a very lightweight application. So you can just download and install the software. And then when you have that XML file in your system, right click, click on open with and use that software to open. And I click on it. Let me show you how the file opens. So this is how the file looks like, the XML file with the entire coding in it. This is how they appear. Where this succession data model XML file is something a coding of around 35,000 lines of code that I shown you, here it is. When we collapse the entire code, it is up to 35,000 plus lines. That is the way, okay? And this is all re-delivered code. By the time you download from the SAP's help.sap.com, all this code is already present in it. And to start our discussion with the succession data model, where this is the mod, uh, this is XML file that has its dependency from every module. Employee central specific area will concentrate in this 35,000 lines. What are something that we have to be aware of EC related will concentrate in that there are total uh, if you see in starting, there are something in the name of standard elements. Standard elements uh, related some coding. Like that down the line, you will find two other things. So what are they are? Here are the total three things, guys. What we will be uh, looking at that XML file in, in the XML file. Standard elements, background elements, and HRIS elements. Standard, background, and HRIS elements are the three things. Okay. Where 
what are all these things doing is so in the basic definition of XML files is XML files are supplying this configuration of the front end screen fields. I'm again repeating XML files are supplying the coding for the front end screen level fields what we see. Now I see a place where the employee data is maintained. Say contact information is a portlet. So when I click on edit, here I can uh, see what are the fields that I can maintain the data. But the config of these fields, that these are the three fields uh, called email type, email address, each primary, that these fields should come here on the screen. That coding is done in that XML file where these three fields should be mandatory. So you see asterisk symbol, email type is an asterisk, that's a mandatory, email address is mandatory, primary is a mandatory. So that condition of setting that mandatory condition is coming from that XML. Okay, again, to capture the phone information, here you have one, two, three, four fields. For each of that field, again, one is mandatory, one is non-mandatory. So again, that conditions, that label, that label as country code as a label, area code as a label text, that's all coming from that XML coding. That way, whatever you're seeing on the front end screens, that coding is coming from XML. Anything that you are seeing, that, that should be definitely a coding done by somebody in the background. So that coding is present in the XML files. So each and every XML file is giving the coding for different screens. So out of four, the first thing is succession data model, if you have to concentrate, that is giving the coding for all the employee data related portlet screens for all these portlets contact information, emergency contact, national IDs, address details, dependent details, anything. All the portlets where the employee data is being maintained. So those portlet related port field should appear, the field properties, everything is coming from the succession data model coding. That way, every data model is supplying the fields for one or the other screens on the asset. That's the common definition. And specific to succession data model is for poor employee data portlets. Specifically succession data model related, if you have to speak, it is supplying the coding for the employee data portlets. That is the thing. Now, in that total, as I told, there are three things that we have to understand from the succession data model, standard elements, background elements, and HRIS elements. First thing standard elements is nothing but the fields that you see in the basic import file guys. So last time I have shown you uh, a process that we follow. Whenever you don't have employee central in picture, you have only talent modules being implemented. Then to load the data into the system, we use a basic import file with some mini master data columns and all. So with this format, we create some users in the system is what we discussed. So in this, in this uh, file, we have some set of columns. We just follow these columns and we have loaded. But where are these columns defined? Where is the configuration that these are the columns to be used? Where is that config present? So these columns are all, the coding of all these columns is present in the succession data model in the name of standard elements, guys. In the name of standard elements, if you look at these columns, you will have a, you will, you will recollect it user ID, username, first name, last name, middle name, nickname, the employee's department, employee's location, like this. All those mini master columns, whatever we maintained in that file, they are all present here. The definition of each and every column, the coding of each and every column is coming from this succession data model in the name of standard elements. These are all the standard elements. And I can ask every ID, so user ID, username, these are the technical field names. Against every field name, you have some attributes. All these green color things are the attributes. So required equal to false. So required is an attribute that will allow two values, required equal to true or false. So true means it's a mandatory field. False means it's a non-mandatory field. That way required equal to true or false is something that will say the mandatory condition of a field. Similarly, you have an attribute for length of the field max length 128. So the length, how many characters of input that field can take is 128 is the coding that is present. That way if the field length is controlled and then you have uh, the labels. So any field when you expand, here the standard standard element coding is there, but you, if you on the left hand side, so you have a small arrow. When you expand, 
between 141 to 185, there is some lines of coding present, which is collapsed here, guys. 141 to 185. If I click on this arrow, it will expand the coding that is present. That one of the first lay, one of the attribute is label. So the last name that you see here as ID is the technical field ID. The proper label, what you see on the front end is this last name. Not only the default label, the translation of that word last name in 43 languages, what SF supports are listed here. In Arabic, how, how do you write that last name in the first, in the first row like this, followed by in uh, Danish, how do you write it? In English, uh, Britain, how do you write it? In, Mex in Mexican, in uh, French, like this, in different languages, how do you write it? The translation is delivered for all the standard 43 languages that SF supports. Because this is an XML downloaded from SAP's website. So all the 43 translations for every word will be default available. For every uh, word, what you see on the screen, it's 43 respective translations is maintained. So that is also one attribute. Like required mandatory condition, true or false, length of the field. And when you expand any field, label and its translations, all these are different attributes. And there are a couple of other attributes like visibility. You search with the keyword as visibility. Here you see for a field, there is a visibility as an attribute where there are three values that are supported. If you keep visibility as none, none means that field is not going to appear on the front end. It is hidden. If a client says, I don't want this particular field in my system, so we can mark the field as hidden so that they don't see that field on the front end at all. Visibility equal to none. If the field has to appear, but it should be in read-only mode, nobody should edit it. It just it should be just in a, in a viewable mode. Then we keep it as view. Visibility equal to view means it's a read-only field. Or you want that field to be visible and even editable, then I keep it as both. The keyword as both. Both means that field will be visible, <coughs> even be editable. That is the way we have visibility that supports with three attributes. And one last attribute that I want to introduce you with is we have an attribute in the name of pi. Pi -I. pi equal to true or false. So pi means personally identifiable information, guys. Personally identifiable information, like any sensitive information, like your gender, your uh, bank account number, your uh, national ID numbers, like this few things, which you don't want to be publicly be available. People should not have access to all that personal details. So that can be kept as pi equal to true. To keep pi equal to true, the advantage is the print end, that field data will be masked actually. You, you see this national ID information portlet level, social security number is a information where Employee's social security number is maintained, but you are seeing you're, the data is masked to you. Only the authorized people can click on show and they can see the data. Others cannot even have this show button. They understand that there is input maintained, but we are not going to share that information with them. We are masking the data like, like a password field, it will be masked. So if you keep that pi equal to true, this masking functionality is achieved on the front end. Like this. In this XML, in this entire thousands of lines of coding, these are the few attributes that you have to have an understanding where these are the changes that the client might ask you. You're not going to do any new line of coding, guys. At least one single new line of code you're not going to write. Existing things, you can tweak it. Like if they want to have this field as masked, then I keep phi equal to true. If they want to hide the field, I keep visibility equal to none. Okay, like that. If they want to change the length of a field, the length of the field is what I can increase. Let me go to the top. Here, you have the length of the field with some characters. If they want to change the length of the field, I can change. So these kinds of changes is only what you will get. You will not get a requirement to do an entire coding. No worries. Okay, that's the maximum tweaking of the existing XML that you would be doing. Even a school student can handle that. That's not a big deal and you don't require any programming knowledge here. Okay, and here, especially about this attribute, if I have to say maximum length, you never get a requirement to change this dice. So uh, 
in success factors, uh, the length of the fields are already excessively spaced. So 128 characters for last name, 128 characters for first name. It's already excess space. So 128 characters, one word doesn't be. Your entire first name will not be 128 characters. Your entire last name will not be 128 characters for sure. So they are already excessively spaced. So SSF in SF, 99% will never get a requirement to change the length of the fields. They are already excessively spaced every time. So <clears throat> to summarize what I've been trying to say here in the XML is we have total three kinds of things that we have to understand from the XML. That is particularly succession data model, standard elements, background and HRAs. As of now, we only discussed about standard elements. So what is standard elements related coding is? The fields or the columns, whatever you're seeing in the basic import file, they are configured in the succession data model in the name of standard elements. And in that standard elements coding, you have these different attributes which are explaining you the behavior of the field, whether field should be mandatory, the length of the field, field should be visible or editable like that, masking of data is required or not, the label of the field when you expand, any field, the label of that field, along with its translations in 43 languages, all these are available here that you can handle. So all these things, whatever I'm showing here, are summarized in one Excel sheet. So all these are summarized here in this Excel sheet on the right hand top. Attributes mostly used in XML. There are total six attributes, out of which first five only that we have discussed till now. So required, is a one attribute that will talk about the fields mandatory condition. So you have true or false, required equal to true or false. Visibility is one attribute that will talk about whether the field is uh, viewable or completely hidden or even editable, three values. Length of the field, which is a number, whatever number you give that many characters. Pi, it's for masking of data. Do you want to make the field masking? So pi equal to true or false. Label of the field is a text field. Whatever text you enter, that with that text, it will appear on the front end. These are the attributes that we saw. Last one, which is something that it comes to the future discussion, we'll park it for now. That way. These are the maximum changes that a client's requirement might force you to go in the XML and make some changes. That is the thing. Okay. Now we have two other elements that I told you, which is the background and HRIS. These are the two more things. When it comes to these two, these two are particularly relevant to the portlets, guys. Particularly to the portlets, the one that you are seeing on the people profile, you are seeing different portlets of information. So, particularly these portlets related coding is in that background and HRAS elements. And among them, what is the difference? HRAS elements are the EC specific portlets. Any portlets that is EC specific, we call it as HRAS technically. Non EC, other modules related in the other portlets, non EC related portlets are called background elements. So, this way we have the coding of entire uh, employee central portlets classified into two types background and HRAS, where EC related portlets are as HRAS and the rest as background, non EC related as background elements. Two ways they are divided. First thing. Next is in terms of uh, understanding the coding of it, we, I'll start with an example of a background element which is a non-EC portlet here in the people profile under the section called talent profile, what all portlets appear, there are non-EC related guys. That means without EC also, you can have these portlets like uh, uh, a portlet to hold your certification details, what all certifications you have done, what is your education details, any awards that you have received, like this different things, whatever you want to capture. All these portlets are non-EC. Without EC also, these portlets can be present. If I take certificates portlet particularly, if I have to maintain a certification detail, this is how the fields appear. The name of the certification, some description about that certification, which institution has given me, is that SAP, is that Oracle, is that some other company. Then effective date is the date on which I am certified. And expiration date is the date on which the certificate is expected to expire if it is going to have an expiry date. That way, we have these five fields where I can maintain one certification record. I can keep on adding. 
So I am certified on EC, I am certified in PMGM, I am certified in recruitment. Like that, I can keep on adding the more list of certifications if required. That is a way. Now, here in this portlet, right from the portlet label, the fields, the field labels, the field related mandatory conditions, all that are coming from the XML file in the name of background elements. In the XML file, the way you initially started seeing the standard elements and the initial lines of coding, if you do a search in the name of background elements, here it is from 5300 around uh, lines of code. Here you see all the coding of the background elements where each and every background element is one portlet. And here you have the certificates related portlet related coding. If you expand this background element certificates related, First, it starts with giving you the label of that portlet along with its translation in 43 languages. That portlet label is first given with its translation in 43 languages. That is almost still here. Once all the translations are done, then the fields what you are seeing on the front end, all that fields related coding is there. Like the name of the certification, description, institution which has given me the certification start date and end date which is nothing but the date on which i am certified and the expiry date so the same five fields whatever seeing on the front end are also present here from the config because of this config only they are appearing on the front end okay so here also against every field so you have the attributes like required equal to true or false mandatory or not length of the field and when you expand any field, the label of the field, say for start date field, when you expand, the label is effective date. Effective date is a label. So that's what the label that you're seeing on the front end, effective date. Another field is expiration date. That's nothing but the label of the end date field. We expand the end date, expiration date, along with its translation in 43 languages again. So this is how it is structured in a very clear way. The point is, first you will have the portlet label with its translations. Then you will have all the fields. For every field also when you expand, that will have the field related default label and its translation in all the 43 languages. That way, with the respective attributes as usual that we know. Okay. So this is how it is done here. As per this coding only, you are seeing the things on the front end. Now on this, if your client is asking us any changes, they ask us to uh, change this field label, uh, remove this field totally, or bring this field to the second place. Any such changes, we can again handle it through the business configuration. Manage business configuration that I'm telling you. This print in tool, manage business configuration will help us. Under the same employee profile category, above standard elements, you have background elements. When you expand those background elements, the list of all the background portlets are appearing. The third one is certificates. The one that we are looking on the front end. So the, here also, the portlet label is there. Again, as this icon, if I click on this, I have the label translation in different languages. Then coming down, we have the fields of the portlet the name of the certification, description, institution, start date, end date. All the fields are also here with the field related properties. Against any field, if you go to the details of that on the right hand side here, if you click on the details of that field, you'll have all the properties like whether the data in that field should be masked as or no. The label of that field, if you want to change the label of the field, with the field label translations when you click on this icon in different languages then you have required mandatory whether the field should be mandatory yes or no like this everything is available along with the length of the field all that whatever you can do in xml has 100 percent you can do it on the instance also okay and if you want to delete a field completely you have a delete icon guys but that is recommended, never delete anything. Either it might be a standard config delivered by SAP or even something that you spend some time on, you configured custom anything, don't delete it. 
really customer says that no we don't want to use it let us drop it you hide it so enabled is what i keep it as no that is that field is not going to appear on the front end that way you better hide it never delete anything either standard delivered or even you custom configured never delete hide them that is a way and ordering all the fields also so if the institution field which is in the third place if i want it in the second place and the extreme right here you have some arrows on the, using these arrows on the left you can use you can move the fields up and down in which order they are being saved in that order they appear on the front end so this is how the background element is listed so this is one example like this other examples like uh, you have education details you have courses different portlets where for each and every portal the same process will be what fields you see on the instance are something that are coming from this config place hello everyone i wanted to provide a brief overview on zarentix training program for sap success factor employee central and performance management and goal management this comprehensive course covers key concepts and tools to centralize and optimize employee performance across your organization over the past few years hundreds of hr professionals and managers have leveraged zarentex success factor training to improve performance evaluation align employee goals and advance their careers after completing the course many have shared their success stories on zarentex testimonial platform so in just few weeks you can learn how to configure and roll out success factor performance reviews capture employee achievements provide ongoing feedback and automate talent development plans this can open doors to new hr opportunities to help you get more value from success factors at your company if you want to learn more about managing and motivating your workforce with success factors employee central and pmgm visit the link below for detailed course information from zarentech getting started now with the training is a smart investment for anyone looking to expand their expertise in this cutting edge sap solutions